Book Twelve of the Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For reader Michael Armenta. Argument: The Battle at the Grecian Wall. The Greeks having retired into their entrenchments, Hector attempts to force them, but it, proving impossible to pass the ditch, Polydemus advises to quit their chariots and manage the attack on foot. The Trojans follow his counsel, and having divided their army into five bodies of foot, begin the assault. But upon the signal of an eagle with a serpent in his talons, which appeared on the left hand of the Trojans, Polydemus endeavours to withdraw them again. This Hector opposes, and continues the attack, in which, after many actions, Sarpedon makes the first breach in the wall. Hector also, casting a stone of a vast size, forces open one of the gates, and enters at the head of his troops, who victoriously pursue the Grecians, even to their ships. Thus o'er the wounded chief Eurypolis watched in his tent Manetius' noble son. But hand to hand the Greeks and Trojans fought, nor longer might the ditch the assault repel, nor the broad wall above which Greeks had built to guard their ships, and round it dug the ditch. But to the gods no hecatombs had paid, that they, the ships, and all the stores within might safely keep. Against the will of heaven the work was done, and thence not long endured. While Hector lived, and Peleus's son his wrath retained, and Priam's city untaken stood. So long the Grecian wall remained entire. But of the Trojans, when the best had fallen, of Greeks, when some were slain, some yet survived, when the tenth year had seen the fall of Troy, and Greeks embarked, had ta'en their homeward way, then Neptune and Apollo counsel took to sap the wall by aid of all the streams that seaward from the heights of Ida flow. Rhesus, Caresus, and Heptapurus, Granicus, and Isipus, Rhodius, Scamander's stream divine, and Simois, where helms and shields lay buried in the sand, and a whole race of warrior demigods. These all Apollo to one channel turned. Nine days against the wall the torrent beat, and Jove sent rain continuous that the wall might sooner be submerged, while Neptune's self his trident in his hand led on the stream, washing away the deep foundations laid laborious by the Greeks with logs and stone, now by fast-flowing Hellespont dispersed. The wall destroyed, o'er all the shore he spread a sandy drift, and bade the streams return to where of old their silver waters flowed. Such were in future days to be the works of Neptune and Apollo. But meanwhile fierce raged the battle round the firm-built wall, and frequent clattered on the turret's beams the hostile missiles. By the scourge of Jove subdued, the Greeks beside their ships were hemmed, by Hector, scared, fell minister of dread, who, 
with the whirlwind's force, as ever, fought. As when, by dogs and hunters circled round, a boar or lion, in his pride of strength, turns on his foes, while they in close array stand opposite, and frequent shoot their darts, nor yet his spirit quails, but firm he stands with suicidal courage. Swift he turns, where best to break the circling ranks, where e'er he makes his rush, the circling ranks give way. So Hector, here and there, amid the crowd, urged his companions on to cross the ditch. The fiery steeds shrank back, and, snorting, stood upon the topmost brink, for the wide ditch withheld them, easy nor to leap nor cross, for steep arose on either side the banks, and at the top with sharpened stakes were crowned, thick-set and strong, which there the sons of Greece had planted to repel the invading foes. Scarce might a horse, with well-wheeled car attached, essay the passage. But on foot they burned to make the attempt, and thus Polydamus, approaching near to valiant Hector, spoke. Hector, and all ye other chiefs of Troy, and brave allies, in vain we seek to drive our horses o'er the ditch, Tis hard to cross, tis crowned with pointed stakes, And them behind is built the Grecian wall. There to descend, and from our cars in narrow space to fight, Were certain ruin. If it be indeed the will of Jove, high thundering, To confound the Greeks in utter rout, and us to aid, I should rejoice that every Greek forthwith, far from his home, should fill a nameless grave. But should they turn, and we again be driven back from the ships, and hurried down the ditch, such were our loss, that scarce a messenger would live to bear the tidings to the town of our destruction by the rallied Greeks. Hear then my counsel. Let us all agree, with our attendants here upon the bank, to leave our horses, and ourselves on foot, all armed, press on where Hector leads. The Greeks, if that their doom be nigh, will make no stand. Thus spoke Polydamus, his counsel pleased. And Hector sprang in arms from off his car, nor long the noble Hector, when they saw, delayed the other chiefs. Then gave command, each to his own attendant, by the ditch, to keep the chariots all in due array. Then, parting, formed in order of attack in five divisions with their several chiefs. Round Hector thronged, and old Polydamus, the best and bravest, they who longed the most to storm the wall and fight beside the ships. With them Sabriones, for Hector left to guard the horses, one of lesser note. The next division was by Paris led, Agenor and Alcathus. The third, by Helenus and brave Deiphobus, two sons of Priam. Asius was the third, Asius the son of Hyrtacus, who brought his towering fiery steeds from Salus's stream, hard by Arisba. Stout Aeneas led the fourth, and Chyses' son Archilochus with him, and Achimus and Tenor's sons, both skilled alike in every point of war. Of the far-famed allies, Sarpedon held the chief command, and for his comrades chose 
Asteropius, and the warlike might of Glaucus. These, or all the rest, he held preeminent in valour, save himself, who o'er them all superior stood confessed. These interlaced their shields of tough bull's hide, with eager step advanced, and deemed the Greeks would, unresisting, fall before their ships. The other Trojans and renowned allies, the words of wise Polydamus obeyed. But Asius, son of Hyrtacus, refused his horses and his charioteer to leave, with them advancing to assail the ships. Blind fool, unconscious, from before those ships escaped from death, with horses and with car triumphant to the breezy heights of Troy, he never shall return. Ill-omened fate, o'ershadowing, dooms him by the spear to fall of brave Idomeneus, Deucalion's son. He, toward the left, inclined, what way the Greeks with horse and chariot from the plain returned. That way he drove his horses, and the gates unguarded found, by bolt or massive bar. Their warders held them open wide, to save, perchance, some comrade flying from the plain. Thither he bent his course, with clamours loud followed his troops, nor deemed they that the Greeks would hold their ground, but fall amid their ships. Little they knew. Before the gates they found two men, two warriors of the prime, two sons illustrious of the spear-skilled Lapithi, stout Polypetes one, Pyrithous' son, with whom Leontius, bold as blood-stained Mars. So stood these two before the lofty gates, as on the mountain side two towering oaks, which many a day have borne the wind and storm, firm rifted by their strong continuous roots, so in their arms and vigour confident those two great Asius' charge undaunted met. On the other side, with shouts and wild uproar, their bull's hide shields uplifted high, advanced against the well-built wall, Asius the king, Iamenus, Orestes, Acamas, the son of Asius and Enomaeus, and Thoan, those within to save the ships calling, meanwhile, on all the well-grieved Greeks. But when they saw the wall by Trojans scaled, and heard the cry of Greeks in panic fear, sprang forth those two before the gates to fight. As when two boars upon the mountain side await the approaching din of men and dogs, then sideways rushing, snap the wood around, ripped from the roots, loud clash their clattering tusks, till to the huntsman's spear they yield their lives. So clattered on those champions' brass clad breasts the hostile weapons. Stubbornly they fought, relying on their strength, and friends above, for from the well-built towers huge stones were hurled, by those who for themselves, their tents and ships, maintained defensive warfare. Thick they fell as wintry snowflakes, which upon the boisterous wind, driving the shadowy clouds, spreads fast and close, o'er all the surface of the fertile earth, so thick from Grecian and from Trojan hands the weapons flew. On helm and bossy shield with grating sound the ponderous masses rang. 
again, deeply groaning, as he smote his thigh, thus spoke dismayed the son of Hurtigus. O oh, father Jove, how hast thou loved our hopes to falsify, who deemed not that the Greeks would stand our onset and resistless arms? But they, as yellow-banded wasps or bees, that by some rocky pass have built their nests, abandoned not their caverned home, but wait the attack, and boldly for their offspring fight. So from the gates these two, though two alone, retire not, till they be or tain or slain. He said, but Jove regarded not his words, so much on Hector's triumph he was bent. Like battle raged round the other gates, but hard it were for me, with godlike power, to paint each several combat, for around the wall a more than human storm of stone was poured on every side. The Greeks, hard pressed, perforce fought for their ships, while all the gods looked on indignant who the Grecian cause upheld. Fiercely the Lapithi sustained the war. Stout Polypetes first, Pyrithous' son, smote through the brass-cheeked helmet, Damasus. Nor stayed the brazen helm, the spear, whose point went crashing through the bone, that all the brain was shattered. Onward as he rushed, he fell. Then Pylon next, and Orminus he slew. Meantime, Leontius, scion true of Mars, struck with unerring spear, Hippomachus, son of Antimachus, below the waist. Then, drawing from the sheaf his trenchant sword, dashed through the crowd, and hand to hand he smote Antiphates. He, backward, fell to earth. Menon, Iamenus, Orestes next, in quick succession, to the ground he brought. From these, while they their glittering armor stripped, round Hector thronged, and bold Polydamus, the bravest and the best, who longed the most to storm the wall and burn with fire the ships. Yet on the margin of the ditch they paused, for as they sought to cross, a sign from heaven appeared to leftward of the astonished crowd. A soaring eagle in his talons bore a dragon, huge of size, of blood-red hue, alive and breathing still, nor yet subdued. For twisting backward through the breast he pierced his bearer, near the neck he, stung with pain, let fall his prey, which dropped amid the crowd. Then, screaming, on the blast was borne away. The Trojans, shuddering, in their midst beheld the spotted serpent, dire portent of Jove. Then to bold Hector thus Polydamus. Hector, in counsel thou reprovest me oft for good advice. It is not meet, thou sayest, that private men should talk beside the mark in counsel or in war, but study still thine honour to exalt. Yet must I now declare what seems to me the wisest course. Let us not fight the Greeks beside their ships, for thus I read the future, if indeed to us about to cross this sign from heaven was sent, to leftward of the astonished crowd, a soaring eagle bearing in its claws a dragon, huge of size, of blood-red hue, alive, yet dropped him ere he reached his home, nor to his nestlings bore the intended prey. 
So we, e'en though our mighty strength should break the gates and wall, and put the Greeks to rout, by the same road, not scatheless should return, but many a Trojan on the field should leave, slain by the Greeks, while they in their ships defend. So would a seer, well versed in augury, worthy of public credit, read this sign. To whom thus Hector of the glancing helm replied with stern regard, Polydamus, this speech of thine is alien to my soul. Thy better judgment, better counsel knows. But if in earnest such is thine advice, Thee of thy senses hath the gods bereft, Who fain wouldst have us disregard the word And promise by the nod of Jove confirmed, And put our faith in birds' expanded wings? Little of these I reck, nor care to look, If to the right and toward the morning sun, or to the left and shades of night they fly. Put we our trust in Jove's eternal will, of mortals and immortals, king supreme. The best of omens is our country's cause. Why shouldst thou tremble at the battle strife, though every Trojan else were doomed to die beside the ships? No fear lest thou shouldst fall, unwarlike is thy soul, nor firm of mood. But if thou shrink, or by thy craven words turn back another Trojan from the fight, my spear shall take the forfeit of thy life. Then Jove, the lightning's lord, from Ida's heights, a storm of wind sent down, driving the dust against the Grecian ships, which quelled their courage, and to Hector gave, and to the Trojans, fresh incitement. They, on their own strength, and heavenly signs relying, their force addressed to storm the Grecian wall. They raised the counterscarp, the battlements destroyed, and the projecting buttresses, which, to sustain the towers, the Greeks had fixed deep in the soil, with levers undermined. These, once withdrawn, they hoped to storm the wall. Nor from the passage yet the Greeks withdrew, but closely fencing with their bull's hide shields the broken battlements. They thence hurled down a storm of weapons on the foe beneath. Commanding from the tower in every place were seen the agencies, urging to the fight, imploring these and those in sterner tones rebuking who their warlike toil relaxed. Friends, Grecians all, Ye who excel in war, and ye of moderate or inferior strength, though all are not with equal powers endued, yet here is work for all. Bear this in mind, nor toward the ships let any turn his face, by threats dismayed, but forward press, and each encourage each, if so. The lightning's lord, Olympian Jove, may grant us to repel, and backward to his city chase the foe. Thus they, with cheering words, sustained the war. Thick as the snowflakes on a wintry day, when Jove, the lord of counsel, down on men his snowstorm sends, and manifests his power, hushed the winds, the flakes continuous fall, that on the high mountain tops and jutting crags, and lotus covered meads are buried deep, and man's productive labors of the field, 
on hoary ocean's beach and bays they lie the approaching waves their bound o'er all beside is spread by jove the heavy veil of snow so thickly flew the stones from either side by greeks on trojans hurled by these on greeks and clattered loud through all its length the wall nor yet the trojans though by hector led the gates had broken and the massive bar but jove against the greeks sent forth his son sarpedon as a lion on a herd his shield's broad orb before his breast he bore well wrought of beaten brass which the armourer's hand had beaten out and lined with stout bull's hide with golden rods continuous all around he thus equipped two javelins brandishing strode onward as a lion mountain-bred whom fasting long his dauntless courage leads to assail the flock though in well-guarded fold and though the shepherds there he find prepared with dogs and lances to protect the sheep not unattempted will he leave the fold but springing to the midst he bears his prey in triumph thence or in the onset falls wounded by javelins hurled by stalwart hands so prompted by his godlike courage burned sarpedon to assail the lofty wall and storm the ramparts and to glaucus thus son of hippolochus his speech addressed whence is it glaucus that in lycian land we too at feasts the foremost seats may claim the largest portions and the fullest cups why held as gods in honour why endowed with ample heritage by xanthus's banks of a vineyard and of wheat producing land then by the lycians should we not be seen the foremost to affront the raging fight so may our well-armed lycians make their boast to no inglorious kings we lycians owe allegiance they on richest vines feed of luscious flavoured drink the choicest wine but still their valour brightest shows and they where lycians war are foremost in the fight o oh, friend if we survivors of this war could live from age and death for ever free thou shouldst not see me foremost in the fight nor would i urge thee to the glorious field but since on man ten thousand forms of death attend which none may scape then on that we may glory on others gain or they on us thus he nor glaucus from his bidding shrank and forward straight they led the lycian's powers menestheus son of Pateus, with dismay observed their movement for on his command inspiring terror their attack was made he looked around him to the grecian towers if any chief might there be found to save his comrades from destruction there he saw of war insatiable the ajaces twain and teucer from the tent but newly come hard by nor yet could reach them with his voice such was the din such tumult rose to heaven from clattering shields and horsehair crested helms and battered gates now all at once assailed before them fiercely strove the assaulting band to break their way he then thawates sent his herald to the agencies craving aid haste thee thawates on the agencies call both if it may be 
so we best may hope to scape the death, which else is near at hand. So fierce the pressure of the Lycian chiefs, undaunted now as ever in the fight. But if they too are hardly pressed, at least let Ajax, son of Telamon, be spared, and with him Teucer, skilled to draw the bow. He said. The herald heard and straight obeyed. Along the wall where stood the brass-clad Greeks, he ran, and standing near the Ajaces, said, Ajaces, leader of the brass-clad Greeks, the son of heaven-born Pateus craves your aid to share a while the labours of his guard, both if it may be, so he best may hope to scape the death which else is near at hand. So fierce the pressure of the Lycian chiefs, undaunted now as ever in the fight. But if ye too are hardly pressed, at least let Ajax, son of Telamon, be spared, and with him Teucer, skilled to draw the bow. He said, the mighty son of Telamon, consenting, thus addressed Oileus' son, Ajax, do thou, and valiant Lyomede, exhort the Greeks the struggle to maintain, while I go yonder to affront the war, to aid their need, and back return in haste. Thus saying, Ajax Telamon set forth, and with him Teucer went, his father's son, while by Pandion Teucer's bow was born. At brave Menestheus' tower, within the wall arrived, sore pressed they found the garrison. For like a whirlwind on the ramparts poured the Lycians' valiant counsellors and chiefs. They quickly joined the fray, and loud arose the battle cry. First Ajax Telamon, Sarpedon's comrade, brave Epicles slew struck by a rugged stone within the wall which lay the topmost of the parapet of size prodigious which with both his hands a man in youth's full vigour scarce could raise as men are now he lifted it on high and downward hurled the four-peaked helm it broke crushing the bone and shattering all the skull he like a diver from the lofty tower, fell headlong down, and life forsook his bones. Teucer, meanwhile, from off the lofty wall, the valiant Glaucus, pressing to the fight, struck with an arrow, where he saw his arm unguarded. He no longer brooked the fray. Back from the wall he sprang, in hopes to hide from Grecian eyes his wound, that none might see and triumph o'er him with insulting words. With grief Sarpedon saw his friend withdraw, yet not relaxed his efforts. Thestor's son, Alcmaeon, with his spear he stabbed, and back the weapon drew. He, following, Prostrate fell, and loudly rang his arms of polished brass. Then, at the parapet, with stalwart hand, Sarpedon tugged, and, yielding to his force, down fell the block entire. The wall laid bare, to many at once the breach gave open way. Ajax and Teucer him at once assailed. This, with an arrow struck, the glittering belt around his breast, whence hung his ponderous shield. But Jove, who willed not that his son should fall before the ships, the weapon turned aside. Then forward Ajax sprang, 
and with his spear thrust at the shield. The weapon passed not through, yet checked his bold advance. A little space back he recoiled, but not the more withdrew, his soul on glory intent, and, rallying quick, thus to the warlike Lycians shouted loud, Why, Lycians, thus your wonted might relax? Tis hard for one alone, how brave soe'er, e'en though he break the rampart down, to force a passage to the ships. But on with me, for work is here for many hands to do. He said, and by the king's rebuke, abashed, with fiercer zeal the Lycians pressed around their king and counsellor. On the other side, within the wall, the Greeks their squadrons massed. Then were great deeds achieved, nor through the breach could the brave troops of Lycia to the ships their passage force, nor could the warrior Greeks repel the Lycians from the ground, for they, before the wall, had made their footing good. As when two neighbours in a common field, each line in hand within a narrow space about the limits of their land contend, between them thus the rampart drew the line, o'er which the full-orbed shields of tough bulls hide, and lighter bucklers on the warriors' breasts, on either side they clove and many a wound the pitiless weapons dealt on some who turned their neck and back laid bare on many more who full in front and through their shields were struck on every side the parapet and towers with greek and trojan blood were spattered o'er nor yet E'en so the Greeks to flight were driven, but as a woman that for wages spins, honest and true, with wool and weights in hand, in even balance holds the scales to meet her humble hire, her children's maintenance, so even hung the balance of the war, till Jove with highest honour Hector crowned, the son of Priam. He, the foremost, scaled the wall, and loudly on the Trojans called, On, valiant Trojans, on! The Grecian wall break down, and wrap their ships in blazing fires. Thus he, exhorting, spoke. They heard him all, and to the wall rushed numberless, and swarmed upon the ramparts, bristling thick with spears. Then Hector, stooping, seized a ponderous stone that lay before the gates. T'was broad below, but sharp above and scarce two laboring men, the strongest, from the ground, could raise it up, and load upon a wain, as men are now. But he, unaided, lifted it with ease, so light it seemed, by grace of Saturn's son. As in one hand a shepherd bears with ease a full-sized fleece, and scarcely feels the weight, so Hector toward the portals bore the stone, which closed the lofty double-folding gates, within defended by two massive bars, laid crosswise, and with one cross-bolt secured. Close to the gates he stood, and planting firm his foot, 
to give his arm its utmost power, full on the middle dashed the mighty mass. The hinges both gave way, the ponderous stone fell inwards, widely gaped the opening gates, nor might the bars within the blow sustain. This way and that the severed portals flew before the crashing missile. Dark as night his lowering brow, great Hector sprang within. Bright flashed the brazen armor on his breast, as through the gates, two javelins in his hand, he sprang. The gods accept, no power might meet that onset, blazed his eyes with lurid fire. Then, to the Trojans, turning to the throng, he called aloud to scale the lofty wall. They heard, and straight obeyed. Some scaled the wall, some through the strong-built gates continuous poured, while in confusion irretrievable fled to their ships the panic-stricken Greeks. End of Book Twelve Book Thirteen, Part One of The Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. Argument. The fourth battle continued, in which Neptune assists the Greeks. The Acts of Idomeneus. Neptune, concerned for the loss of the Grecians, upon seeing the fortification forced by Hector, who had entered the gate near the station of the Aegises, assumes the shape of Calchas, and inspires those heroes to oppose him. Then, in the form of one of the generals, encourages the other Greeks who had retired to their vessels. The Aegises form their troops into a close phalanx, and put a stop to Hector and the Trojans. Several deeds of valor are performed. Meriones, losing his spear in the encounter, repairs to seek another at the tent of Idomeneus. This occasions a conversation between these two warriors, who return together to the battle. Idomeneus signalizes his courage above the rest. He kills Othryoneus, Asius, and Alcathous. Deiphobus and Aeneas march against him. And at length Idomeneus retires. Menelaus wounds Helenus and kills Pisander. The Trojans are repulsed in the left wing. Hector still keeps his ground against the Aegises, till, being galled by the Locrian slingers and archers, Polydemus advises to call a council of war. Hector approves his advice but goes first to rally the Trojans, upbraids Paris, rejoins Polydemus, meets Ajax again, and renews the attack. The eight-and-twentieth day still continues. The scene is between the Grecian Wall and the seashore. When Jove had Hector and the Trojans brought close to the ships, he left them there to toil and strife continuous, turning his keen glance to view far off the equestrian tribes of Thrace, the warlike Mycians, and the men who feed on milk of mares, thence Hippomolgi termed a peaceful race, 
the justest of mankind. On Troy he turned his piercing glance, nor deemed he any god would dare to give to Trojans or to Greeks his active aid. No careless watch the monarch Neptune kept. Wondering, he viewed the battle where he sat, aloft on wooded Samos's topmost peak, Samos of Thrace, whence Ida's height he saw, and Priam's city, and the ships of Greece. Thither ascended from the sea, he sat, and thence the Greeks, by Trojans overborne, pitying, he saw, and deeply wroth with Jove. Then down the mountain's craggy side he passed with rapid step, and as he moved along, beneath the mortal feet of ocean's lord, quaked the huge mountain and the shadowy wood. Three strides he took, the fourth he reached his goal, e.g., where on the margin of the bay his temple stood, all glittering of gold, imperishable. There arrived he yoked beneath his car the brazen-footed steeds of swiftest flight, with manes of flowing gold, all clad in gold, the golden lash he grasped of curious work, and, mounting on his car, skimmed o'er the waves. From all the depths below gambled around the monsters of the deep, acknowledging their king. The joyous sea parted her waves, swift flew the bounding steeds, nor was the brazen axle wet with spray, when to the ships of Greece their lord they bore. Down in the deep recesses of the sea, a spacious cave there is, which lies midway twixt Tenedos and Ambrose's rocky isle. The earth-shaking Neptune there his coursers stayed, loosed from the chariot, and before them placed ambrosial provender, and round their feet shackles of gold, which none might break nor loose, that there they might await their lord's return. Then to the Grecian army took his way. Meantime, by Hector, son of Priam, led like fire or whirlwind, pressed the Trojans on with furious zeal and shouts and clamour hoarse, in hopes to take the ships and all the chiefs to slay beside them. But from ocean's depths uprose the earth-shaker, circler of the earth, to Calchas's likeness and deep voice conformed, and roused the fainting Greeks. The Aegises first, themselves with ardour filled, he thus addressed. Tis yours, Aegises, filled with courage high, discarding chilly fear to save the Greeks. Elsewhere I dread not much the Trojan force, though they in crowds have scaled the lofty wall. The well-grieved Greeks their onset may defy. Yet greatly fear I, lest we suffer loss, where that fierce fiery madman Hector leads, who boasts himself the son of Jove, most high, but may some god your hearts inspire, yourselves firmly to stand, and cheer your comrades on. So from your swiftly sailing ships ye yet may drive the foe, how bold soe'er ye be. 
though by Olympian Jove himself upheld. So spake the earth shaker, circler of the earth, and with his scepter touching both the chiefs, filled them with strength and courage, and their limbs, their feet and hands with active vigour strung. Then like a swift winged falcon sprang to flight, which down the sheer face of some lofty rock swoops on the plain to seize his feathered prey, so swiftly Neptune left the chiefs. Him first departing knew Oileus's active son, that thus the son of Telamon addressed. Ajax, since some one of the Olympian gods, in likeness of a seer, hath thither come to urge us to the war, no Calchas he, our augur, heaven-inspired, for well I marked his movements as he went, and of a god tis easy to discern the outward signs. I feel fresh spirit kindled in my breast, and new-born vigour in my feet and hands. Whom answered thus the son of Telamon? My hands too grasp with firmer hold the spear, my spirit like thine is stirred. I feel my feet instinct with fiery life, nor should I fear with Hector, son of Priam, in his might, alone to meet and grapple to the death. Such was their mutual converse, as they joyed in the fierce transport by the god inspired. Neptune, meanwhile, the other Greeks aroused, who, to the ships withdrawn, their wasted strength recruited, for their limbs were faint with toil and grief was in their hearts as they beheld the Trojan hosts that scaled the lofty wall. They saw, and from their eyes the teardrops fell of safety desperate. But the earth-shaking god, amid their ranks appearing, soon restored their firm array. To Teucer first he came, Tuliaitis, and valiant Paneleus, Tossus, Deipyrus, Meriones, and young Antilochus, brave warriors all, and to the chiefs his winged words addressed. Shame on ye, Grecian youths! To you I looked as to our ship's defenders. But if ye shrink from the perilous battle, then indeed our day is come to be by Troy subdued. O oh, heaven, a sad and wondrous sight is this, a sight I never deemed my eye should see. Our ships assailed by Trojan troops, by those who heretofore have been as timorous hinds amid the forest depths, the helpless prey of jackals, pards, and wolves. They, here and there, uncertain, heartless, unresisting, fly. Such were the Trojans once, nor dared abide no, not an hour, the strength and arms of Greece. And these are they who now beside our ships, far from their city's walls, maintain the fight, emboldened by our great commander's fault and slackness of the people, who with him offended Scarce are brought to guard our ships, and, feebly fighting, are beside them slain. Even though 
the mighty monarch, Atreus' son, wide-ruling Agamemnon, be in truth wholly to blame in this, that he hath wronged the son of Peleus. Yet tis not for us our courage to relax. Arouse ye then. The brave man's spirit its vigour soon regains, that ye, the best and bravest of the host, should stand aloof thus idly, tis not well. If meaner men should from the battle shrink, I might not blame them, but that such as ye should falter, indignation fills my soul. Dear friends, from this remissness must accrue yet greater evils, but with generous shame and keen remorse let each man's breast be filled. Fierce is the struggle. In his pride of strength Hector has forced the gates and massive bars, and raging mid the ships maintains the war. Thus Neptune on the Greeks reproving called, and round the Aegises twain were clustered thick the serried files, whose firm array nor Mars nor spirit-stirring Pallas might reprove, for there the bravest all in order due waited the Trojan charge by Hector led. Spear close by spear, and shield by shield o'erlaid, buckler to buckler pressed, and helm to helm, and man to man, the horsehair plumes above that nodded on the warrior's glittering crests each other touched, so closely massed they stood. Backward by many a stalwart hand were drawn the spears, in act to hurl, their eyes and mind turned to the front, and eager for the fray. On poured the Trojan masses, in the van Hector straight forward urged his furious course. As some huge boulder from its rocky bed detached, and by the wintry torrent's force hurled down the cliff's steep face, when constant rains the massive rock's firm hold have undermined, with giant bounds it flies, the crashing wood resounds beneath it, still it hurries on, until, arriving at the level plain, its headlong impulse checked, it rolls no more. So Hector, threatening now through ships and tents, e'en to the sea, to force his murderous way, anon, confronted by that phalanx firm, halts close before it while the sons of Greece, with thrust of sword and double-pointed spears, stave off his onset. He a little space withdrew, and loudly on the Trojans called. Trojans, and Lycians, and ye Dardans famed in close encounter, stand ye firm, not long, the Greeks, though densely massed, shall bar my way. But soon, methinks, before my spear shall quail, if from the chief of gods my mission be, from Jove, the thunderer, royal Juno's lord. His words fresh courage raised in every breast, on loftiest deeds intent, Deiphobus, the son of Priam, from the foremost ranks, his shield's broad orb, before him borne, advanced, with airy step, protected by the shield. At him, Moriones, with glittering spear, took aim, nor missed his mark, 
the shield's broad orb of tough bull's hide it struck, but passed not through, for near the head the sturdy shaft was snapped. Yet from before his breast Deiphobus held at arm's length his shield, for much he feared the weapon of Meriones. But he back to his comrades' sheltering ranks withdrew, grieved at his baffled hopes and broken spear. Then toward the ships he bent his steps to seek another spear, which in his tent remained. The rest, mid wild uproar, maintained the fight. There Teucer first, the son of Telamon, a warrior slew, the son of Mentor, lord of numerous horses, Imbrius, spearman skilled. In former days, ere came the sons of Greece, he in Pedesis dwelt, and had to wife Medisa Caste, Priam's bastard child. But when the well-trimmed ships of Greece appeared, returned to Troy, and there, revered by all, with Priam dwelt, who loved him as a son. Him Teucer, with his lance below the ear, stabbed, and drew back the weapon. Down he fell, as by the woodman's axe, on some high peak falls a proud ash, conspicuous from afar, scattering its tender foliage on the ground, he fell, and loud his burnished armor rang. Forth Teucer sprang to seize the spoil, at whom advancing Hector aimed his glittering spear. He saw, and stooping shunned the brazen death a little space, but through the breast it struck Amphimachus, the son of Cateatus, the son of Actor, hastening to the fight. Thundering he fell, and loud his armor rang. Then forward Hector sprang, in hopes to seize the brazen helm that fitted well the brow of brave Amphimachus. But Ajax met the advance of Hector with his glittering spear. Himself he reached not, all in dazzling brass encased, but pressing on his bossy shield, drove by main force beyond where lay the dead. Them both the Greeks withdrew. The Athenian chiefs, Stichius and brave Menestheus, bore away amid the ranks of Greece Amphimachus while as two lions high above the ground bear through the brushwood in their jaws a goat snatched from the sharp-fanged dog's protecting care so filled with warlike rage the ajaces twain lifted on high and of its armor stripped the corpse of imbrius and oileus's son Grieved at Amphimachus, his comrade's death, Cut from the tender neck, and like a ball sent whirling through the crowd, The severed head, and in the dust at Hector's feet it fell. Then for his grandson slain, fierce anger filled the breast of Neptune, Through the tents of Greece and ships he passed, the Greeks encouraging, and ills preparing for the sons of Troy. Him met Idomeneus, the warrior king, leaving a comrade from the battlefield wounded by the knee, but newly brought. Born by his comrades to the leech's care, he left him, eager to rejoin the fray, whom by his tent the earth-shaking god addressed, the voice assuming of Andremon's son, who, o'er the Aetolians 
as a god revered, in Pleuron reigned, and lofty Caledon. Where now, Idomeneus, sage Cretan chief, or all the vaunting threats so freely poured against the Trojans by the sons of Greece? To whom the Cretan king, Idomeneus, Tossus, on none, so far as I may judge, may blame be cast. We all our duties know, nor see I one by heartless fear restrained, nor hanging back and flinching from the war. Yet by the o'erruling will of Saturn's son, it seems decreed that here the Greeks should fall, and far from Argos lie in nameless graves. But, Tossus, as thyself art ever staunch, nor slow the laggards to reprove, thy work remit not now, but rouse each several man. To whom earth-shaking Neptune thus replied, I Dominus, may he from Troy return no more, but here remain to glut the dogs, if such there be from this day's fight, who shrinks? But haste thee, don thine arms, great need is now to hasten, if in aught we too may serve. E'en meaner men, united, courage gain, but we the bravest need not fear to meet. He said, and to the strife of men returned. Within his well-constructed tent arrived, straight donned Idomeneus his armor bright. Two spears he took, and like the lightning's flash, which, as a sign to men, the hand of Jove hurls downwards from Olympus's glittering heights, whose dazzling radiance far around is thrown. Flashed, as the warrior ran, his armor bright. Him met Meriones, his follower brave, close to the tent, to seek a spear he came. To whom, Idomeneus? Meriones, swift-footed son of Molus, comrade dear, why comest thou here, and leavest the battlefield? Hast thou some wound received, whereof the pain subdues thy spirit? Or comest thou to the field to summon me? Unsummoned, well thou knowest, I better love the battle than the tent. Whom answered thus the sage Meriones? I Dominus, the brass-clad Cretan's king, I come to seek a spear, if haply such within thy tent be found, for in the fight that which I lately bore, e'en now I broke against the shield of brave Deiphobus. To whom I Dominus, the Cretan king, of spears, or one, or twenty, if thou list, Thou there mayst find against the polished wall The spoils of Trojans slain. For with my foes tis not my want To wage a distant war. Thence have I store of spears, And bossy shields, and crested helms, And breastplates polished bright. Whom answered thus the sage Meriones? Nor are my tent and dark-ribbed ship devoid of Trojan spoils, but they are far to seek. Nor deem I that my hand is slack in fight, for mid the foremost in the glorious strife I stand, whene'er is heard the battle cry. My deeds by others of the brass-clad Greeks may not be noted, 
but thou know'st them well. To whom I Dominus, the Cretan king. What need of this? Thy prowess well I know. For should we choose our bravest through the fleet to man the secret ambush, surest test of warrior's courage, where is manifest the difference twixt the coward and the brave? The coward's colour changes, nor his soul within his breast its even balance keeps. But changing still, from foot to foot he shifts, and in his bosom loudly beats his heart, expecting death, and chatter all his teeth. The brave man's colour changes not, no fear he knows, the ambush entering. All his prayer is that the hour of battle soon may come. E'en there thy courage none might call in doubt, Shouldst thou from spear or sword receive a wound, Not on thy neck behind, nor on thy back would fall the blow, But on thy breast in front, still pressing onward mid the foremost ranks. But come, prolong we not this idle talk, like babblers vain, Whose scorn might justly move, haste to my tent, and there select thy spear. He said, and from the tent Meriones, valiant as Mars, his spear selected straight, and eager for the fray, rejoined his chief. As Mars, the bane of men, goes forth to war, attended by his strong, unfearing son, terror, who shakes the bravest warrior's soul. They too, from Thrace, against the Ephori, or haughty Phlegian's arm, nor hear alike the prayers of both the combatants, one side with victory crowning. So to battle went those leaders twain, in dazzling arms arrayed. Then thus Meriones, his chief, addressed. Son of Deucalion, say, if on the right or on the centre of the general host our onset should be made, or on the left, for there, methinks, most succour need the Greeks. To whom I Dominus, the Cretan chief, Others there are the centre to defend, the Ajaces both, and Teucer, of the Greeks' best archer, good too in the standing fight. These may for Hector full employment find, brave as he is, and eager for the fray. E'en for his courage, twere a task too hard there might to conquer, and resistless hands, and burn the ships, if Saturn's son himself fire not, and mid the shipping throw the torch. Great Ajax Telamon to none would yield of mortal birth, by earthly food sustained, by spear or ponderous stone assailable. In hand-to-hand -hand encounter, scarce surpassed by Peleus's son, Achilles, Though with him, in speed of foot, he might not hope to vie. Then on the left let us our onset make, And quickly learn if we on others' heads Are doomed to win renown, or they on ours. He said, and brave as Mars, Meriones, Thither, where he directed, led the way. Now when attended thus, Idomeneus, like blazing fire, in dazzling arms appeared. Around him thronged with rallying cries the Greeks, and raged beside the ships the balanced fight. 
as when the dust lies deepest on the roads, before the boisterous winds the storm drives fast, and high at once the whirling clouds are tossed. So was the fight confused, and in the throng each man with keen desire of slaughter burned. Bristled the deadly strife, with ponderous tears wielded with dire intent. The brazen gleam dazzled the sight, by flashing helmets cast, and breastplates polished bright, and glittering shields, co-mingling. Stern of heart, indeed, were he who on that sight with joy not pain could gaze dire evil then on mortal warriors brought the diverse minds of saturn's mighty sons to hector and the trojans jove designed in honour of achilles swift of foot to give the victory Yet not utterly he willed to slay before the walls of Troy the Grecian host, but glory to confer on Thetis and her noble-minded son. Neptune, on the other side, the Greeks inspired, clandestine, rising from the hoary sea. For them, before the Trojan host o'erborne, he saw with grief, and deeply wroth with Jove. Equal the rank of both, their birth the same. But Jove, in wisdom as in years, the first, nor ventured Neptune openly to aid the cause of Greece, but clothed in mortal form, in secret the army's courage roused. This way and that they tugged, a furious war and balanced strife, where many a warrior fell, the straining rope, which none might break or loose. Then, though his hair was grizzled o'er with age, calling the Greeks to aid, Idomeneus, inspiring terror, on the Trojans sprang, and slew Othryoneus who but of late came from Cabesus on the alarm of war, and welcomed, as a guest in Priam's house, the fairest of his daughters sought to wed, no portion asked, Cassandra. Mighty deeds he promised from before the walls of Troy, in their despite to drive the sons of Greece. The aged Priam listened to his snit, and he, his promise trusting, fought for Troy. Him, marching with proud step, Idomeneus struck with his glittering spear, nor aught availed his brazen breastplate. Through the middle thrust, thundering, he fell. The victor, vaunting, cried, O Thryonius, above all mortal men, I hold thee in respect, if thou indeed will make thy words to aged Priam good, who promised thee his daughter in return. We too would offer thee a like reward, and give thee here to wed from Argos brought, Atrides' fairest daughter if with us thou wilt o'erthrow the well-built walls of troy come then on board our ocean-going ships discuss the marriage contract nor shall we be found illiberal of our bridal gifts he said and seizing by the foot the slain dragged from the press but to the rescue came Asius, himself on foot before his car. So close his charioteer the horses held, they breathed upon his shoulders. Eagerly he sought to reach Idomeneus, but he, 
preventing, through his gullet drove the spear beneath the chin, right through the weapon passed. He fell. As falls an oak, or poplar tall, or lofty pine, which on the mountain top for some proud ship the woodman's axe hath hewn, so he, before the car and horses stretched, his death cry uttering, clutched the blood stained soil. Bewildered, helpless stood his charioteer, nor dared escaping from the foeman's hands to turn his horses. Him, Antilochus, beneath the waistband struck, nor aught availed his brazen breastplate. Through the middle thrust, he from the well-wrought chariot, gasping, fell. Antilochus, the noble Nestor's son, his horses seized, and from the Trojan ranks drove to the Grecian camp. For Asius' death, deep grieved, Deiphobus, approaching, hurled against Idomeneus his glittering spear. The coming weapon he beheld and shunned. Beneath the ample circle of his shield, with hides and brazen plates encircled round, and by two rods sustained, concealed he stood. Beneath he crouched, and o'er him flew the spear. Yet harsh it grated, glancing from the shield, nor bootless from that stalwart hand it flew, but through the midriff, close below the heart, Hypsenor, son of Hippasus, it struck, and straight relaxed his limbs. Then shouting loud in boastful tone, Deiphobus exclaimed, not unavenged lies Asius, he, methinks, as I have found him fellowship, with joy through Hades' strongly guarded gates they pass. He said, the Greeks indignant heard his boast, chief of Antilochus, the manly soul was stirred within him. Yet amid his grief, his comrade not forgetting, up he ran, and o'er him spread the cover of his shield. Meanwhile, two trusty friends, Mesistheus, son of Echius, and Alastor, raised the slain, and deeply groaning, bore him to the ships. Nor did Idomeneus his noble rage abate, still burning o'er some Trojan soul to draw the gloomy veil of night and death, or having saved the Greeks himself to fall. Then high-born Isuites' son he slew, Alcathous, he and Chyses' son-in-law, the eldest of his daughters had to wife, Hippodamia, by her parents both o'er all, beloved in beauty, skill, and mind, all her compeers surpassing, wife of one, the noblest man through all the breadth of Troy. Him, Neptune, by Idomeneus, subdued, sealed his quick eyes, his active limbs restrained, without the power to fly or shun the spear. Fixed as a pillar, or a lofty tree, he stood, while through his breast Idomeneus his weapon drove. The brazen mail it broke, which oft had turned aside the stroke of death. Harshly it grated, severed by the spear, he fell, the spear-point quivering in his heart, which with convulsive throbbings shook the shaft. There Mars its course arrested. 
then with shouts of triumph vaunting thus idomeneus how now deiphobus are three for one an equal balance where are now thy boasts come forth my friend thyself to me opposed and learn if here unworthy my descent from jove my great progenitor i stand he minos guardian chief of crete begot noble deucalion was to minos born i to deucalion far extends my rule in widespread crete whom now our ships have brought a bane to thee thy sire and trojans all he said and doubtful stood deiphobus or to retreat and summon to his aid the trojans or alone the venture try thus as he mused the wiser course appeared to seek aeneas him he found apart behind the crowd for he was still at feud with godlike priam who he thought withheld the public honour to his valour due to whom deiphobus approaching thus aeneas sagest counsellor of troy behooves thee now if reverence for the dead can move thy soul thy sister's husband aid haste we to save alcathous who of old when thou wast little in thy father's house nursed thee with tender care for him but now the spear renowned idomeneus hath slain he said aeneas's spirit was roused and filled with martial rage he sought idomeneus nor coward-like did he the encounter shun but firmly stood as stands a mountain boar self-confident that in some lonely spot awaits the clamorous chase bristles his back his eyes with fire are flashing and his tusks he wets on men and dogs prepared to rush so stood the spear renowned idomeneus the onset of aeneas swift in fight awaiting and the friends he saw around he summoned to his aid ascalaphus deiparus and brave Meriones, Antilochus, and Apharius. To these tried warriors all, he thus addressed his speech. Aid me, my friends, alone I stand, and dread the onset of Aeneas, swift of foot, mighty to slay in battle and the bloom of youth is his the crown of human strength if as our spirit our years were but the same great glory now should he or i obtain he said and one in heart their bucklers sloped upon their shoulders all beside him stood End of Book 13, Part 1Book 13, Part 2 of The Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. On the other side, Aeneas, to his aid, summoned his brother chiefs, Deiphobus, and Paris, and Agenor, 
following whom came on the general crowd, as flocks of sheep from pasture follow to their drinking place the lordly ram, well pleased the shepherd sees. So pleased Aeneas saw the gathering crowd. Then o'er Alcathous hand to hand was waged the war of spears. Dire was the clash of brass upon the heroes' breasts, as mid the press each aimed at other. Proudly eminent stood forth two mighty warriors, terrible as Mars, Aeneas and Idomeneus, their sharp spears wielding each at other's life. First at Idomeneus Aeneas threw his spear. He saw and shunned the brazen point and vainly from his stalwart hand dismissed aeneas's spear stood quivering in the ground idomeneus in front below the waist inomaeus struck the weighty spear broke through the hollow breastplate and the intestines tore prone in the dust he fell and clutched the ground forthwith idomeneus from out the corpse the ponderous spear withdrew yet could not strip his armor off so thickly flew the spears nor did his feet retain their youthful force his weapon to regain or back to spring skilled in the standing fight his life to guard he lacked the active power of swift retreat at him retiring slow deiphobus still filled with anger threw his glittering spear his aim he missed but through the shoulder pierced Ascalaphus, a valiant son of Mars. Prone in the dust he fell, and clutched the ground. Nor knew the loud-voiced mighty god of war that in the stubborn fight his son had fallen. On high Olympus, girt with golden clouds, he sat amid the immortals all restrained by Jove's commands from mingling the war. How hand to hand around Ascalaphus raged the fierce conflict. First Deiphobus from off his head the glittering helmet tore, but Terrible as Mars, Meriones sprang forth and pierced his arm, and from his hand, with hollow sound, the crested helmet fell. On, like a vulture, sprang Meriones, and from his arm the sturdy spear withdrew. Then backward leaped amid his comrades' ranks, while round his brother's waist Polites threw his arms and led him from the battlefield to where with charioteer and rich wrought car beyond the fight his flying coursers stood him racked with pain and groaning while the blood streamed down his wounded arm to Troy they pour. The rest fought on, and loud the tumult rose. Aeneas through the throat of Afarius, Calator's son, turned sideways toward him, drove his glittering spear, and down on the other side his shield and helmet following sank his head 
and o'er his eyes were cast the shades of death. As Thoon turned, Antilochus, who watched the occasion, forward sprang, and with his spear ripped all the flesh that lay along the spine, up to the neck. He backward fell, with hands uplifted, calling for his comrade's aid. But forward sprang Antilochus, and tore his armour from his breast, while round he cast his watchful glances. For on every side, on his broad shield, the Trojans showered their blows, but touched him not. For Neptune, mid the throng of weapons, threw his guard o'er Nestor's son, but in their midst commingled, nor held motionless his spear, but ever threatening, turned from side to side, prepared to hurl, or hand to hand engage. Him Adamus, the son of Asius, marked, as o'er the crowd he glanced, and springing forth struck with his spear the centre of the shield but dark-haired neptune grudged the hero's life and stayed the brazen point half in the shield like a fire-hardened stake remained infixed the other half lay broken on the ground Back to his comrade's sheltering ranks he sprang in hope of safety. But Meriones, quick following, plunged his weapon through his groin, where sharpest agony to wretched men attends on death. There planted he his spear, around the shaft he writhed and gasping groaned like to a mountain bull which bound with cords the herdsmen drag along with struggles vain resisting so the wounded warrior groaned but not for long for fierce meriones approaching from his body tore the spear and the dark shades of death his eyes o'erspread. Then Helenus, a weighty Thracian sword, wielding aloft across the temples, smote Deipyrus, and all his helmet crashed, which, as it rolled beneath their feet, some Greek seized mid the press, his eyes were closed in death. The valiant Menelaus, Atreus' son, with grief beheld, and royal Helenus, with threatening mien, approaching, poised on high his glittering spear, while he the bowstring drew. Then simultaneous flew from either side the gleaming spear and arrow from the string. The shaft of Priam's son below the breast the hollow cuirass struck and bounded off. As bound the dark-skinned beans or clattering peas from the broad fan upon the threshing floor, by the brisk breeze impelled, and winnower's force, from noble Menelaus' cuirass, so the stinging arrow bounding glanced afar. But valiant Menelaus, Atreus' son, transfixed the hand that held the polished bow. The brazen point passed through and to the bow the hand was pinned. 
Back to his comrades' ranks he sprang, in hope of safety, hanging down the wounded limb that trailed the ashen spear. Agenor from the wound the spear withdrew, and from a twisted sling of woollen cloth, Agenor from the wound the spear withdrew, and with a twisted sling of woollen cloth, by an attendant brought, bound up the hand. To noble Menelaus stood opposed Pisander, to the confines dark of death, led by his evil fate, by thee to fall, great son of Atreus, in the deadly strife. When near they drew, Atrides missed his aim with erring spear divergent. Next his shield Pisander struck, but drove not through the spear, for the broad shield resisted, and the shaft was snapped in sunder. Menelaus saw rejoicing, and with hope of triumph flushed. Unsheathing then his silver-studded sword, rushed on Pisander. He, beneath his shield, drew forth a ponderous brazen battle-axe, with handle long of polished olive-wood. And both at once in deadly combat joined. Then, just below the plume, Pisander struck the crested helmet's peak. But Atreus's son met him advancing, and across the brow smote him above the nose. Loud crashed the bone, and in the dust the gory eyeballs dropped before him. Doubled with the pain, he fell. The victor, planting on his chest his foot, stripped off his arms, and thus exulting cried, Thus shall ye all, insatiate of the fight, proud Trojans, from before our ships depart, nor lack your share of insult and of wrong, such as on me, vile hounds, ye cast erewhile, nor feared the avenger of the slighted laws of hospitality, high thundering Jove, who soon your lofty city shall o'erthrow. Kindly received my virgin-wedded wife, with store of goods, ye basely bore away, and now ye rage, infuriate, to destroy with fire our ocean-going ships, and slay our Grecian heroes. But the time shall come, when ye too fain would from the war escape. O father Jove, tis said that thou excellest in wisdom, gods and men, all human things from thee proceed, and can it be that thou with favour seest these men of violence, these Trojans with presumptuous courage filled, whose rage for the battle knows nor stint nor bound? Men are with all things sated, sleep and love, sweet sounds of music, and the joyous dance, of these may some more gladly take their fill. But Trojans still for war insatiate thirst. Thus Menelaus, and the blood-stained arms stripped from the corpse, and to his comrades gave. Then joined again the foremost in the fray. There to the encounter forth Harpalian sprang, son of King Polymenes, who came, his father following, to the war of Troy, but back returned not to his native land. 
He, standing near, full in the centre struck Atrides' shield, but drove not through the spear. Back to his comrades' sheltering ranks he sprang in hopes of safety, glancing all around his body to defend. But as he turned in his right flank a brazen-pointed shaft shot by Meriones, was buried deep. Beneath the bone it passed, and pierced him through. At once he fell, and gasping out his life amid his comrades, writhing on the ground like a crushed worm, he lay, and from the wound the dark blood pouring drenched the thirsty soil. The valiant troops of Paphlagonia closed around him. On his car they placed the slain, and, deeply sorrowing, to the city bore. His father, weeping, walked beside the car. Nor vengeance for his slaughtered son obtained. Paris, with grief and anger, saw him fall, for he, in former days, his guest had been in Paphlagonia. Then, with anger filled, a brass-tipped arrow from his bow he sent. A certain man there was, Eukinor named, who dwelt in Corinth, rich of blameless life, the son of Politus, skilful seer. His fate, well knowing, he embarked, for oft the good man had told him that his doom was, or at home, by sharp disease to die, or with the Greeks by Trojan hands to fall. Embarking, he escaped alike the fine by Greeks imposed, and pangs of sharp disease. Him Paris smote between the ear and jaw. Swift fled his spirit, and darkness closed his eyes. Thus raged, like blazing fire, the furious fight. But not as yet had Hector heard, nor knew, how sorely, leftward of the ships, were pressed the Trojans by the Greeks and now appeared in triumph sure, such succor Neptune gave, their courage rousing and imparting strength. But there he kept, where first the serried ranks of Greeks he broke, and stormed the wall and gates. There, beached beside the hoary sea, the ships of Ajax and Protesilaus lay, there had the wall been lowest built, and there were gathered in defence the chiefest all, horses and men. The stout Boeotians there, joined to the Ionians with their flowing robes, Lyrians and Thyans and Epeans proud, could scarce protect their ships, nor could repel the impetuous fire of godlike Hector's charge. There, too, the choicest troops of Athens fought, their chief Menestheus, Bataeus' son, with whom were Phidus, Stachius, Bias in command, the Apeans, Magis, Phileus' son, obeyed, and Dracius, and Amphion. Medon next, with brave Padarsis, led the Thyan host. Medon, the great Oileus' bastard son, brother of Ajax, he, in Phylace, far from his native land, was driven to dwell, since one to Arialpis near, akin. His sire, Oileus' wife, his hand had slain. Podarsis, from Iphiclus, claimed his birth, the son of Phylacus. These two, in arms, the valiant Thyans, leading to the fight, joined the Boeotian troops to guard the ships. 
but from the side of Ajax Telamon stirred not a whit Oileus's active son, but as on fallow land with one accord two dark red oxen drag the well wrought plough, streaming with sweat that gathers round their horns, they by the polished yoke together held the stiff soil cleaving down the furrow strain, so closely side by side those two advanced but comrades many and brave on telamon attended who whene'er with toil and sweat his limbs grew faint upheld his weighty shield while in the fray no locrians followed theirs were not the hearts to brook the endurance of the standing fight nor had they brass-bound helms with horsehair plume, nor ample shields they bore, nor ashen spear, but came to Troy in bows and twisted slings of woolen cloth confiding, and from these their bolts quick showering broke the Trojan ranks, while those in front in glittering arms opposed the men of Troy, by noble Hector led. These in the rear, unseen, their arrows shot, nor stood the Trojans, for amid their ranks the galling arrows dire confusion spread. Then had the Trojans from the ships and tents back to the breezy heights of Troy been driven in flight disastrous. But Polydamus drew near to Hector, and addressed him thus. Hector, I know thee, how unapt thou art to hearken to advice, because the gods have given thee to excel in warlike might, thou deemest thyself in counsel too supreme, yet every gift thou canst not so combine. To one the gods have granted warlike might, to one the dance, to one the lyre and song, while in another's breast all-seeing Jove hath placed the spirit of wisdom, and a mind discerning for the common good of all. By him are states preserved, and he himself best knows the value of the precious gift. Then hear what seems to me the wisest course. On every side the circling ring of war is blazing all around thee, and thou seest our valiant Trojans, since the wall they scaled, or stand aloof, or scattered mid the ships, outnumbered, with superior forces strive. Then, thou retiring, hither call the chiefs, here we take counsel fully, if to fall upon their well-manned ships should heaven vouchsafe the needful strength, or scatheless yet withdraw. For much I fear, they soon will pay us back their debt of yesterday, since in their ranks one yet remains insatiate of the fight, and he, methinks, not long will stand aloof, Thus he, the prudent counsel, Hector pleased. Down from his chariot, with his arms he leaped, and to Polydamus his speech addressed. Polydamus, detain thou here the chiefs, thither will I, and meet the front of war, and, given my orders, quickly here return. He said, and like a snow-clad mountain high, uprose, and loudly shouting, in hot haste, flew through the Trojan and confederate host. At sound of Hector's voice, round Panthous' son, Polydamus, were gathered all the chiefs, but mid the foremost combatants he sought, if haply, he might find Deiphobus, 
and royal Helenus, and Adamus, and gallant Asius, son of Herticus. These found he, not unscathed by wounds or death, for some beside the ships of Greece had paid, by Grecian hands, the forfeit of their lives, while others wounded lay within the wall. But to the leftward of the bloody fray, the godlike Paris, fair-haired Helen's lord, cheering his comrades to the fight, he found, and with reproachful words addressed him thus. Thou wretched Paris, fair in outward form, thou slave of woman, manhood's counterfeit, where is Deiphobus, and where the might of royal Helenus, where Adamus, the son of Asius, where to Asius, son of Herticus, and where Othryoneus, now from its summit totters to the fall our lofty Ilium, now thy doom is sure. To whom the godlike Paris thus replied, Hector, since blameless I incur thy blame, ne'er have I less withdrawn me from the fight, and me not wholly vile my mother bore. For since thou gavest command to attack the ships, we here against the Greeks unflinching war have waged. Our comrades, whom thou seek'st, are slain. Only Deiphobus hath left the field, and Helenus, both wounded by the spear, both through the hand. But Jove their life hath spared. But thou, where'er thy courage bids, lead on. We shall be prompt to follow. To our power thou shalt in us no lack of valour find. Beyond his power the bravest cannot fight. Wrought on his brother's mind the hero's words. Together both they bent their steps, where raged the fiercest conflict. There Sobriones, Phalces, Orpheus, brave Polydamus, Palmus, and godlike Polyphetes, might, and Morris, and Ascanius, fought. These two Hippotians' sons, from rich Ascanius' plains, they as reliefs but yester morn had come. Impelled by Jove, they sought the battlefield. Onward they dashed, impetuous as the rush of the fierce whirlwind, which with lightning charged from Father Jove sweeps downward o'er the plain. As with loud roar it mingles with the sea, the many dashing ocean's billows boil, upheaving, foam white crested, wave on wave, so rank on rank the Trojans closely massed, in arms all glittering, with their chiefs advanced. Hector, the son of Priam, led them on, in combat terrible as blood-stained Mars. Before his breast his shield's broad orb he bore, of hides close joined, with brazen plates o'erlaid. A gleaming helmet nodded o'er his brow. He, with proud step, protected by his shield, on every side the hostile ranks surveyed, if signs of yielding he might trace. But they unshaken stood, and with like haughty mien, Ajax at Hector thus defiance hurled. Draw nearer, mighty chief, why seek to scare our valiant Greeks? We boast ourselves of war, not wholly unskilled, though now the hand of Jove lies heavy on us with the scourge of heaven. Thou hopest, forsooth, our vessels to destroy. But 
stalwart arms, for their defence we boast. Long ere that day shall your proud city fall, taken and destroyed by our victorious hands. Not far the hour, when thou thyself in flight to Jove, and all the gods shall make thy prayer, that swifter than the falcon's wing thy steeds may bear thee o'er the dusty plain to Troy. Thus, as he spoke, upon his right appeared an eagle soaring high. The crowd of Greeks the favoring omen saw, and shouted loud. Then noble Hector thus. What words are these, Ajax, thou babbling braggart, vain of speech? For would to heaven I were as well assured I were the son of Aegis-bearing Jove, born of imperial Juno, and myself in equal honour with Apollo held, or blue-eyed Pallas, as I am assured this day is fraught with ill to all the Greeks. Thou, mid the rest, shalt perish, if thou dare my spear encounter, which thy dainty skin shall rend, and, slain beside the ships, thy flesh shall glut the dogs and carrion birds of Troy. He said, and led them on. With eager cheers they followed, shouted loud the hindmost throng. On the other side the Greeks returned the shout. Of all the Trojans' bravest, they unmoved the onset bore. Their mingled clamours rose to heaven, and reached the glorious light of Jove. End of Book 13, Part 2Book 14 of The Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. Argument Juno deceives Jupiter by the girdle of Venus. Nestor Sitting at the table with Machaon, is alarmed with the increasing clamor of the war, and hastens to Agamemnon. On his way he meets that prince, with Diomed and Ulysses, whom he informs of the extremity of the danger. Agamemnon proposes to make their escape by night, which Ulysses withstands, to which Diomed adds his advice, that Wounded as they are, they should go forth and encourage the army with their presence, which advice is pursued. Juno, seeing the partiality of Jupiter to the Trojans, forms a design to overreach him. She sets off her charms with the utmost care, and, the more surely to enchant him, obtains the magic girdle of Venus. She then applies herself to the god of sleep, and with some difficulty persuades him to seal the eyes of Jupiter. This done, she goes to Mount Ida, where the god at first sight is ravished with her beauty, sinks in her embraces, Neptune takes advantage of his slumber, and succours the Greeks. Hector is struck to the ground with a prodigious stone by Ajax, and carried off from the battle. Several actions succeed, till the Trojans, much distressed, are obliged to give way. The lesser Ajax, 
signalizes himself in a particular manner. Nor did the battle din not reach the ears of Nestor, or the wine cup, and his speech he thus addressed to Esculapius's son. Say, good Machaean, what these sounds may mean, for louder swells the tumult round the ships. But sit thou here, and drink the ruddy wine, till fair-haired Hecamedes shall prepare the gentle bath, and wash thy gory wounds, while I go forth and all around survey. He said, and from the wall a buckler took, well wrought, with brass resplendent, which his son, brave Thrasymedes, in the tent had left, while with his father's shield himself was girt. A sturdy spear, too, tipped with brass he took. Without the tent he stood, and there his eyes a woeful sight beheld. The Greeks in flight, the haughty Trojans pressing on their rout, confused, the Greeks protecting wall or throne. As heaves the darkling sea with silent swell, expectant of the boisterous gale's approach, nor onward either way is poured its flood, until it feel the impelling blast from heaven, so stood the old man, his mind perplexed with doubt, to mingle in the throng, or counsel seek of mighty Agamemnon, Atreus's son. Thus, as he mused, the better course appeared to seek Atrides. Fiercely fought the rest with mutual slaughter, Loud their armor rang with thrusts of swords and double-pointed spears. There Nestor met, advancing from the ships, the heaven-born kings Ulysses, Diomed, and Agamemnon, son of Atreus, all by wounds disabled, for the ships were beached upon the shore beside the hoary sea, far from the battle. Higher toward the plain, the foremost had been drawn, and with a wall their sterns surrounded, for the spacious beach could not contain them, and in narrow bounds were pent their multitudes. So high on land they drew, and ranged them side by side, and filled within the headlands all the wide mouth bay. Thus they, their steps, Supporting on their spears, together came spectators of the fight. Deep sorrow filled their breasts. Them Nestor met, the fear increasing, which their souls possessed. To whom the monarch Agamemnon thus. O oh, Nestor, son of Neleus, pride of Greece! Why comest thou here, and leavest the battlefield? Greatly I fear, that noble Hector now his menace will fulfil, who made his boast before the assembled Trojans, that to Troy he never would return, until our ships the flames had mastered, and ourselves the sword. Such was his threat, and now he makes it good. Heaven! Can it be that I, of other Greeks, as of Achilles, have incurred the wrath who thence refuse to battle for the ships? To whom Gerenian Nestor thus replied, Such are indeed our prospects. Jove on high could to our fortunes Give no different turn. The wall is raised, whereon our trust was placed, To guard, impregnable, ourselves and ships. And now, around the ships, 
their war they wage, unceasing, unabated. None might tell, by closest scrutiny, which way are driven the routed Greeks, so intermixed they fall, promiscuous, and the cry ascends to heaven. But come, discuss we what may best be done, if judgment aught may profit us, ourselves to mingle in the fray. I counsel not. It were not well for wounded men to fight. Whom answered Agamemnon, king of men? Nestor, since to the ships the war is brought, nor hath the wall availed to stay their course, nor yet the deep-dug trench on which we Greeks much toil bestowed, and which we vainly hoped might guard, impregnable, ourselves and ships. Seems it the will of Saturn's mighty son, that, far from Argos, from our native land, we all should here in nameless graves be laid. I knew when once he loved to aid the Greeks, but now I see that to the blessed gods our foes he equals, and our strength confounds. Hear then my counsel. Let us all agree, the ships that nearest to the sea are beached, to launch upon the main, till nightfall, there to ride at anchor. If that, e'en by night, the Trojans may suspend their fierce assault, then may we launch in safety all the fleet. No shame it is to fly, although by night, impending evil, better so to fly than by the threatened danger be overtaken. To whom with scornful glance Ulysses sage. What words have passed the barrier of thy lips, thou son of Atreus, counsellor of ill? Would thou hadst been of some ignoble band the leader, not the chief of such a host as ours, on whom from youth to latest age Jove hath the gift bestowed to bear the brunt of hardy war till every man be slain. And think'st thou so to leave the lofty walls of Troy, the object of our painful toil? Be silent, that no other Greek may hear words which no man might trust his tongue to speak, who nobler counsels understand, and wields a royal sceptre, and the allegiance claims of numbers, such as those that own thy sway. Thy counsels all I utterly condemn, who, mid the close and clamour of the fight, wouldst have us launch our ships, and give the foe, already too triumphant, cause renewed for boasting. Then were death our certain lot, for if the ships be launched, not long will Greeks sustain the war, but with reverted eyes shrink from the fight. To such pernicious end would lead thy baneful counsels, mighty chief. Whom answered Agamemnon, king of men? Ulysses, thy rebuke hath wrung my soul. Yet never meant I that against their will the sons of Greece should launch their well-found ships. But if there be who better counsel knows, or young or old, his words would please me well. Then rose the valiant Diomed, and said, The man is near at hand, nor far to seek, if ye will hear, 
nor take offence that I, the youngest of you all, presume to speak. Yet of a noble sire I boast me sprung, Tydeus, who sleeps beneath the Theban soil. To Portheus three brave sons were born, who dwelt in Pleuron, and in lofty Caledon, Agrius and Melas, bravest of them all, my father's father, Aeneus, was the third. He there remained. My father, wandering long, to Argos came, such was the will of Jove, and of the immortals all. He there espoused Adrastus's daughter, owned a wealthy house, with fertile cornlands round, and orchards stored with goodly fruit trees, numerous flocks he had, and all the Greeks in feats of arms excelled. Hear ye the words I speak, for they are true, and if my speech be wise, despise it not, as one of worthless or ignobly born. Though wounded, to the battle I advise, that we perforce repair, yet not ourselves to join the combat or confront the spears, lest wounds to wounds be added but to rouse the spirits of some who, zealous heretofore, now stand aloof, nor mingle in the fray. He said, and they his words approving went, by Agamemnon led the king of men. Nor careless was the watch by Neptune kept, with them, in likeness of an aged man, he went, and Agamemnon, Atreus' son, by the right hand he took, and thus addressed. O son of Atreus, great is now the joy which with Achilles' savage breast is filled, who sees the slaughter and the rout of Greeks. But not he has of heart, no, not a wit, but perish he, accursed of the gods. Nor deem thou that to thee the blessed gods are wholly hostile. Yet again the chiefs and counsellors of Troy shall scour in flight the dusty plain, and from the ships and tents Thine eyes shall see them to the city fly. He said, and loudly shouting onward rushed, as of nine thousand or ten thousand men in deadly combat meeting is the shout. Such was the sound which from his ample chest the earth shaker sent, and every Greek inspired with stern resolve to wage unflinching war. Standing on high Olympus's topmost peak, the golden-throned Juno downward looked, and, busied in the glory-giving strife, her husband's brother and her own she saw, saw and rejoiced. Next, Seated on the crest of spring-abounding Ida, Jove, she saw, sight hateful in her eyes. Then pondered deep the stag-eyed queen, how best she might beguile the wakeful mind of aegis-bearing Jove. And, musing, this appeared the readiest mode, herself with art adorning, to repair to Ida, there with fondest blandishment and female charm, her husband to enfold in love's embrace, and gentle, careless sleep around his eyelids and his senses pour. Her chamber straight she sought, by Vulcan built her son, 
by whom were to the door-posts hung close-fitting doors with secret keys secured that save herself no god might enter in there entered she and closed the shining doors and with ambrosia first her lovely skin she purified with fragrant oil anointing ambrosial breathing forth such odours sweet that waved above the brazen floor of jove all earth and heaven were with the fragrance filled o'er her fair skin this precious oil she spread combed out her flowing locks and with her hand wreathed the thick masses of the glossy hair immortal bright that crowned the imperial head a robe ambrosial then by pallas wrought she donned in many a curious pattern traced with golden brooch beneath her breast confined her zone from which a hundred tassels hung she girt about her and in three bright drops her glittering gems suspended from her ears and all around her grace and beauty shone then o'er her head the imperial goddess threw a beauteous veil new wrought as sunlight white and on her well-turned feet her sandals bound her dress completed from her chamber forth she issued and from the other gods apart she called to venus and addressed her thus say wilt thou grant dear child the boon i ask or wilt thou say me nay in wrath that i espouse the greek as thou the trojan cause to whom the laughter-loving venus thus daughter of saturn juno mighty queen tell me thy wish to grant it if my power may aught avail thy pleasure shall be done to whom great juno thus with artful speech give me the loveliness and power to charm whereby thou reign'st o'er gods and men supreme for to the bounteous earth's extremest bounds i go to visit old oceanus the sire of gods and tethys who of yore from rhea took me when all-seeing jove hurled saturn down below the earth and seas and nursed me in their home with tenderest care i go to visit them and reconcile a lengthened feud for since some cause of wrath has come between them they from rites of love and from the marriage bed have long abstained could i unite them by persuasive words and to their former intercourse restore their love and reverence were for ever mine whom answered thus the laughter-loving queen i ought not and i cannot say thee nay who liest encircled by the arms of jove thus venus spoke and from her bosom loosed the broidered cestus wrought with every charm to win the heart there love there young desire there fond discourse and there persuasion dwelt which oft enthralls the mind of wisest men this in her hand she placed as thus she spoke take thou from me and in thy bosom hide this broidered cestus and whate'er thy wish thou shalt not hear ungratified return thus venus smiled the stag-eyed queen of heaven 
and smiling in her bosom hid the gift. Then Venus to her father's house returned, but Juno down from high Olympus sped, o'er sweet Amathia and Pyria's range, o'er snowy mountains of horse-breeding Thrace, their topmost heights she soared, nor touched the earth. From Athos then she crossed the swelling sea, until to Lemnos, godlike Tossus seat, she came. There met she sleep, twin born with death, whom, as his hand she clasped, she thus addressed. Sleep! Universal King of Gods and men, if ever thou hast listened to my voice, grant me the boon which now I ask, and win my ceaseless favour in all time to come. When Jove thou seest in my embraces locked, do thou his piercing eyes in slumber seal. Rich guerdon shall be thine, a gorgeous throne, immortal, golden, which my skilful son Vulcan shall deftly frame, beneath a stool whereon at feasts thy feet may softly rest. Whom answered thus the gentle god of sleep? Daughter of Saturn, Juno, mighty queen, on any other of the immortal gods I can with ease exert my slumberous power. Even to the stream of old Oceanus, prime origin of all, but Saturn's son, imperial Jove, I dare not so approach, nor sink in sleep, save by his own desire. Already once, obeying thy command, a fearful warning I received, that day when from the capture and the sack of Troy, that mighty warrior, son of Jove, set sail, for circumfused around, with sweet constraint, I bound the sense of aegis-bearing Jove, while thou, with ill design, rousing the force of winds, tempestuous o'er the stormy sea, didst cast him forth on Coas's thriving isle, far from his friends. Then Jove, awaking, poured his wrath, promiscuous, on the assembled gods. Me chief his anger sought, and from on high had hurled me, plunged beneath the unfathomed sea. But night, the vanquisher of gods and men, her fugitive received me he his wrath repressed unwilling to invade the claims of holy night and now thou fain wouldst urge that i another reckless deed assay whom answered thus the stag-eyed queen of heaven why sleep with thoughts like these perplex thy mind. Think'st thou that Jove as ardently desires to aid the men of Troy, as fiercely burned his anger on his valiant son's behalf? Grant my request, and of the graces one, the youngest and the fairest, have to wife, Pasithea, whom thy love hath long pursued. Thus promised Juno. Sleep, rejoicing, heard, and answered thus, Swear, then, the awful oath, inviolable, by the stream of Styx, thy one hand laid upon the fruitful earth, the other resting on the sparkling sea, that all the gods who in the nether realms with Saturn dwell, May of our solemn bond be witnesses that of the graces one, the youngest, fairest, I shall have to wife, Pasithea, 
whom my love hath long pursued. He said, nor did the white-armed queen refuse. She took the oath required, and called by name on all the titans sub Tatarian gods. Then, sworn and ratified the oath, they passed from Lemnos and from Embrus, veiled in cloud, skimming their airy way. On Lectum first, in spring abouting Ida, nurse of beasts, the sea they left, and journeyed o'er the land, where waved beneath their feet the lofty woods. There sleep, ere yet he met the eye of Jove, remained, and, mounted on a lofty pine, the tallest growth of Ida, that on high flung through the desert air its boughs to heaven, amid the pine's close branches lay ensconced, like to a mountain bird of shrillest note, whom gods the Calchas men the night-hawk call. Juno, meanwhile, to Ida's summit sped, to Gargarus, the cloud-compeller saw. He saw, and sudden passion fired his soul, as when their parents' eyes, eluding first, they tasted of the secret joys of love. He rose to meet her, and addressed her thus. From high Olympus, Juno, whither bound, and how, to Ida hast thou come in haste? For horses here, nor chariot hast thou none. To whom thus Juno with deceitful speech replied, To fertile earth's extremest bounds I go, to visit old Oceanus, the sire of gods, and Tethys, who of yore received and nurtured me with tenderest care. I go to visit them, and reconcile a lengthened feud, for since some cause of wrath has come between them, they from rites of love and from the marriage-bed have long abstained, Meanwhile, at spring abouting Ida's foot, my horses wait me, that o'er the land and sea alike my chariot bear. On thine account, from high Olympus hither, have I come, lest it displease thee, if to thee unknown I sought the ocean's deeply flowing stream. To whom the cloud compeller thus replied, Juno, thy visit yet a while defer, and let us now in love's delights indulge, for never yet did such a flood of love for goddess or for mortal fill my soul, not for Ixion's beauteous wife who bore Pyrithous, sage in council as the gods, nor the neat-footed maiden Danae, Acrisius's daughter, her who Perseus bore, the observed of all, nor noble Phoenix's child, who bore me Minos, and the godlike might of Radimanthus, nor for Semele, nor for Alcmena fair, of whom was born in Thebes the mighty warrior Hercules, as Bacchus, joy of men of Semele. No, nor for Ceres, golden tressed queen, nor for Latona, bright, nor for thyself, as now with fond desire for thee I burn. To whom thus Juno, with deceitful speech. What words, dread son of Saturn, dost thou speak? If here, on Ida, in the face of day, 
we celebrate the mystic rites of love. How, if some other of the immortal gods should find us sleeping, and mid all the gods should spread the tale abroad, I could not then straight to thy house, or very shame, return. But if indeed such passion fill thy soul, thou hast thy secret chamber, built for thee by Vulcan, with close-fitting doors secured. Thither, if such thy pleasure, go we now. To whom the cloud-compeller thus replied, Juno, nor fear the eye of God or man, for all around us I will throw such veil of golden cloud, that not the sun himself with sharpest beam of light may pierce it through. Thus saying, in his arms he clasped his wife. The teeming earth beneath them caused to spring the tender grass, and lotus dew besprent, crocus and hyacinth, a fragrant couch profused and soft, upspringing from the earth. There lay they, all around them spread a veil of golden cloud, whence heavenly dews distilled. There, on the topmost height of Gargarus, by sleep and love subdued, the immortal sire, clasped in his arms his wife, reposed in peace. Then sleep arose, and to the Grecian ships, in haste repairing, to the earth-shaking king his tidings bore, and standing at his side, Thus to the god his winged words addressed. Now, Neptune, to the Greeks thy ready aid afford, That short-lived triumph they may gain, While slumber holds the eyes of Jove. For I, in sweet unconsciousness, Have drowned his sense, beguiled by Juno, in whose arms he lies. He said, and vanished mid the tribes of men, but fired with keener zeal to aid the Greeks, Neptune sprang forth in front and called aloud, Again, ye Greeks, shall our remissness yield the victory to Hector? Priam's son, to seize our ships, and endless glory gain? Such is his boast and menace, since in wrath Achilles still beside his ships remains. Yet him we scarce should miss, if we, the rest, but firmly stood for mutual defence. Hear then my counsel, let us all agree, Girt with our best and broadest shields, our heads with flashing helmets guarded, in our hands, grasping our longest spears, to dare the fight. Myself will lead you on, and Priam's son, though bold he be, with fear with me to cope, and if among our bravest any bear too small a buckler, with some meaner man let him exchange, and don the larger shield. He said, and they assenting heard his speech. The kings themselves, Ulysses, Diomed, and mighty Agamemnon, Atreus's son, though sorely wounded, yet the troops arrayed. Throughout the ranks they passed, and changed the arms, the bravest donned the best, the worse, the worst, when, with their dazzling armor all were girt, forward they moved. The earth-shaker led them on. 
In his broad hand an awful sword he bore, Long-bladed, vivid as the lightning's flash. Yet in the deadly strife he might not join, But kindled terror in the minds of men. Hector, meantime, the Trojan troops arrayed. Then fiercer grew and more intense the strain of furious fight, when Ocean's dark-haired king and Priam's noble son were met in arms and aided, this the Trojans, that the Greeks. High toward the tents uprose the surging sea, as with loud clamour met the opposing hosts. Less loud the roar of ocean's wave, that driven by stormy Boreas, breaks upon the beach. Less loud the crackling of the flames that rage in the deep forest of some mountain glen. Less loud the wind, to wildest fury roused, howls in the branches of the lofty oaks, then rose the cry of Trojans and of Greeks, as each with furious shout encountered each. At Ajax first, who straight before him stood, great Hector threw his spear, nor missed his aim, where the two belts, the one which bore his shield, his silver-studded sword the other, met across his breast, these two his life preserved. Hector was wroth that from his stalwart hand the spear had flown in vain, and back he sprang for safety to his comrades' sheltering ranks. But mighty Ajax Telamon upheaved a ponderous stone of many all around that scattered lay beneath the warrior's feet and served to prop the ships. With one of these, as Hector backward stepped, above the shield he smote him on the breast, below the throat, with whirling motion, circling as it flew the mass he hurled, as by the bolt of heaven uprooted prostrate lies some forest oak, the sulphurous vapour taints the air, appalled, Bereft of strength, the near beholder stands, and, awe-struck, hears the thunder-peal of Jove. So in the dust the might of Hector lay. Dropped from his hand the spear, the shield and helm fell with him. Loud his polished armor rang. On rushed, with joyous shout, the sons of Greece, in hope to seize the spoil. Thick flew the spears, yet none might reach or wound the fallen chief. For gathered close around the bravest all, valiant Aeneas and Polydamus, godlike Agenor, and the Lycian chief Sarpedon, and the noble Glaucus stood. Nor did the rest not aid, their shields broad orbs before him still they held, while in their arms his comrades bore him from the battlefield, to where, with charioteer and well-wrought car, beyond the fight his flying coursers stood, which bore him deeply groaning toward the town. But when the ford was reached of Xanthus's stream, broad-flowing, eddying, by immortal Jove begotten, on the ground they laid him down, and dashed the cooling water on his brow. Revived, he lifted up a while his eyes, then on his knees, half rising, he disgorged the clotted blood, but backward to the earth, still by the blow subdued, again he fell and darkling shades of night his eyes o'erspread. Onward with zeal redoubled pressed the Greeks, when Hector from the fields they saw withdrawn. 
for most of all Oileus's active son with sudden spring assailing Satnius slew. Him a fair naiad nymph to Enops bore, who by the banks of Satnius kept his herds. Him then approaching near, Oileus's son thrust through the flank. He fell, and o'er his corpse Trojans and Greeks in stubborn fight engaged. But Banthus's son, a swift avenger, came, Polydamus, with brandished spear, and struck through the right shoulder Prothoenor, son of Ariolycus. Right through was driven the sturdy spear. He, rolling in the dust, clutched with his palms the ground. Then, shouting loud, thus with triumphant boast, Polygamus. From the strong hand of Panthuus's noble son, Methinks that not in vain the spear has flown. A Greek now bears it off, and he, perchance, may use it as a staff to Pluto's realm. Thus he, the Greeks with pain, his vaunting heard. But chief it roused the spirit within the breast of Ajax Telamon, whom close beside the dead had fallen. He at Polydamus, retreating, hurled in haste his glittering spear, but springing sideways, scaped the stroke of fate. But young Archilochus, Antenor's son, received the spear, for heaven had willed his death. The spine it struck, the topmost joint, where met the head and neck, and both the tendons broke. Forward he fell, and ere, or knee, or leg, his head and mouth and nostrils struck the ground. Then Ajax, in his turn, exulting, thus, Say now, Polydamus, and tell me true, may this be deemed for Prothoenor's death a full equivalent? No common man he seems, and born of no ignoble race, valiant Antenor's brother, or perchance his son. The likeness speaks him near akin. Thus he, though well he knew. Then bitter grief possessed the Trojans' souls. But Acamas, guarding his brother's body, with his spear slew the Boeotian Procamus, who fain would by the feet have drawn away the dead. Then Acamas, exulting, cried aloud, Ye wretched Greeks, in boasting measureless, not ours alone the labor and the loss of battle, ye too have your share of death. Behold where lies your Procamus, subdued beneath my spear, not long unpaid the debt due for my brother's blood. Tis well for him who leaves a brother to avenge his fate. Thus he. The Greeks with pain his vaunting heard, but chief it roused the spirit within the breast of Peneleus. On Acamas he sprang, who waited not the encounter. Next he slew Ileaneus, the son of Phorbus, lord of numerous flocks, of all the Trojans most beloved of Hermes, who his wealth increased. To him Ileaneus, an only son, his mother bore, who now beneath the brow and through the socket of the eye was struck, thrusting the eyeball out, for through the eye and backward through the head 
the spear was driven. With hands extended, down to earth he sank. But Peneleus, his weighty sword, let fall full on his neck. The severed head and helm together fell, remaining still infixed the sturdy spear. Then he, the gory head, uplifting to the Trojans vaunting, cried, Go now, ye Trojans, bid that in the house of brave Ileneus his parents raise the voice of wailing for their gallant son, as neither shall the wife of Procamus, the son of Elegenor, with glad smile her husband's coming hail, when home from Troy we, sons of Greece, with victory crowned, return. Thus, as he spoke, pale fear possessed them all, each looking round to seek escape from death. Say now, ye nine, who on Olympus dwell, who, when the earth-shaker turned the tide of war, first bore away his foemen's bloody spoils. Great Ajax Telamon first Hirtius smote, the son of Curtius, who to battle led the warlike Mycians. Next Antilochus, from Mermerus and Falces, stripped their arms. Oriones, Hippotian gave to death, and Morris. Teucer, Periphetes slew, and Prothoon. Menelaus through the flank smote Hipparinor, as the grinding spear drained all his vitals. Through the gaping wound his spirit escaped, and darkness closed his eyes. But chiefest slaughter of the Trojans wrought Oileus's active son. Of all the Greeks no foot so swift as his, when Jove had filled their souls with fear to chase the flying foe. End of Book 14Book 15, Part 1 of The Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. Argument The Fifth Battle at the Ships and the Acts of Ajax. Jupiter, awaking, sees the Trojans repulsed from the trenches, Hector in a swoon, and Neptune at the head of the Greeks. He is highly incensed at the artifice of Juno, who appeases him by her submissions. She is then sent to Iris and Apollo. Juno repairing to the assembly of the gods, attempts with extraordinary address to incense them against Jupiter. In particular, she touches Mars with a violent resentment. He is ready to take arms, but is prevented by Minerva. Iris and Apollo obey the orders of Jupiter, Iris commands Neptune to leave the battle, to which, after much reluctance and passion, he consents. Apollo re-inspires Hector with vigor, brings him back to the battle, marches before him with his aegis, and turns the fortune of the fight. He breaks down the first part of the Grecian wall. The Trojans rush in and attempt to fire the first line of the fleet, but are yet repelled by the greater Ajax with a prodigious slaughter. 
Now when the Trojans had recrossed the trench and palisades, and in their headlong flight many had fallen by Grecian swords, the rest, routed and pale with fear, made head a while beside their cars. Then Jove on Ida's height at golden-throned Juno's side awoke. Rising, he saw the Trojans and the Greeks, those in confusion, while behind them pressed the Greeks, triumphant, Neptune in their midst. He saw, too, Hector stretched upon the plain, his comrades standing round. Senseless he lay, drawing short breath, blood gushing from his mouth, for by no feeble hand the blow was dealt. Pitying, the sire of gods and men beheld, and thus with sternest glance to Juno spoke. This, Juno, is thy work. Thy wicked wiles have Hector quelled, and Trojans driven to flight. Nor know I but thyself mayst reap the fruit by shameful scourging of thy vile deceit. Hast thou forgotten how in former times I hung thee from on high, and to thy feet attached two ponderous anvils, and thy hands with golden fetters bound, which none might break? There didst thou hang amid the clouds of heaven. Through all Olympus's breadth the gods were wroth, yet dared not one approach to set thee free. If any so had ventured, him had I hurled from heaven's threshold, till to earth he fell with little left of life. Yet was not quenched my wrath on godlike Hercules' account, whom thou, with Boreas, o'er the watery waste, with fell intent, didst send, and tempest-tossed, cast him ashore on Coas' fruitful isle. I rescued him from thence, and brought him back, after long toil, to Argos' grassy plains. This to thy mind I bring, that thou mayst learn to cease thy treacherous wiles, nor hope to gain by all thy lavished blandishments of love, wherewith thou hast deceived me and betrayed. He said, and terror seized the stag-eyed queen, who thus with winged words addressed her lord. By earth, I swear, and yon broad heaven above, and Stygian stream beneath, the weightiest oath of solemn power to bind the blessed gods. By thine own sacred head, our nuptial bed, whose holy tie I never could forswear, that not by my suggestion and advice, earth-shaking Neptune on the Trojan host, and Hector pours his wrath and aids the Greeks. In this he but obeys his own desire, who looks with pity on the Grecian host, besides their ships sore born. And could my words prevail, my counsel were to shape his course, O cloud-girt king, obedient to thy will. She said, The sire of gods and men, well pleased, her answer heard, and thus with gracious smile. If, stag-eyed queen, in synod of the gods, Thy counsels shall indeed with mine agree. Neptune, how strong soe'er his wish, Must change his course, 
obedient to thy will and mine and if in all sincerity thou speak go to the assembled gods and hither send iris and phoebus of the silver bow that she may to the grecian camp repair and bid that neptune from the battlefield withdraw and to his own domain retire while phoebus hector to the fight restores inspiring new-born vigor and allaying the mortal pains which bow his spirit down then heartless fear infusing in the greeks put them to flight that flying they may fall beside achilles ships his comrade then patroclus he shall send to battle forth to be by hector slain in front of troy yet not to fall till many valiant youths have felt his prowess and amid the rest my son sarpedon by his comrade's death enraged achilles hector shall subdue thenceforth my counsel is that from the ships the trojan force shall still be backward driven until at length by pallas's deep designs the greeks possess the lofty walls of troy yet will not i my anger intermit nor suffer of the immortal gods to aid the greeks till peleus's son behold his wish accomplished and the boon obtained i promised once and with a nod confirmed that day when sea-born thetis clasped my knees and prayed me to avenge her warrior son thus he the white-armed queen of heaven submiss his mandate heard and from the idaean mount with rapid flight to high olympus sped swift as the mind of man who many a land hath travelled o'er and with reflective thought recalls here was i such a day or here and in a moment many a scene surveys so juno sped o'er intervening space olympus's heights she reached and in the house of jove appeared amid the assembled gods they at her coming rose with golden cups greeting their queen's approach the rest she passed and from the hand of fair-faced themis took the proffered cup who first had run to meet and thus with winged words addressed the queen juno why comest thou hither and with looks of one distraught with fear hath saturn's son thy mighty lord thus sore affrighted thee to whom the white-armed goddess juno thus forbear thy questions themis well thou know'st how haughty and imperious is his mind thou for the gods in haste prepare the feast then shalt thou learn amid the immortals all what evil he designs nor all i ween his counsels will approve or men or gods though now in blissful ignorance they feast she said and sat the gods oppressed with care her farther speech awaited on her lips there dwelt indeed a smile 
but not a ray passed o'er her darkening brow as thus her wrath amid the assembled gods found vent in words fools are we all who madly strive with jove or hope by access to his throne to sway by word or deed his course from all apart he all our counsels heeds not but derides and boasts o'er all the immortal gods to reign in unapproached pre-eminence of power prepare then each his several woe to bear on mars e'en now methinks the blow hath fallen since in the fight the man he loves the best and boasts his son Ascalaphus is slain. She said, and Mars, enraged, his brawny thigh smote with his hands, and thus lamenting spoke. Blame not, ye gods, who on Olympus dwell, that to the Grecian ships I haste to avenge my slaughtered son. Though blasted by heaven's fire, twere mine, mid corpses, blood, and dust, to lie. He said, and gave command to fear and flight, to yoke his car, and donned his glittering arms. Then from the throne of Jove had heavier wrath, and deeper vengeance on the immortals fallen. But Pallas, in alarm for all the gods, quitting in haste the throne whereon she sat, sprang past the vestibule, and from his head the helmet lifted, from his arm the shield, took from his sturdy hand, and reared upright the brazen spear. Then, with reproachful words, she thus assailed the impetuous god of war. Frantic and passion-maddened, thou art lost. Hast thou no ears to hear? Or are thy mind and sense of reverence utterly destroyed? Or heardst thou not what white-armed Juno spoke, fresh from the presence of Olympian Jove? Wouldst thou thine evil destiny fulfilled? by hard constraint, despite thy grief, be driven back to Olympus, and to all the rest, confusion and disaster with thee bring? At once, from valiant Trojans and from Greeks, his thoughts would be diverted, and his wrath embroil Olympus, and on all alike, guilty or not, his anger would be poured. Wave then thy vengeance for thy gallant son. Others, as brave of heart, as strong of arm, have fallen, and yet must fall. And vain the attempt to watch at once o'er all the race of men. Thus saying, to his seat again she forced the impetuous Mars. Meanwhile, without the house, Juno, by Jove's command, Apollo called, and Iris, messenger from god to god, and thus to both her winged words addressed. Jove bids you with all speed to Ida haste, and when arrived, before his face ye stand. Whate'er he orders, that observe and do. Thus Juno spoke, and to her throne returned, while they, to spring abounding Ida's heights, 
while to nurse of forest beasts, pursued their way. The all-seeing son of Saturn there they found upon the topmost crag of Gargarus, an incense-breathing cloud around him spread. Before the face of cloud-compelling Jove they stood. Well pleased he witnessed their approach, in swift obedience to his consort's words, and thus to Iris first his speech addressed. Haste thee, swift Iris, and to Ocean's king my message bear, nor misreporting aught, nor aught omitting. From the battlefield bid him retire, and join the assembled gods, or to his own domain of sea withdraw. If my commands he heed not, nor obey, let him consider in his inmost soul, if mighty though he be, he dare await my hostile coming, mightier far than him his elder born, nor may his spirit aspire to rival me, whom all regard with awe. He said, Swift-footed Iris, at the word, from Ida's heights to sacred Ilium sped. Swift as the snowflakes from the clouds descend, or wintry hail before the driving blast of Boreas, ether-born, so swift to earth descended Iris. By his side she stood and with these words the earth-shaking god addressed. A message, dark-haired circler of the earth, to thee I bring from aegis-bearing Jove. He bids thee straightway from the battlefield retire, and either join the assembled gods, or to thine own domain of sea withdraw. If his commands thou heed not, nor obey, Hither he menaces himself to come and fight against thee. But he warns thee first, beware his arm, As mightier far than thee, thine elder-born, Nor may thy spirit aspire to rival him, Whom all regard with awe. To whom in towering wrath the earth-shaking god. By heaven, though great he be, he yet presumes, Somewhat too far, if me, his equal born, He seeks by force to baffle of my will. We were three brethren, all of Rhea born to Saturn, Jove, and I, and Pluto third, who o'er the nether regions holds his sway. Threefold was our partition, each obtained his meed of honour due, the hoary sea, by lot, my habitation was assigned, the realms of darkness fell to Pluto's share, broad heaven, amidst the sky and clouds, to Jove, but earth and high Olympus are to all a common heritage. Nor will I walk to please the will of Jove, though great he be. With his own third contented let him rest, nor let him think that I, as wholly vile, shall quail before his arm. His lofty words were better to his daughters and his sons, Addressed his own begotten, Who perforce must listen to his mandates and obey. To whom swift-footed Iris thus replied, Is this, then, dark-haired circler of the earth, 
the message, stern and haughty, which to Jove thou bidst me bear? Perchance thine angry mood may bend to better counsels. Noblest minds are easiest bent. And o'er superior age thou know'st the avenging furies ever watch. To whom earth-shaking Neptune thus replied, Immortal Iris, weighty are thy words, And in good season spoken, And tis well when envoys are by sound discretion led. Yet are my heart and mind with grief oppressed, When me, his equal, both by birth and fate, He seeks with haughty words to overbear, I yield, but with indignant sense of wrong. This too I say, nor shall my threat be vain. Let him remember, if in my despite, Gainst Pallas's, Juno's, Hermes, Vulcan's will, He spare to overthrow proud Ilium's towers, and crown with victory the Grecian arms, the feud between us never can be healed. The earth-shaker said, and from the field withdrew beneath the ocean wave, the warrior Greeks his loss deploring. To Apollo, then, the cloud-compeller thus with speech addressed. Go straight to Hector of the brazen helm, good Phoebus, for beneath the ocean wave the earth-shaker hath withdrawn, escaping thus my high displeasure. Had he dared resist, the tumult of our strife had reached the gods who in the nether realms with Saturn dwell. Yet thus tis better, both for me and him, that, though indignant, to my will he yields, for to compel him were no easy task. Take thou, and wave on high thy tasselled shield, the Grecian warriors daunting. Thou thyself, far-darting king, thy special care bestow on noble Hector. So restore his strength and vigor, that in panic to their ships and the broad Hellespont the Greeks be driven. Then will I so by word and deed contrive that they may gain fresh respite from their toil. He said, nor did Apollo not obey his sire's commands. From Ida's heights he flew, like to a falcon swooping on a dove, swiftest of birds. Then Priam's son he found, the godlike Hector, stretched at length no more, but sitting, now to consciousness restored, with recognition looking on his friends. The cold sweat dried, nor gasping now for breath, since by the will of aegis-bearing Jove to life new wakened. Close beside him stood the far destroyer, and addressed him thus. Hector, thou son of Priam, why apart from all thy comrades art thou sitting here, feeble and faint? What trouble weighs thee down? To whom thus Hector of the glancing helm, with faltering voice, Who art thou, prince of gods, who thus inquirest of me? Knowest thou not how a huge stone by mighty Ajax hurled 
as on his comrades by the Grecian ships I dealt destruction, struck me on the breast, dashed to the earth, and all my vigor quelled. I deemed, in sooth, this day my soul, expired, should see the dead, and Pluto's shadowy realm. To whom again the far-destroying king, Be of good cheer, from Saturn's son I come, from Ida's height, to be thy guide and guard, Phoebus Apollo, of the golden sword, I, who of old have thy protector been, Thee and thy city guarding. Rise then straight, summon thy numerous horsemen, Bid them drive their flying cars to assail the Grecian ships, I go before, and will thy horse's way make plain and smooth, and daunt the warrior Greeks. His words fresh vigor in the chief infused, as some proud steed at well-filled manger fed, his halter broken, neighing, scours the plain, and revels in the widely flowing stream to bathe his sides, then tossing high his head, while o'er his shoulders streams his ample mane, light-borne on active limbs, in conscious pride, to the wide pastures of the mares he flies, so vigorous Hector plied his active limbs, his horsemen summoning at heaven's command, as when a rustic crowd of men and dogs have chased an antlered stag or mountain goat, that mid the crags and thick or shadowing wood hath refuge found, and baffles their pursuit, if by the tumult roused a lion stand with bristling mane before them back they turn checked in their mid-career even so the greeks who late in eager throngs were pressing on thrusting with swords and double-pointed spears when hector moving through the ranks they saw recoiled and to their feet their courage fell. To whom thus Tossus spoke, Andrymon's son, Aetolia's bravest warrior, skilled to throw the javelin, dauntless in the stubborn fight, by few surpassed in speech, when in debate, in full assembly, Grecian youths contend. He thus with prudent speech began, and said, Great is the marvel which our eyes behold, That Hector, see again, to life restored, Escaped the death we hoped him to have met, Beneath the hands of Ajax Telamon. Some god hath been his guard, and Hector saved, whose arm hath slacked the knees of many a Greek, so will he now, for not without the aid of Jove, the lord of thunder, doth he stand so boldly forth, so eager for the fight. Hear then, and all by my advice be ruled, back to the ships dismiss the general crowd, while of our army we the foremost men stand fast, and meeting him with levelled spears, hold him in check, and he, though brave, may fear to throw himself amid our serried ranks. He said, they heard, and all obeyed his words. The mighty Ajax, and Idomeneus the king, and Teucer, and Meriones, 
and Meges, bold as Mars, with all their best, their steadfast battle ranged to wait the assault of Hector and his Trojans, while behind the unwarlike many to the ships retired. The Trojan mass came on, by Hector led with haughty stride. Before him Phoebus went, his shoulders veiled in cloud. His arm sustained the awful aegis, dread to look on, hung with shaggy tassels round and dazzling bright, which Vulcan, skilful workman, gave to Jove to scatter terror mid the souls of men. This on his arm the Trojan troops he led. Firm stood the mass of Greeks. From either side shrill clamours rose, and fast from many a string the arrows flew, and many a javelin hurled by vigorous arms, some buried in the flesh of stalwart youths, and many, ere they reached their living mark, fell midway on the plain, fixed in the ground, in vain a thirst for blood. While Phoebus motionless his aegis held, thick flew the shafts, and fast the people fell on either side. But when he turned its flash full in the faces of the astonished Greeks, and shouted loud, their spirits within them quailed, their fiery courage borne in mind no more. As when two beasts of prey at dead of night, with sudden onset, scatter wide a herd of oxen, or a numerous flock of sheep, their keepers absent, so, unnerved by fear, the Greeks dispersed such panic mid their ranks that victory so might crown the Trojan arms. Apollo sent, and as the masses broke, each Trojan slew his man. By Hector's hand fell Stichius and Arcesilus, the one the leader of Boeotia's brass-clad host, the other brave Menestheus's trusted friend. Aeneas Medon slew, and Iasus, Medon, the great Uilius's bastard son, brother of Ajax. He, in Phylace, far from his native home, was driven to dwell, since one to Areopis near Akin, his sire, Uilius's wife, his hand had slain. And Iasus, the Athenian chief, was deemed the son of Sphelus, son of Bucolus. Polydamus, amid the foremost ranks, Mesistes slew, Polites, Echius, Agenor, Olenius, while from Paris's hand an arrow, mid the crowd of fugitives, shot from behind, beneath the shoulder struck, Diochus, and through his chest was driven. These, while the Trojans of their arms despoiled, through ditch and palisades, promiscuous, dashed the flying Greeks, and gained hard-pressed the wall, while loudly Hector to the Trojans called to assail the ships, and leave the bloody spoils. Whom I elsewhere, and from the ships aloof shall find, My hand shall doom him on the spot. For him no funeral pyre his kin shall light, Or male or female. But before the wall our city's dogs His mangled flesh shall tear. He said, and on his horse's shoulder-point let fall the lash, and loudly through the ranks called on the Trojans, 
They, with answering shout and noise unspeakable, urged on with him their harnessed steeds. Apollo, in the van, trod down with ease the embankment of the ditch, and filled it in, and o'er it bridged away, level and wide, far as a javelin's flight, hurled by an arm that proves its utmost strength. O'er this their columns passed. Apollo bore his aegis o'er them, and cast down the wall. Easy, as when a child upon the beach in wanton play, with hands and feet o'erthrows the mound of sand, which late in play he raised, so Phoebus, thou, the Grecian toil and pains confounding, sentest panic through their souls. Thus hemmed beside the ships, they made their stand, while each exhorted each, and all, with hands outstretched, to every god addressed their prayer and chief gerenian nestor prop of greece with hands uplifted toward the starry heaven o father jove if any heir to thee on cord-clad plains of argos burned the fat of bulls and sheep, and offered up his prayer for safe return and thine assenting nod confirmed thy promise. All remember now his prayer. Stave off the pitiless day of doom, nor let the Greeks to Trojan arms succumb. Thus Nestor prayed. Loud thundered from on high the Lord of Council, as he heard the prayer of Neleus' aged son. With double zeal the Trojans, as the mind of Jove they knew, pressed on the Greeks with warlike ardor fired. As o'er the bulwarks of a ship poured down the mighty billows of the wide-pathed sea, driven by the blast that tosses high the waves, so down the wall with shouts the trojans poured the cars admitted by the ships they fought with double pointed spears and hand to hand these on their chariots on the lofty decks of their dark vessels those with ponderous spars which on the ship were stored for naval war compact and strong their heads encased in brass. While yet beyond the ships, about the wall, the Greeks and Trojans fought, Patroclus, still within the tent of brave Eurypolis, remaining, with his converse soothed the chief, and healing unguents to his wound applied, of power to charm away the bitter pains. But when the Trojans, pouring o'er the wall, and routed Greeks, in panic flight he saw, deeply he groaned, and smiting on his thigh with either palm, in anguish thus he spoke. Eurypolis, how great soe'er thy need, I can no longer stay, so fierce the storm of battle rages, but the attendants care will all thy wants supply, while I, in haste, Achilles seek, and urge him to the war. Who knows, but heaven may grant me to succeed, for great is oft a friend's persuasive power. He said, and quickly on his errand sped. End of Book 15, Part 1
of the Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. Meanwhile, the Greeks in firm array endured the onset of the Trojans, nor could these the assailants, though in numbers less, repel, nor those again the Grecian masses break and force their passage through the ships and tents, as by a rule in cunning workman's hand, who all his art by Pallas's aid has learnt. A vessel's plank is smooth and even laid, so level lay the balance of the fight. Others round other ships maintained the war, but Hector that of Ajax sought alone. For that one ship they too unwearied toiled, nor Hector Ajax from his post could move, and burn the ship with fire, nor he repel the foe who came protected by a god. Then noble Ajax with his javelin smote Caletor, son of Clytius, through the breast, as toward the ship a blazing torch he bore. Thundering he fell, and dropped his hand the torch. But Hector, when his eyes his kinsmen saw by the dark vessel, prostrate in the dust, on Trojans and on Lycians called aloud, Trojans and Lycians, and ye Dardans famed in close encounter. In this press of war, slack not your efforts. Haste to save the son of Clytius, nor let Greeks his arms possess, who, mid their throng of ships, has nobly fallen. At Ajax, as he spoke, his gleaming spear he threw, but missed his aim. Yet, like Cophron, his comrade of Cythera, Mastor's son, who, flying from Cythera's lovely isle, with guilt of bloodshed, near to Ajax dwelt, standing beside the chief, above the ear he struck, and pierced the brain, from the tall prow, backwards he fell, his limbs relaxed in death. Then Ajax, shuddering, on his brother called. Good too, sir, we have lost a faithful friend, the son of Mastor, our Cytheran guest, whom as a father all revered, who now lies slain by noble Hector. Where are then thine arrows, swift-winged messengers of fate? And where thy trusty bow, Apollo's gift? Thus Ajax Teucer heard, and ran in haste, and stood beside him with his bended bow and well-stored quiver. On the Trojans fast he poured his shafts, and struck Pisenor's son, Clytus, the comrade of Polydamus, the noble son of Panthous. He the reins held in his hand, and all his care bestowed to guide his horses, for where'er the throng was thickest, there in Hector's cause and Troy's he still was found. But o'er him hung the doom which none might turn aside. For from behind the fateful arrow struck him through the neck. Down from the car he fell. Swerving aside, the startled horses whirled the empty car. Them first the king Polydamus beheld, and stayed their course. To Protean's son, Astinous, then he gave them, with command to keep good watch, and still be near at hand. Then mid the foremost joined again the fray. 
again at Hector of the brazen helm, an arrow Teucer aimed, and had the shaft the life of Hector quenched in mid-career. Not long the fight had raged around the ships. But Jove's all-seeing eye beheld, who watched o'er Hector's life, and Teucer's hopes deceived. The bow's well-twisted string he snapped in twain, as Teucer drew. The brass-tipped arrow flew wide of the mark, and dropped his hand the bow. Then to his brother, all aghast, he cried, O oh, heaven, some god our best-laid schemes of war confounds, who from my hand hath wrenched the bow, and snapped the newly twisted string, which I but late attached, my swift-winged shafts to bear. Whom answered thus great Ajax Telamon, O oh, friend, Leave there thine arrows and thy bow, Marred by some god who grudges our renown. But take in hand thy ponderous spear, And cast thy shield about thy shoulders, And thyself stand forth, And urge the rest to face the foe. Let us not tamely yield, If yield we must, our well-built ships, but nobly dare the fight. Thus Ajax spoke, and Teucer in the tent bestowed his bow, and o'er his shoulders threw his fourfold shield, and on his firm-set head a helm he placed, well wrought with horsehair plume that nodded fearful o'er his brow. His hand grasped the firm spear, with sharpened point of brass, then ran and swiftly stood by Ajax's side. Hector, meanwhile, who saw the weapon marred, to Trojans and to Lycians called aloud, Trojans and Lycians, and ye Dardans famed in close encounter, quit ye now like men, Against the ships your wonted valour show. E'en now before our eyes hath Jove destroyed a chieftain's weapon. Easy tis to trace o'er human wars the o'erruling hand of Jove, To whom he gives the prize of victory, And whom, withholding aid, he minishes, as now the Greeks, While we his favour gain, Pour then your force united on the ships, And if there be among you who this day shall meet his doom, By sword or arrow slain, e'en let him die. A glorious death is his who for his country falls, And, dying, leaves preserved from danger, Children, wife, and home, his heritage uninjured. When the Greeks, embarking, hence shall take their homeward way. His words fresh courage roused in every breast. Ajax, on the other side, addressed the Greeks. Shame on ye, Greeks! This very hour decides if we must perish or be saved and ward destruction from our ships. And can ye hope that each, if Hector of the glancing helm, shall burn our ships, on foot can reach his home? Or hear ye not how, burning to destroy our vessels, Hector cheers his forces on? Not to the dance, but to the fight he calls, nor better counsel can for us be found than in close fight with heart and hand to join. Twere better far at once to die than live hemmed in and straitened thus in dire distress close to our ships by meaner men beset. 
His words fresh courage roused in every breast. Then Hector Scedius, Perimedes' son, the Thracian leader, slew. On the other side, Ajax, the captain of the foot, o'ercame Laodimus, Antenor's noble son, while of his arms Polydamus despoiled Selenian Otus, friend of Phileus's son, the proud Epeans' leader. Meges saw and rushed upon him, but Polydamus, stooping, the blow evaded. Him he missed, for Phoebus willed not Panthous' son should fall in the front rank contending. But the spear smote Crismus through the breast, thundering he fell, and from his corpse the victor stripped his arms. Him Dolops, son of Lampus, spearman skilled, well trained in every point of war, assailed the son of Lampus, he, the prince of men, son of Laomedon. From close at hand, forward he sprang, and thrust at Meges' shield. But him, the solid corslet which he wore, with breast and back piece fitted, saved from harm. The corslet Phileus brought from Ephora, by Celis's stream. Euphetes, king of men, bestowed it as a friendly gift to wear in battle for a guard from hostile spears, which from destruction now preserved his son. Next Meges struck with keen-edged spear the crown of Dolops's brass-bound horsehair-crested helm, severing the horsehair plume, which brilliant late with crimson dye, now lay defiled in dust. Yet fought he on, and still for victory hoped. But warlike Menelaus, to the aid of Meges, came. Of Dolops, unobserved, he stood, and from behind his shoulder pierced. The point, its course pursuing, through his breast was driven, and headlong on his face he fell. Forthwith advanced the two to seize the spoils, but loudly Hector on his kinsmen called, on all but chief on Ascetian's son, the valiant Melanippus. He, erewhile in far Percote, ere the foes appeared, pastured his herds, but when the ships of Greece approached the shore, to Ilium back he came. There, mid the Trojans eminent, he dwelt in Priam's house, beloved as Priam's son. Him Hector called by name, and thus addressed, Why, Melanippus, stand we idly thus? Doth not thy slaughtered kinsmen touch thy heart? See how they rush on Dolops' arms to seize? Then on! No distant war must now be waged, but hand to hand, till o'er the Greeks be slain, or lofty Troy with all her children fall. He said, and led the way. Him followed straight the godlike chief. Great Ajax Telamon, meanwhile, the Greeks encouraged to the fight, and cried, Brave comrades, quit ye now like men. Bear a stout heart, and in the stubborn fight let each to other mutual succour give. By mutual succour more are saved than fall. In timid flight nor fame nor safety lies. He said, and pondering well his words, they stood firm in defence, as with a wall of brass the ships they guarded, 
though against them Jove led on the Trojans. Menelaus then with stirring words Antilochus addressed. Antilochus, then thou, of all the Greeks, is none more active, or more light of foot, none stronger hurls the spear. Then from the crowd spring forth, and aim to reach some Trojan's life. Thus saying, he withdrew. Fired by his words, forth sprang the youth, and poised his glittering spear, glancing around him. Back the Trojans drew before his aim, nor flew the spear in vain, but through the breast it pierced, as on he came, brave Melanippus, Isidian's son. Thundering he fell, and loud his armour rang. Forth sprang Antilochus, as springs a hound upon a fawn, which from its lair disturbed a hunter's shaft has struck, and quelled its powers. So Melanippus sprang to seize thy spoils, the stout Antilochus, but not unmarked of Hector's eye, who, hastening through the press, advanced to meet him. Waited not the attack, bold warrior as he was, Antilochus, but trembling, fled, as when a beast of prey, conscious of evil deed, amid the herd, the guardian dog or herdsman's self has slain, and flies, ere yet the avenging crowd collect, so fled the son of Nestor. Onward pressed, by Hector led the Trojans. Loud their shouts, as on the Greeks their murderous shafts they poured. Yet turned he, when his comrades' ranks he reached. Then on the ships, as ravening lions, fell the Trojans. They but worked the will of Jove, who still their courage raised and quelled the Greeks. Of victory these debarred, and those inspired. For so he willed that Hector, Prime's son, should wrap in fire the beaked ships of Greece, and Thetis to the uttermost obtain her overbold petition. Yet did Jove, the lord of counsel, wait, but to behold the flames ascending from the blazing ships. For from that hour the Trojans, backward driven, should to the Greeks the final triumph leave. With such design to seize the ships, he fired the already burning zeal of Priam's son. Fiercely he raged, as terrible as Mars with brandished spear, or as a raging fire mid the dense thickets on the mountain's side. The foam was on his lips, bright flashed his eyes beneath his awful brows, and terribly above his temples waved amid the fray the helm of Hector. Jove himself from heaven, his guardian hand extending him alone with glory crowning mid the host of men. But short his term of glory, for the day was fast approaching when, with Pallas's aid, the might of Peleus's son should work his doom. Oft he essayed to break the ranks, where e'er the densest and throng noblest arms he saw. But strenuous though his efforts, all were vain. They, massed in close array, his charge withstood. Firm as a craggy rock, upstanding high, 
close by the hoary sea, which meets unmoved the boisterous currents of the whistling winds, and the big waves that bellow round its base, so stood unmoved the Greeks, and undismayed. At length, all blazing in his arms, he sprang upon the mass, so plunging down, as when, on some tall vessel, from beneath the clouds, a giant billow, tempest-nursed, descends, the deck is drenched in foam, the stormy wind howls in the shrouds, the affrighted seamen quail in fear, but little way from death removed, so quailed the spirit in every Grecian breast. As when a ravening lion on a herd of heifers falls, which on some marshy mead feed numberless beneath the care of one unskilled from beasts of prey to guard his charge, and while beside the front or rear he walks, the lion on the unguarded centre springs, seizes on one, and scatters all the rest. So Hector, led by Jove, in wild alarm scattered the Grecians all. But one alone, brave Periphetes of Mycenae, slew, the son of Capreus, whom Eurystheus sent, his envoy to the might of Hercules. Far nobler than the father was the son, in speed of foot, in warlike might, in mind, in all, among Mycenaeans foremost he, who now on Hector fresh renown conferred, for backward as he stepped against the rim of the broad shield which for defence he bore down reaching to his feet he tripped and thus entangled backward fell and as he fell around his temples clattered loud his helm hector beheld and o'er him stood in haste and with his spear transfixed his breast and slew before his comrade's eyes. Yet dared not one, though grieving for their comrade's loss, advance to rescue. Such of Hector was their awe. They fronted now the ships, the leading prows, which first were drawn on shore, still barred their way. The leading prows, which first were drawn on shore, still barred their way. Yet on they streamed, and from the foremost ships, now hardly pressed, the Greeks perforce retired. But closely massed before the tents they stood, not scattered o'er the camp, by shame restrained, and fear, and loudly each exhorted each. Gerenian Nestor, chief, the prop of Greece, thus by their fathers singly each adjured. Quit ye like men, dear friends, and think it shame to forfeit now the praise of other men. Let each man now, his children and his wife, his fortunes and his parents, bear in mind, and not the living only, but the dead. For them, the absent, I, your suppliant, pray, that firm ye stand, and scorn disgraceful flight. His words fresh courage roused in every breast and from their eyeballs Pallas purged away the film of darkness. And on every side, both toward the ships and toward the level fight, clear light diffused. There Hector they discerned, and all his comrades, those who stood aloof, and those who near the ships maintained the war. Then was not Ajax's mighty soul content to stand 
where stood the other sons of Greece. Along the vessel's lofty decks he moved with haughty stride a ponderous boarding pike, well polished, and with rivets well secured, of two and twenty cubits' length, he bore, as one well skilled in feats of horsemanship, who, from a troop of horses on the plain, has parted for, and down the crowded road, while men and women all in wonder gaze, drives toward the city, and with force untired from one to other springs as on they fly o'er many a vessel's deck so ajax passed with lofty stride and voice that reached to heaven as loudly shouting on the greeks he called to save their ships and tents nor hector stayed amid the closely bucklered trojan ranks but as upon a flock of birds that feed beside a river's bank, or geese, or cranes, or long-necked swans, a fiery eagle swoops, so on the dark proud ship with furious rush swept Hector down, him Jove with mighty hand sustained, and with him forward urged the crowd, Fierce round the ships again the battle raged. Well might ye deem no previous toil had worn their strength, Who in that dread encounter met. With edge so keen and stubborn will they fought. But varying far their hopes and fears, The Greeks of safety and escape from death despaired, while high the hopes in every Trojan's breast To burn the ships and slay the warlike Greeks. So minded each, opposed in arms they stood. On a swift sailing vessel's stern, That bore Protesilaus to the coast of Troy, But to his native country bore not thence, Hector had laid his hand, Around that ship, Trojans and Greeks in mutual slaughter joined. The arrows or the javelins' distant flight they waited not, but fired with equal rage, fought hand to hand, with axe and hatchet keen, and mighty swords, and double-pointed spears. Many a fair-hilted blade, with iron bound, dropped from the hands, or from the severed arms of warrior chiefs the dark earth ran with blood yet loosed not hector of the stern his hold but grasped the poop and on the trojans called bring fire and all together loud and clear your war cry raise this day Will Jove repay our labors all with capture of those ships which hither came against the will of heaven, and which on us unnumbered ills have brought by our own elders' fault, who me, desiring even at their vessels' sterns to urge the war, withheld, and to the town the troops confined. But Jove, all-seeing, if he then o'erruled our better mind, himself is now our aid. Thus he. They onward pressed with added zeal. Nor Ajax yet endured by hostile spears, now sorely galled, yet but a little space. Back to the helmsman seven-foot board he moved, expecting death, and left the lofty deck, where long he stood on guard. But still his spear the Trojans kept aloof, who e'er essayed amid the ships to launch the unwearied flames. And loudly shouting to the Greeks he called, Friends! Grecian heroes, 
ministers of Mars, quit ye like men. Dear friends, remember now your wanted valour. Think ye in your rear to find supporting forces, or some fort whose walls may give you refuge from your foe? No city is nigh, whose well-appointed towers, manned by a friendly race, may give us aid. But here, upon the well-armed Trojans' soil, and only resting on the sea, we lie far from our country, not in faint retreat, but in our own good arms our safety lies. He said, and with his sharp-edged spear, his words he followed up. If any Trojan dared, by Hector's call, inspired, with fiery brand to assail the ships, him with his ponderous spear would Ajax meet. And thus before the ships, twelve warriors, hand to hand, his prowess felt. End of Book 15, Part 2Book 16, Part 1 of The Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. Argument The Sixth Battle The Acts and Death of Patroclus. Patroclus, in pursuance of the request of Nestor in the eleventh book, entreats Achilles to suffer him to go to the assistance of the Greeks with Achilles's troops and armor. He agrees to it, but at the same time charges him to content himself with rescuing the fleet without farther pursuit of the enemy. The armor Horses, soldiers, and officers of Achilles are described. Achilles offers a libation for the success of his friend, after which Patroclus leads the Myrmidons to battle. The Trojans, at the sight of Patroclus in Achilles' armor, taking him for that hero, are cast into the utmost consternation. He beats them off from the vessels. Hector himself flies, Sarpedon is killed, though Jupiter was averse to his fate. Several other particulars of the battle are described, in the heat of which Patroclus, neglecting the orders of Achilles, pursues the foe to the walls of Troy, where Apollo repulses and disarms him, Euphorbus wounds him, and Hector kills him. Which concludes the book. Thus, round the well-manned ship, they waged the war. Meanwhile, by Peleus's son, Patroclus stood, weeping hot tears, as some dark-watered fount pours o'er a craggy rock its gloomy stream. Achilles, swift of foot, with pity saw, and to his friend these winged words addressed. Why weeps Patroclus, like an infant girl that prays her mother, by whose side she runs, to take her up, and clinging to her gown impedes her way, and still with tearful eyes looks in her face, until she take her up, even as that girl, Patroclus, such art thou, shedding soft tears. Hast thou some tidings brought, touching the general weal, or me alone? Or have some evil news from Thya come, known but to thee? Menetius, actor's son, yet surely lives, and mid his myrmidons lives aged Peleus, son of Iasus. 
their deaths indeed might well demand our tears or weep'st thou for the greeks who round their ships by death their former insolence repay speak out that i may know thy cause of grief to whom with bitter groans patroclus thus o son of peleus noblest of the greeks achilles be not wroth such weight of woe the grecian camp oppresses in their ships they who were late their bravest and their best sore wounded all by spear or arrow lie the valiant son of tydeus diomed pierced by a shaft ulysses by a spear and agamemnon's self eurypolis by a sharp arrow through the thigh transfixed for these the large resources of their art the leeches ply and on their wounds attend while thou achilles still remain'st unmoved oh be it never mine to nurse such hate as thou retain'st inflexibly severe who e'er may hope in future days by thee to profit if thou now forbear to save the greeks from shame and loss unfeeling man sure peleus horseman brave was ne'er thy sire nor thetis bore thee from the cold gray sea and cracky rocks thou hadst thy birth so hard and stubborn is thy soul but if the fear of evil prophesied thy self restrain or message by thy goddess mother brought from jove yet send me forth with all thy force of myrmidons to be the saving light of greece and let me to the battle bear thy glittering arms if so the men of troy scared by thy likeness may forsake the field and breathing time afford the sons of greece toil worn for little pause has yet been theirs fresh and unwearied we may drive with ease to their own city from our ships and tents the trojans worn and battle-wearied men thus prayed he all unwisely for the prayer he uttered to himself was fraught with death to whom much grieved achilles swift of foot heaven-born patroclus oh what words are these of prophecy i reck not though i know nor message hath my mother brought from jove but it afflicts my soul when one i see that basely robs his equal of his prize his lawful prize by highest valour won such grief is mine such wrong have i sustained her whom the sons of greece on me bestowed prize of my spear the well-walled city stormed the mighty agamemnon atreus' son hath borne by force away as from the hands of some dishonoured houseless vagabond but let the past be past i never meant my wrath should have no end yet had not thought my anger to abate till my own ships should hear the war-cry and the battle bear but go and in my well-known armour clad lead forth the valiant myrmidons to war since the dark cloud of trojans circles round the ships in force and on the shingly beach pent up in narrow limits lie the greeks and all the city hath poured its numbers forth in hope undoubting or they see no more my helm among them flashing else 
In flight their dead would choke the streams, If but to me great Agamemnon bore a kindly mind. But round the camp the battle now is waged, No more the hands of valiant Diomed, The Greeks protecting, hurl his fiery spear, Nor hear I now from his detested lips the shout of Agamemnon. All around is heard the warrior-slayer Hector's voice, cheering his Trojans with triumphant cries. They, from the vanquished Greeks, hold all the plain. Nathless, do thou, Patroclus, in defence, fall boldly on, lest they with blazing fire our ships destroy and hinder our retreat but hear and ponder well the end of all i have to say and so for me obtain honour and glory in the eyes of greece and that the beauteous maiden to my arms they may restore with costly gifts to boot the ships relieved return forthwith and though the thunderer juno's lord should crown thine arms with triumph be not rash apart from me in combat with the warlike sons of troy so should my name in less repute be held nor in the keen excitement of the fight and slaughter of the trojans lead thy troops on toward the city lest thou find thyself by some one of the immortal gods opposed for the far-darting phoebus loves them well but when in safety thou hast placed the ships delay not to return and leave the rest to battle on the plain for would to jove to pallas and apollo that not one or greek or trojan might escape from death save only thou and i that so we two alone might raise the sacred towers of troy such converse held they while by hostile spears hard pressed no longer ajax might endure at once by jove's high will and trojan foes o'ermastered loud beneath repeated blows clattered around his brow the glittering helm as on the well-wrought crest the weapons fell and his left arm grew faint that long had borne the burthen of his shield yet not availed the press of spears to drive him from his post laboring he drew his breath his every limb with sweat was reeking breathing space was none blow followed blow and ills were heaped on ill say now ye nine who on olympus dwell how first the fire assailed the Grecian ships. Hector approached, and on the ashen spear of Ajax, close behind the head, let fall his mighty sword. Right through he clove the wood, and in his hand the son of Telamon, the headless shaft held bootless. Far away, loud ringing fell to earth the brazen point ajax dismayed perceived the hand of heaven and knew that jove the thunderer had decreed to thwart his hopes and victory give to troy slow he retired and to the vessel they the blazing torch applied High rose the flame, unquenchable, and wrapped the poop in fire. 
the son of Peleus saw, and with his palm smote on his thigh, and to Patroclus called, Up, up, nobly born Patroclus, car-born chief, up, for I see above the ships ascend the hostile fires, and lest they seize the ships and hinder our retreat, do thou in haste thine armour don, while I arouse the troops. He said, his dazzling arms Patroclus donned. First on his legs the well-wrought greaves he fixed, fastened with silver clasps, his ample chest the breastplate of Achilles, swift of foot, star-spangled, richly wrought, defended well. Around his shoulders slung, his sword he bore, brass-bladed, silver-studded, next his shield, weighty and strong, and on his firm-set head a helm he wore, well wrought, with horsehair plume that nodded, fearful, o'er his brow. His hand grasped two stout spears, familiar to his hold. One spear Achilles had, long, ponderous, tough, but this he touched not. None of all the Greeks, none, save Achilles' self, that spear could poise. The far-famed Pelian ash, which to his sire on Pelion's summit felled, to be the bane of mightiest chiefs, the centaur Chiron gave. Then to Automedon he gave command to yoke the horses. Him he honoured most, next to Achilles' self, the trustiest he in battle to await his chief's behest. The flying steeds he harnessed to the car, Sanctus and Balius, fleeter than the winds, whom, grazing in the marsh by ocean's stream, the darge, swift of foot, to Zephyr bore, and by their side the matchless Pedasus, who from the capture of Aetian's town Achilles bore away, a mortal horse, but with immortal coursers meet to vie. Meantime, Achilles, through their several tents, summoned to arms the warlike Myrmidons. They all, like ravening wolves of courage high, that on the mountain side have hunted down an antlered stag, and battened on his flesh, their chaps all dyed with blood, in troops they go, with their lean tongues from some black-watered fount, to lap the surface of the dark cool wave, their jaws with blood yet reeking, unsubdued their courage, and their bellies gorged with flesh. So round Pelides' valiant follower thronged the chiefs and rulers of the Myrmidons. Achilles in the midst to charioteers and bucklered warriors issued his commands. Fifty swift ships Achilles, dear to Jove, led to the coast of Troy, and ranged in each. Fifty brave comrades manned the rowers' seats. O'er these five chiefs, on whom he most relied, he placed, himself the sovereign lord of all. One band Menestheus led, with glancing mail, son of Spercius, heaven-descended stream. Him, Peleus's daughter, Polydora, fair, a mortal in a god's embrace compressed, to stout Spercius bore, but, by repute, to Boras, Peraeres' son, who her, in public, and with ample dower espoused. The brave Eudorus led the second band, whom Phylus' daughter, 
Polymele fair, to Hermes bore. The maid he saw, and loved, amid the virgins, mingling in the dance of golden-shafted Diane, huntress queen. He to her chamber access found, and gained, by stealth, her bed. A valiant son she bore, Eudorus, swift of foot, in battle strong. But when her infant, by Lucina's aid, was brought to light, and saw the face of day, her to his home, with ample dower enriched, Icecles, son of Actor, bore away. With him the aged Phylus kept, and nursed with tender care, and cherished as his own. The brave Pisander, son of Mimalus, the third commanded, of the Myrmidons, next to Pelides' friend, the noblest spear. The fourth, the aged warrior Phoenix led, the fifth Alcimedon, Laerces' son. These in their order due Achilles first arrayed, and next with stirring words addressed. Ye Myrmidons, forget not now the vaunts which, while my wrath endured, ye largely poured upon the Trojans, me ye freely blamed. Ill omen son of Peleus, sure in wrath thou wast conceived implacable, who here in idleness enforced thy comrades keepst. Twere better far our homeward way to take, if such pernicious rancor fill thy soul. Thus ye reproached me oft. Lo, now ye have the great occasion which your souls desired. Then on, and with brave hearts the Trojans meet. His words fresh courage roused in every breast, and more compact beneath their monarch's eye their ranks were formed, as when the builder lays the closely fitting stones to form the wall of some great house, and brave the winds of heaven, so close were fitted helm and bossy shield, buckler on buckler pressed, and helm on helm, and man on man, the horsehair plumes above that nodded fearful from the warriors' brows, each other touched, so closely massed they stood. Before them all stood prominent in arms two chiefs, Patroclus and Automedon, both with one thought possessed to lead the fight in the forefront of all the Myrmidons. Achilles then within his tent withdrew, and of a gorgeous coffer raised the lid, well wrought, by silver-footed Thetis placed on board his ship, and filled with rich attire, with store of wind-proof cloaks and carpets soft. There lay a goblet, richly chased, whence none but he alone might drink the ready wine. Nor might libations thence to other gods be made, save only Jove. This brought he forth, and first with sulphur purified, and next washed with pure water. Then his hands he washed, and drew the ruddy wine. Then, standing forth, made in the centre of the court, his prayer, and as he poured the wine, looked up to heaven, not unbeheld of Jove, the lightning's lord. Great king! 
Dodana's lord, Pelagian Jove, who dwellst on high, and rulest with sovereign sway Dodana's wintry heights, where dwell around thy sallying priests men of unwashed feet, that on the bare ground sleep. Thou once before hast heard my prayer, and me with honour crowned, and on the Greeks inflicted all thy plagues. Hear yet again, and this my boon accord. I mid the throng of ships myself remain, but with a numerous force of Myrmidons I send my comrade in my stead to fight. On him, all-seeing Jove, thy favour pour, strengthen his heart, that Hector's self may learn, if e'en alone my follower knows to fight, or only then resistless power displays, when I myself the toil of battle share, And from our vessels, when the foe is driven, Grant that with all his arms and comrades true, He may in safety to the ships return. Thus prayed he. Jove, the lord of counsel, heard. And half his prayer he granted, half denied. For from the ships... The battle to repel he granted, but denied his safe return. His prayers and offerings ended, to the tent Achilles turned again, and in the chest replaced the cup. Then, issuing forth, he stood before the tent, for much he longed to see the Greeks and Trojans join in battle strife. They, who in arms round brave Patroclus stood, their line of battle formed, with courage high, to dash upon the Trojans, and, as wasps, that have their nest beside the public road, which boys delight to vex and irritate in wanton play, but to the general harm, them if some passing traveller unawares disturbed with angry courage forth they rush in one continuous swarm to guard the rest e'en with such courage poured the myrmidons forth from the ships then uproar wild arose and loud patroclus on his comrades called Ye valiant Myrmidons, who boast yourselves Achilles' comrades, Quit ye now, like men, your ancient valour prove, To Peleus' son, of all the Greeks the noblest, So shall we, his faithful followers, highest honour give, And Agamemnon's haughty self shall mourn, the slight on Grecia's bravest warrior cast. His words fresh courage roused in every breast. Thick on the Trojan host their masses fell, while loud the fleet re-echoed to the sound of Grecian cheers. But when the Trojans saw, blazing in arms, Menetius's godlike son, himself and follower, quailed the spirits of all. Their firm-set ranks were shaken, for they deemed Achilles had beside the ships exchanged his wrath for friendship. And each several man looked round to find his own escape from death. Then first Patroclus aimed his glittering spear amid the crowd, where thickest round the ships of brave Protesilaus raged the war, and struck Perichmes, who from Amidon 
from the wide-flowing stream of Axius, led the horsehair-crested peons. Him he struck through the right shoulder, backwards in the dust groaning he fell. Around him quailed with fear his peons all, such terror in their ranks Patroclus threw, their bravest leader slain, the foremost in the fight. The crowd he drove far from the ships, and quenched the blazing fire. There lay the half-burnt ship. With shouts confused the Trojans fled, and from amid the ships forth poured the Greeks, and loud the clamour rose. As when around a lofty mountain's top the lightning's lord dispels a mass of cloud, and every crag and every jutting peak is plainly seen, and every forest glade, and the deep vault of heaven is opened wide, so when the Greeks had cleared the ships of fire, they breathed a while. Yet ceased not so the strife, for not in headlong panic from the ships the Trojans by the valiant Greeks were driven, but though perforce retiring, still made head. Then of the chiefs, as wider spread the fight, each singled each. Manetius' noble son first threw his pointed spear, and on the thigh struck Ariolochus, in act to turn. Right through the point was driven, the weighty spear shattered the bone, and prone to earth he fell. The warlike Menelaus aimed his spear, where Tossus' breast, unguarded by his shield, was left exposed, and slacked his limbs in death. Phileus's brave son, as rushed Amphiclus on, stood firm with eye observant. Then the attack preventing, through his thigh, high up, where lie the strongest muscles, smote. The weapon's point severed the tendons, Darkness closed his eyes. Of Nestor's sons, Antilochus, the first, Atimnius wounded, driving through his flank the brazen spear. Prone on his face he fell. Then, burning to avenge his brother's death, stood Maris o'er the corpse, and hand to hand engaged Antilochus, but ere a blow was struck, the godlike Thrasymedes drove through his right shoulder with unerring aim his glittering spear. The point his upper arm tore from the muscles, shattering all the bone. Thundering he fell, and darkness closed his eyes. So to the shades by those two brethren's hands Subdued, Sarpedon's comrades brave were sent, the sons of Amisodorus, who reared the dread Chimera, bane of mortal men. On Cleobulus, wounded in the press, Ajax, Oileus, sprang, and captive took alive, but sudden on his neck let fall his hilted sword, and quenched the fire of life. The hot blood dyed the sword, the darkling shades of death and rigorous fate his eyes o'erspread. Then Pinellius and Lycan, hand to hand, engaged in combat. Both had missed their aim, and bootless hurled their weapons. Then with swords they met. First Lycon on the crested helm dealt a fierce blow, but in his hand the blade up to the hilt was shivered. Then the sword of Pinellius, his neck 
below the ear, dissevered. Deeply in his throat the blade was plunged, and by the skin alone was stayed. Down drooped his head, his limbs relaxed in death. Meriones, by speed of foot, o'ertook, and, as his car he mounted, a carness through the right shoulder pierced. Down from the car he fell, the shades of death his eyes o'erspread. Full on the mouth of Arimus was thrust the weapon of Idomeneus, right through the white bones, crashing, past the brazen spear below the brain. His teeth were shattered all, with blood, which with convulsive sobs he blew from mouth and nostril. Both his eyes were filled, and death's dark cloud encompassed him around. Thus slew the Grecian leaders each his man, as ravening wolves that lambs or kids assail, strayed from their dames, by careless shepherds left upon the mountain, scattered. These they see, and tear at once their unresisting prey. So on the Trojans fell the Greeks. In rout disastrous, they, unmanned by terror, fled. Great Ajax, still unwearied, longed to hurl his spear at Hector of the brazen helm. But he, well skilled in war, his shoulders broad, protected by his shield of tough bull's hide, watched for the whizzing shafts and javelins were. Full well he knew the tide of battle turned, yet held his ground, his trusty friends to save. As from Olympus, o'er the clear blue sky, pour the dark clouds, when Jove the vault of heaven o'erspreads with storm and tempest, from the ships so poured with panic cries the flying host, and in disordered rout recrossed the trench. Then Hector's flying coursers bore him safe far from the struggling masses, whom the ditch detained perforce. There many a royal car with broken pole the unharnessed horses left. On shouting to the Greeks, Patroclus pressed the flying Trojans. They, with panic cries dispersed, the roads encumbered. High up rose the storms of dust, as from the tents and ships Back to the city stretched the flying steeds, and ever where the densest throng appeared, with furious threats Patroclus urged his course. His glowing axle traced by prostrate men, hurled from their cars, and chariots overthrown, flew o'er the deep-sunk trench the immortal steeds, the noble prize the gods to Peleus gave, still onward straining, for he longed to reach and hurl his spear at Hector. Him, meanwhile, his flying steeds in safety bore away, as in the autumnal season, when the earth with weight of rain is saturate, when Jove pours down his fiercest storms in wrath to men, who in their courts unrighteous judgments pass, and justice yields to lawless violence, the wrath of heaven despising. Every stream is brimming o'er, the hills in gullies deep are by the torrents seamed, which, rushing down from the high mountains to the dark blue sea, with groans and tumult, urge their headlong course, wasting the works of man. So urged their flight, so 
as they fled, the Trojan horses groaned. The foremost ranks cut off, back toward the ships Patroclus drove them. The foremost ranks cut off, back toward the ships Patroclus drove them, baffling their attempts to gain the city. And in middle space between the ships, the stream, and lofty wall, dealt slaughter round him, and of many a chief the bitter penalty of death required. Then Pronous with his glittering spear he struck, where by the shield his breast was left exposed, and slacked his limbs in death. Thundering he fell. Next Thestor, son of Enops, he assailed, his mind by fear disordered. From his hands the reins had dropped. Him thrusting with the spear through the right cheek and through the teeth he smote, then dragged him by the weapon o'er the rail. As when an angler on a prominent rock drags from the sea to shore with hook and line a weighty fish, so him Patroclus dragged, gaping from off the car, and dashed him down upon his face, and life forsook his limbs. Next, Aurelius, eager for the fray, on the mid-forehead with a mighty stone he struck. Beneath the ponderous helmet's weight the skull was split in twain. Prostrate he fell, by life-consuming death encompassed round. Forthwith Amphoterus and Eremus, Epautes, Echius, and Tipolemus, son of Damastor, Pyrus, Iphius brave, Euippus, Palamelus, Arginus's son, in quick succession to the ground he brought. Sarpedon his ungirdled forces saw, promiscuous fall, before Menetius' son, and to the Lycians called in loud reproof. Shame, Lycians! Whither fly ye? Why this haste? I will myself this chief confront, and learn who this may be of bearing proud and high, who on the Trojans grievous harm hath wrought and many a warrior's limbs relaxed in death. He said, and from his car accoutred sprang. Patroclus saw, and he too leaped to earth. As on a lofty rock, with angry screams, hook-beaked, with talons curved, two vultures fight, so with loud shouts, these two to battle rushed. The son of Saturn, pitying, saw, and thus to Juno spoke, his sister and his wife. Woe, woe, that fate decrees my best beloved Sarpedon by Patroclus' hand to fall. E'en now conflicting thoughts my soul divide, to bear him from the fatal strife unhurt, and set him down on Lycia's fertile plains, or leave him by Patroclus's hand to fall. Whom answered thus the stag-eyed queen of heaven? What words, dread son of Saturn, dost thou speak? Wouldst thou, a mortal man from death, withdraw, Long since by fate decreed? Do what thou wilt, yet cannot we, the rest, applaud thine act? This too I say, and turn it in thy mind. If to his home Sarpedon thou restore alive, Bethink ye, will not other gods, their sons too, From the stubborn fight withdraw? 
for in the field around the walls of Troy are many sons of gods, in all of whom this act of thine will angry feelings rouse. But if thou love him, and thy soul deplore his coming doom, yet in the stubborn fight leave him beneath Patroclus' hand to fall. Then when his spirit hath fled, the charge assign to death and gentle sleep, that in their arms they bear him safe to Lycia's widespread plains. There shall his brethren and his friends perform his funeral rites, and mound and column raise a fitting tribute to the mighty dead. Thus she, the sire of gods and men, complied. But to the ground some drops of blood let fall, in honour of his son, whom fate decreed, far from his country, on the fertile plains of Troy, to perish by Patroclus' hand. End of Book 16, Part 1Book 16, Part 2 of The Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. As near the champions drew, Patroclus first his weapon hurled and Thrasymedes brave, the faithful follower of Sarpedon, struck below the waist, and slacked his limbs in death. Thrown in his turn, Sarpedon's glittering spear flew wide, and Pedasus, the gallant horse, through the right shoulder wounded. With a scream he fell, and in the dust breathed forth his life, as, shrieking loud, his noble spirit fled. This way and that his two companions swerved, creaked the strong yoke, and tangled were the reins, as in the dust the prostrate courser lay. Automedon the means of safety saw, and drawing from beside his brawny thigh his keen-edged sword. With no uncertain blow cut loose the fallen horse. Again set straight, the two, extended, stretched the tightened rein. Again in mortal strife the warriors closed. Once more Sarpedon hurled his glittering spear. In vain. Above Patroclus's shoulder flew the point, innocuous. From his hand in turn, the spear not vainly thrown, Sarpedon struck, where lies the diaphragm, below the heart. He fell, as falls an oak, or poplar tall, or lofty pine, which on the mountain top, or some proud ship, the woodman's axe hath hewn, so he, with death cry sharp, before his car extended lay, and clutched the blood-stained soil. As when a lion on the herd has sprung, and mid the heifers seized, the lordly bull lies bellowing, crushed between the lion's jaws, so, by Patroclus slain, the Lycian chief, undaunted still, his faithful comrade called. Good Glaucus, warrior tried, behooves thee now thy spearmanship to prove, and warlike might. Welcome the fray, put forth thine utmost speed, call on the Lycian chiefs, 
on every side to press around, and for Sarpedon fight. Thou too thine arms for my protection wield, for I to thee, through all thy future days, shall be a ceaseless scandal and reproach, if me thus slain before the Grecian ships, the Greeks be suffered of my arms to spoil. But stand thou fast, and others' courage raise. Thus, as he spoke, the shades of death o'erspread his eyes and nostrils. Them with foot firm set upon his chest, Patroclus from the corpse drew by main force the fast adhering spear, the life forth issuing from the weapon's point. Loosed from the royal car, the snorting steeds eager for flight, the myrmidons detained. Deep grieving Glaucus heard his voice, and chafed his spirit within him, that he lacked the power to aid his comrade. With his hand he grasped his wounded arm, in torture from the shaft by Teucer shot, to save the Greeks from death, as on he pressed to scale the lofty wall. Then to Apollo thus addressed his prayer, Hear me, great king, who, as on Lycia's plains, art here in Troy, and hearst in every place their voice who suffer, as I suffer now. A grievous wound I bear, and sharpest pangs my arm assail, nor may the blood be staunched. The pain weighs down my shoulder, and my hand hath lost its power to fight, or grasp my spear. Sarpedon, bravest of the brave, is slain, the son of Jove. Yet Jove preserved him not. But thou, O king, this grievous wound relieve, assuage the pain, and give me strength to urge my Lycian comrades to maintain the war, and fight myself to guard the noble dead. Thus, as he prayed, his prayer Apollo heard, assuaged his pains, and from the grievous wound staunched the dark blood, and filled his soul with strength. Glaucus within himself perceived and knew rejoicing that the god had heard his prayer the lycian leaders first on every side he urged to hasten for their king to fight then mid the trojans went with lofty steps and first to panthous's son polydamus to brave agenor and aeneas next then Hector of the brazen helm himself, approaching thus with winged words addressed. Hector, forgetst thou quite thy brave allies, who freely in thy cause pour forth their lives, far from their home and friends? But they from thee no aid receive. Sarpedon lies in death, the leader of the bucklered Lycian bands, whose justice and whose power were Lycia's shield. Him, by Patroclus' hand, hath Mars subdued. But, friends, stand by me now, with just revenge inspired, determined that the Myrmidons shall not, how grieved so e'er for all the Greeks, who by our spears beside the ships have fallen, our dead dishonour, and his arms obtain? He said, and through the Trojans thrilled the sense of grief intolerable, 
unrestrained. For he, though stranger-born, was of the state a mighty pillar, and his followers a numerous host, and he himself in fight among the foremost. So against the Greeks with fiery zeal they rushed, by Hector led, grieved for Sarpedon's loss. On the other side, Patroclus's manly heart the Greeks aroused, and to the Aegises first, themselves inflamed with warlike zeal, he thus addressed his speech. Ye sons of Ajax, now is come the time your former fame to rival, or surpass. A man hath fallen, who first o'erleaped our wall, Sarpedon. Now remains that, having slain, we should his corpse dishonour, and his arms strip off. And should some comrade dare attempt his rescue, him too with our spears subdue. He said, and they, with martial ardour fired, rushed to the conflict. When on either side the reinforced battalions were arrayed, Trojans and Lycians, Myrmidons and Greeks, Around the dead in sternest combat met With fearful shouts, and loud their armour rang. Then to enhance the horror of the strife around his son, With darkness Jove o'erspread the stubborn fight. The Trojans first drove back the keen-eyed Greeks, For first a warrior fell, not of the meanest mid the Myrmidons, Epigeus, son of valiant Agacles, who in Budium's thriving state bore rule erewhile, but flying for a kinsman slain, to Peleus and the silver-footed queen he came, a suppliant, with Achilles thence to Ilium sent, to join the war of Troy. Him, as he stretched his hand to seize the dead, Full on the forehead with a massive stone, Great Hector smote. Within the ponderous helm the skull was split in twain. Prone on the corpse he fell, By life-destroying death subdued. Grieved was Patroclus for his comrade slain, Forward he darted, as a swift-winged hawk that swoops amid the starlings and the daws, so swift didst thou, Patroclus, car-born chief, upon the Trojans and the Lycians spring, thy soul with anger for thy comrade filled. A ponderous stone he hurled at Sthenelus, son of Ithemenes. The mighty mass fell on his neck, and all the muscles crushed. Back drew great Hector and the chiefs of Troy. Far, as a javelin's flight in sportive strife, or in the deadly battle, hurled by one his utmost strength exerting, Back so far the Trojans drew, so far the Greeks pursued. Glaucus, the leader of the Lycian spears, first turning, slew the mighty Bathycles, the son of Calchon. He in Hellas dwelt, in wealth surpassing all the Myrmidons. Him, as he gained upon him in pursuit, quick turning, Glaucus through the breast transfixed. Thundering he fell. Deep grief possessed the Greeks at loss of one so valiant. Fiercely joyed the Trojans, and around him crowded thick, 
nor of their wonted valour were the Greeks oblivious, but still onward held their course. Then slew Meriones, a crested chief, the bold Laogonus, Onetor's son. Onetor, of Idaean Jove the priest, and by the people as a god revered. Below the ear he struck him, from his limbs the spirit fled, and darkness veiled his eyes. Then at Meriones Aeneas threw his brazen spear, in hopes beneath his shield to find a spot unguarded. He beheld, and downward stooping shunned the brazen death. Behind him far, deep in the soil and fixed, the weapon stood. There Mars its impulse stayed. So bootless hurled, though by no feeble hand, Aeneas's spear stood quivering in the ground. Then thus in wrath he cried, Meriones, had it but struck thee, nimble as thou art, my spear had brought thy dancing to a close. To whom the spearman skilled, Meriones, brave as thou art, Aeneas, tis too much for thee to hope the might of all to quell who dare confront thee. Thou art mortal too, and if my aim be true, and should my spear but strike thee fair, all valiant as thou art and confident, yet me thy fall shall crown with triumph, and thy soul to Hades send. He said. And him Menetius's noble son addressed with grave rebuke. Meriones, brave warrior, why thus waste the time in words? Trust me, good friend, tis not by vaunting speech, unseconded by deeds, that we may hope to scare away the Trojans from the slain. Hands are for battle. Words for counsel meet, boots it not now to wrangle, but to fight. He said, and led the way. Him followed straight the godlike chief. Forthwith, as loudly rings amid the mountain forest's deep recess, the woodman's axe, and far is heard the sound, so from the widespread earth their clamours rose, as brazen arms and shields and tough bull's hide encountered swords and double-pointed spears. Nor might the sharpest sight Sarpedon know, from head to foot with wounds and blood and dust disfigured. Thickly round the dead they swarmed, as when at springtide in the cattle sheds around the milk cans swarm the buzzing flies, while the warm milk is frothing in the pail, so swarmed they round the dead. Nor Jove, the while, turned from the stubborn fight his piercing glance, but still looked down with gaze intent, and mused upon Patroclus's coming fate, in doubt if he too there beside Sarpedon slain should perish by illustrious Hector's hand, spoiled of his arms, or yet be spared a while to swell the labours of the battlefield. He judged it best, at length, that once again the gallant follower of Peleus's son should, toward the town with fearful slaughter, drive the Trojans and their brazened-helmed chief. 
first Hector's soul with panic fear he filled. Mounting his car, he fled, and urged to flight the Trojans, for he saw the scales of Jove. Then nor the valiant Lycians held their ground. All fled in terror, as they saw their king pierced through the heart amid a pile of dead. For o'er his body many a warrior fell, when Saturn's son the conflict fierce inflamed. Then from Sarpedon's breast they stripped his arms of brass refulgent. These Anetius' son sent by his comrades to the ships of Greece. To Phoebus then the cloud-compeller thus. Hie thee, good Phoebus, from amid the spears withdraw Sarpedon, and from all his wounds cleanse the dark gore. Then bear him far away, and lave his body in the flowing stream. Then with divine ambrosia all his limbs anointing, Clothe him in immortal robes. To two swift bearers give him then in charge. To sleep and death, twin brothers, in their arms to bear him safe to Lycia's widespread plains. There shall his brethren and his friends perform his funeral rites, and mound and column raise the fitting tribute to the mighty dead. He said, Obedient to his father's words, Down to the battlefield Apollo sped from Ida's height, And from amid the spears withdrawn, He bore Sarpedon far away, And laved his body in the flowing stream. Then with divine ambrosia, all his limbs anointing, clothed him in immortal robes. To two swift bearers gave him then in charge, to sleep and death, twin brothers. In their arms they bore him safe to Lycia's widespread plains. Then to Atomedon Patroclus gave his orders, and the flying foe pursued. O oh, much deceived, insensate! Had he now but borne in mind the words of Peleus' son, he might have scaped the bitter doom of death. But still Jove's will, the will of man or rules, who strikes with panic, and of victory robs the bravest, and anon excites to war. Who now Patroclus' breast with fury filled? Whom then, Patroclus, first, whom slewest thou last, when summoned by the gods to meet thy doom? Adrastus and Atonous, Perimus, the son of Meges, and Echeclus next, Epistor, Melanippus, Elysus, and Mulius, and Pylartes, these he slew. The others all in flight their safety found. Then had the Greeks the lofty-gated town of Priam, captured by Patroclus' hand, so forward and so fierce he bore his spear. But on the well-built tower Apollo stood, on his destruction bent, and Troy's defence, the jutting angle of the lofty wall, Patroclus thrice assailed. His onset thrice Apollo, with his own immortal hands repelling, Backward thrust his glittering shield. But when again, with more than mortal force, He made his fourth attempt, With awful mien and threatening voice, 
the far destroyer spoke. Back, back, heaven-born chief, Patroclus! Not to thee hath fate decreed the triumph to destroy the warlike Trojans' city, nor yet to great Achilles, mightier far than thou. Thus as he spoke, Patroclus backward stepped, shrinking before the far destroyer's wrath. Still Hector kept before the Sean gates his coursers, doubtful if again to dare the battle throng, or summon all the host to seek the friendly shelter of the wall. Thus, as he mused, beside him Phoebus stood, in likeness of a warrior stout and brave, brother of Hecuba, the uncle thence of noble Hector, Asius, Dimas' son, who dwelt in Phrygia by Sagarius' stream, his form assuming, thus Apollo spoke. Hector, why shrink'st thou from the battle thus? It ill beseems thee, would to heaven, that I so far thy greater were, as thou art mine, then sorely shouldst thou rue this abstinence. But forward thou, against Patroclus, urge thy fiery steeds, so haply by his death Apollo thee with endless fame may crown. This said, the god rejoined the strife of men, and noble Hector bade Sobriones drive mid the fight his car. Before him moved Apollo, scattering terror mid the Greeks, and luster adding to the arms of Troy. All others Hector passed unnoticed, nor stayed to slay. Patroclus was the mark, at which his coursers' clattering hooves he drove. On the other side, Patroclus from his car leaped to the ground. His left hand held his spear, and in the right a ponderous mass he bore of rugged stone that filled his ample grasp. The stone he hurled, not far it missed its mark, nor bootless flew, but Hector's charioteer it struck, Sobriones, a bastard son of royal Priam, as the reins he held. Full on his temples fell the jagged mass, drove both his eyebrows in, and crushed the bone. Before him in the dust his eyeballs fell, and like a diver from the well-wrought car headlong he plunged, and life forsook his limbs. O'er whom Patroclus thus with bitter jest, Heaven, what agility! How deftly thrown that somersault! If only in the sea such feats he wrought, With him might few compete, diving for oysters, If with such a plunge he left his boat, How rough soe'er the waves, As from his car he plunges to the ground? Troy can, it seems, accomplished tumblers boast thus saying on sobriones he sprang as springs a lion through the breast transfixed in act the sheepfold to despoil and dies the victim of his courage so didst thou upon sobriones patroclus spring down from his car, too, Hector leaped to earth. So o'er Sobriones opposed they stood, As on the mountain o'er a slaughtered stag, Both hunger pinched, two lions fiercely fight. So o'er Sobriones two mighty chiefs, 
Menoetius' son, and noble Hector, strove, each in the other bent to plunge his spear. The head, with grasp unyielding, Hector held. Patroclus seized the foot, and crowding round Trojans and Greeks, in stubborn conflict closed. As when encountering in some mountain glen, Eurus and Notus shake the forest deep of oak or ash or slender cornel tree, whose tapering branches are together thrown with fearful din and the crash of broken boughs, so mixed confusedly Greeks and Trojans fought, no thought of flight by either entertained. Thick o'er Sobriones the javelins flew, and feathered arrows bounding from the string, and ponderous stones that on the bucklers rang, as round the dead they fought, amid the dust that eddying rose, his art forgotten all, a mighty warrior mightily he lay. While in mid-heaven the sun pursues his course, thick flew the shafts, and fast the people fell on either side. But when declining day brought on the hour that seized the loosened steers, the Greeks were stronger far, and from the darts and Trojan battle-cry, Sobriones they drew, and from his breast his armour stripped. Fiercely Patroclus on the Trojans fell. Thrice he assailed them, terrible as Mars, with fearful shouts, and thrice nine foes he slew. But when again, with more than mortal force, his fourth assault he made, thy term of life, Patroclus, then approached its final close. For Phoebus's awful self encountered thee amid the battle throng of thee unseen, for thickest darkness shrouded all his form. He stood behind, and with extended palm dealt on Patroclus's neck and shoulders broad a mighty buffet. Dizzy swam his eyes, and from his head Apollo snatched the helm, clanked as it rolled beneath the horse's feet the visored helm, the horsehair plume with blood and dust polluted. Never till that day was that proud helmet so with dust defiled that wont to deck a godlike chief and guard Achilles' noble head and graceful brow, now by the will of Jove to Hector given. Now death was near at hand, and in his grasp his spear was shivered, ponderous, long, and tough, brass-pointed. With its belt the ample shields fell from his shoulders, and Apollo's hand, the royal son of Jove, his corslet loosed. Then was his mind bewildered, and his limbs gave way beneath him. All aghast he stood. Him from behind a Dardan, Panthous' son, Euphorbus, peerless mid the Trojan youth, to hurl the spear, to run, to drive the car, approaching close beneath the shoulders stabbed. He, trained to warfare from his car, ere this, a score of Greeks had from their chariots hurled. Such was the man who thee, Patroclus, first wounded, but not subdued. The ashen spear he, all in haste, withdrew, nor dared confront Patroclus, though disarmed, in deadly strife. 
Back to his comrades' sheltering ranks retired from certain death, Patroclus, by the stroke of Phoebus vanquished, and Euphorbus' spear. But Hector, when Patroclus from the fight he saw retreating, wounded, through the ranks, advancing, smote him through the flank. Right through the brazen spear was driven. Thundering, he fell, and deeply mourned his fall, the Grecian host. As when a lion hath in fight o'erborne a tusked boar, and on the mountain top they two have met, in all their pride of strength, both parched with thirst, around a scanty spring, and vanquished by the lion's force, the boar hath yielded, gasping. So Menetius's son, great deeds achieved, at length beneath the spear of noble Hector yielded up his life who o'er the vanquished thus exulting spoke. Patroclus, but of late thou madest thy boast to raise our city walls, and in your ships to bear away to your far distant land their days of freedom lost, our Trojan dames. Fool that thou wast, nor knewest in their defence that Hector's flying coursers scoured the plain. From them, the bravest of the Trojans, I avert the day of doom, while on our shores thy flesh shall glut the carrion birds of Troy. Poor wretch! Though brave he be, yet Peleus' son availed thee not when hanging back himself with sage advice he sent thee forth to fight come not to me patroclus car-born chief nor to the ships return until thou bear the warrior slayer hector's bloody spoils torn from his body such were i suppose his counsels thou poor fool Becamest his dupe. To whom Patroclus thus in accents faint. Hector, <laughs> thou boastest loudly now that Jove, with Phoebus joined, hath thee with victory crowned. They wrought my death, who stripped me of my arms. Had I to deal with twenty such as thee, they all should perish, vanquished by my spear. Me, fate hath slain, and Phoebus, and of men Euphorbus. <laughs> thou wast but the third to strike. This too I say, and bear it in thy mind. Not long shalt thou survive me. Death, e'en now, and final doom hangs o'er thee by the hand of great Achilles, Peleus' matchless son. Thus, as he spoke, the gloom of death, his eyes o'erspread, and to the shades his spirit fled. Mourning his fate, his youth and strength cut off. To whom, though dead, the noble Hector thus. Patroclus, why predict my coming fate? Or who can say but fair-haired Thetis' son, Achilles, by my spear may first be slain? He said, and planting firm his foot, withdrew the brazen spear, and backward drove the dead from off the weapon's point. Then, spear in hand, intent to slay, 
Automedon pursued, the godlike follower of Aesides. But him in safety bore the immortal steeds, the noble prize the gods to Peleus gave. End of Book 16, Part 2Book 17 of The Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. Argument The Seventh Battle for the Body of Patroclus the Acts of Menelaus Menelaus, upon the death of Patroclus, defends his body from the enemy. Euphorbus, who attempts it, is slain. Hector advancing, Menelaus retires, but soon returns with Ajax and drives him off. This Glaucus objects to Hector as a flight who thereupon puts on the armor he had won from Patroclus, and renews the battle. The Greeks give way, till Ajax rallies them. Aeneas sustains the Trojans. Aeneas and Hector attempt the chariot of Achilles, which is borne off by Automedon. The horses of Achilles deplore the loss of Patroclus. Jupiter covers his body with a thick darkness. The noble prayer of Ajax on that occasion. Menelaus sends Antilochus to Achilles with the news of Patroclus's death, then returns to the fight, where though attacked with the utmost fury, he and Meriones, assisted by the Ajaces, bear off the body to the ships. The time is the evening of the eight-and-twentieth day. The scene lies in the fields before Troy. Nor was Patroclus's fall, by Trojans slain, of warlike Menelaus unobserved. Forward he sprang, in dazzling arms arrayed, and round him moved, as round her new-dropped calf, her first, a heifer moves with plaintive moan. So round Patroclus Menelaus moved, his shield's broad orb and spear before him held, to all who might oppose him threatening death. Nor on his side was Panthous's noble son, unmindful of the slain, but standing near, the warlike Menelaus thus addressed, Illustrious son of Ajax, heaven-born chief, quit thou the dead, yield up the bloody spoils. For of the Trojans and their famed allies, mine was the hand that in the stubborn fight first struck Patroclus. Leave me then to wear, among the men of Troy, my honors due lest by my spear thou lose thy cherished life. To whom in anger Menelaus thus, O father Jove, how ill this vaunting tone beseems this braggart! In their own esteem with Panthous' sons for courage none may vie nor pard, nor lion, nor the forest boar, fiercest of beasts, and proudest of his strength, yet not availed to Hyperenor's might his youthful vigour, when he held me cheap, and my encounter dared. Of all the Greeks he deemed my prowess least, yet he, I ween, on his own feet returned not to rejoice his tender wife's and honoured parents' sight. 
so shall thy pride be quelled, if me thou dare encounter. But I warn thee, while tis time, ere ill betide thee, mid the general throng, that thou withdraw, nor stand to me opposed. After the event may e'en a fool be wise. He spoke in vain. Euphorbus thus replied, Now, heaven-born Menelaus, shalt thou pay the forfeit for my brother's life, or whom, slain by thy hand, thou mak'st thy boasting speech? Thou in the chambers of her new-found home hast made his bride a weeping widow. Thou hast filled with bitterest grief his parents' hearts, some solace might those hapless mourners find, Could I thy head and armour in the hands of Panthous and of honoured Frontis place. Nor uncontested shall the proof remain, Nor long deferred of victory or defeat. He said, and struck the centre of the shield, But broke not through. Against the stubborn brass the point was bent. Then, with a prayer to Jove, the son of Atreus, in his turn, advanced, and backward, as he stepped, below his throat took aim, and pressing hard with stalwart hand, drove through the yielding neck the ponderous spear. Thundering, he fell and loud his armour rang. Those locks that with the grace's hair might vie, those tresses bright with gold and silver bound, were dabbled all with blood. As when a man hath reared a fair and vigorous olive plant in some lone spot by copious gushing springs, and seen expanding, nursed by every breeze its whitening blossoms, till with sudden gust a sweeping hurricane of wind and rain uproots it from its bed, and prostrate lays, so lay the youthful son of Panthous, slain by Atreus's son, and of his arms despoiled. And as a lion in the mountains bred in pride of strength amid the pasturing herd seizes a heifer in his powerful jaws the choicest and her neck first broken rends and on her entrails gorging laps the blood though with loud clamour dogs and herdsmen round assail him from afar yet ventures none to meet his rage for fear is on them all. So none was there so bold, With dauntless breast, A noble Menelaus's wrath to meet. Now had Atreides borne away, With ease, the spoils of Panthous's son. But Phoebus grudged his prize of victory, and against him launched the might of Hector, terrible as Mars, to whom his winged words in Mentes' form, chief of the Cyconies, he thus addressed. Hector, thy labor all is vain, pursuing Pelides' flying steeds, and hard are they for mortal man to harness or control save for Achilles' self, the goddess born. The valiant Menelaus, Atreus' son, defends meanwhile Patroclus, and e'en now hath slain a noble Trojan, Panthous' son, Euphorbus, and his youthful vigour quelled. He said, and joined again the strife of men. Hector's dark soul with bitter grief was filled. He looked amid the ranks, and saw the two, one slain, the other stripping off his arms, the blood outpouring from the gaping wound. 
forward he sprang in dazzling arms arrayed loud shouting blazing like the quenchless flames of vulcan menelaus heard the shout and troubled communed with his valiant heart oh woe is me for should i now the spoils abandon and patroclus who for me and in my cause lies slain of any greek who saw me i might well incur the blame and yet if here alone i dare to fight with hector and his trojans much i fear singly to be by numbers overwhelmed for hector all the trojans hither brings but wherefore entertain such thoughts my soul who strives against the will divine with one beloved of heaven a bitter doom must meet then none may blame me though i should retreat from hector who with heaven's assistance wars yet could i hear brave ajax's battle-cry we two returning would the encounter dare e'en against heaven if so for peleus's son we might regain and bear away the dead some solace of our loss might then be ours while in his mind and spirit thus he mused by hector led the trojan ranks advanced backward he moved abandoning the dead but turning oft as when by men and dogs a bearded lion from the fold is driven with shouts and spears yet grieves his mighty heart and with reluctant step he quits the yard so from patroclus menelaus moved yet when he reached his comrades ranks he turned and looked around if haply he might find the mighty ajax son of telamon him on the battle's farthest left he spied cheering his friends and urging to the fight for sorely phoebus had their courage tried and hastening to his side addressed him thus ajax haste hither to the rescue come of slain patroclus if perchance we too may to achilles peleus's son restore his body his naked body for his arms are prized to hector of the glancing helm he said and ajax's spirit within him stirred forward he sprang and with him atreus's son hector was dragging now patroclus's corpse stripped of its glittering armor and intent the head to sever with his sword and give the mangled carcass to the dogs of troy but ajax with his tower-like shield approached then hector to his comrades ranks withdrew rushed to his car and bade the trojans bear the glittering arms his glorious prize to troy while ajax with his mighty shield o'erspread menoetius's son and stood as for his cubs a lion stands whom hunters unaware have with his offspring met amid the woods proud in his strength he stands and down or drawn covering his eyes the wrinkles of his brow so o'er patroclus mighty ajax stood and by his side his heart with grief oppressed the warlike menelaus atreus's son then glaucus leader of the lycian host to hector thus with scornful glance addressed his keen reproaches hector fair of form how art thou wanting in the fight thy fame 
coward and run away, thou hast belied. Bethink thee now, if thou alone canst save the city, aided but by Trojans born. Henceforth no Lycian will go forth for Troy to fight with Greeks, since favour none we gain by unremitting toil against the foe. How can a meaner man expect thine aid, who basely to the Greeks a prize and spoil? Sarpedon leavest thy comrade and thy guest. Greatly he served the city and thyself while yet he lived, and now thou darest not save his body from the dogs. By my advice, if Lycians will be ruled, we take at once our homeward way, and Troy may meet her doom. But if in Trojan bosoms there abode the daring dauntless courage, meets for men, who in their country's cause against the foe endure both toil and war, we soon should see Patroclus brought within the walls of Troy. Him from the battle could we bear away, and lifeless bring to royal Priam's town. Soon would the Greeks Sarpedon's arms release, and we to Ilium's heights himself might bear, for with his valiant comrades there lies slain the follower of the bravest chief of Greece. But thou, before the mighty Ajax, stoodst with downcast eyes, nor durst in manly fight contend with one thy better far confessed. To whom thus Hector of the glancing helm, with stern regard, replied, Why, Glaucus, speak, brave as thou art, in this o'erbearing strain? Good friend, I heretofore have held thee wise, o'er all who dwell in Lycia's fertile soil, but now I change and hold thy judgment cheap, who chargest me with flying from the might of giant Ajax. Never have I shrunk from the stern fight and clatter of the cars. But all o'erruling is the mind of Jove, who strikes with panic, and of victory robs the bravest, and anon excites to war. Stand by me now, and see if through the day I prove myself the coward that thou sayest, or suffer that a Greek, how brave soe'er, shall rescue from my hands Patroclus' corpse. He said, and loudly on the Trojans called, Trojans and Lycians, and ye Dardans famed in close encounter, quit ye now like men, maintain a while the stubborn fight, while I the splendid armor of Achilles don, my glorious prize from slain Patroclus torn. So saying, Hector of the glancing helm Withdrawing from the field with rapid steps, his comrades followed, and ere long o'ertook, who toward the town Achilles' armor bore. Then, standing from the bloody fight aloof, the armor he exchanged. His own he bade the warlike Trojans to the city bear, while he of Peleus' son Achilles donned the heavenly armor which the immortal gods gave to his sire, he to his son conveyed. Yet in that armor grew not old that son. Him, when apart the cloud-compeller saw, girt with the arms of Peleus' godlike son, he shook his head, and inly thus he mused, Ah, oh, hapless! 
little deem'st thou of thy fate, though now so nigh. Thou of the prime of men, the dread of all, hast donned the immortal arms, whose comrade, brave and good, thy hand hath slain, and shamed him, stripping from his head and breast helmet and cuirass. Yet thy latest hours will I with glory crown, since ne'er from thee, returned from battle, shall Andromache receive the spoils of Peleus's godlike son. He said, and nodded with his shadowy brows. Then, with the armor fitted to his form, by Jove himself, was Hector girt by Mars, the fierce and terrible. With vigorous strength his limbs were strung, as mid his brave allies he sprang, loud shouting, glittering in his arms to all he seemed Achilles' godlike self. To each and all in cheering tones he spoke, Mestlus and Glaucus and Thersilochus, Esteropius and Hippothous, Medon, Decenor, Phorsys, Chromius, and Enomus the seer. To all of these his winged words he cheeringly addressed. Hear me, ye countless tribes, that dwelling round assist our cause. You from your several homes, not for display of numbers have I called, but that with willing hearts ye should defend our wives and infants from the warlike Greeks. For this I drain my people's stores for food and gifts for you, exalting your estate, who will boldly onward, may he fall, or safe escape. Such is the chance of war. But who within our valiant Trojans' ranks shall but the body of Patroclus bring, despite the might of Ajax, Half the spoils to him I give, the other half myself retaining, and his praise shall equal mine. He said, and onward with uplifted spears they marched upon the Greeks. High rose their hopes from Ajax Telamon to snatch the dead. Vain! hopes, which cost them many a life. Then thus to valiant Menelaus Ajax spoke. O heaven-born Menelaus, noble friend, for safe return I dare no longer hope. Not for Patroclus's corpse so much I fear, which soon will glut the dogs and birds of Troy, as for my life and thine I tremble now, for like a war-cloud Hector's might I see, o'ershadowing all around. Now is our doom apparent. But do thou for succour call on all the chiefs, if haply they may hear. Thus Ajax spoke. Obedient to his word, on all the chiefs, Atrides called aloud. O friends, the chiefs and counsellors of Greece, all ye that banquet at the general cost with Atreus's sons, and o'er your several states, dominion hold, whose honour is of Jove. Twere hard to call by name each single man, so fierce the combat rages. But let each and all their aid afford, and deem it shame Patroclus' corpse should glut the dogs of Troy. He said, 
first heard Oileus's active son, and hastening through the fray, beside him stood. Next him Idomeneus, with whom there came, valiant as Mars, his friend Meriones. But who can know, or tell the names of all, who, following, swelled the battle of the Greeks? Onward the Trojans pressed, by Hector led, with such a sound, as when the ocean wave meets on the beach the outpouring of a stream, swollen by the rains of heaven, the lofty cliffs resound, and bellows the big sea without. With such a sound advanced the Trojan host, while round Patroclus, with one heart and mind, the Greeks a fence of brass-clad bucklers raised. O'er their bright helms the son of Saturn shed a veil of darkness, for Menetius's son, Achilles' faithful friend, while yet he lived. Jove hated not, nor would now that his corpse should to the dogs of Troy remain a prey. But to the rescue all his comrades stirred. At first the Trojans drove the keen-eyed Greeks, Leaving the corpse they fled, Nor with their spears the valiant Trojans reached a single Greek. But on the dead they seized, Yet not for long endured their flight, Them Ajax rallied soon in form pre-eminent and deeds of arms o'er all the greeks save peleus's matchless son onward he sprang as springs a mountain boar which turning in the forest glade to bay scatters with ease both dogs and stalwart youths so ajax scattered soon the trojan ranks that round Patroclus, closing, hoped to bear, with glory to themselves, his corpse to Troy. Hippothous, Pelagian Lathus's son, was dragging by the feet the noble dead, a leathern belt around his ankles bound, seeking the favour of the men of Troy. But on himself he brought destruction down, which none might turn aside, for from the crowd outsprang the son of Telamon, and struck in close encounter on the brass-cheeked helm. The plumed helm was shivered by the blow, dealt by a weighty spear, and stalwart hand, gushed from the wound the mingled blood and brain. His vital spirit quenched and on the ground fell from his powerless grasp Patroclus's foot, while he himself lay stretched beside the dead, far from his own Larissa's teeming soil, nor destined he his parents to repay their early care, for short his term of life, by godly Ajax's mighty spear subdued. At Ajax Hector threw his glittering spear. He saw, and narrowly the brazen death escaped. But Scedius, son of Iphitus, the bravest of the Phocian chiefs, who dwell in far-famed Panopeus, the mighty lord of numerous hosts, below the collar-bone it struck, and passing through, the brazen point came forth again beneath his shoulder-blade. Thundering, he fell, and loud his armour rang. As Forsyth, son of Phenops, kept his watch o'er slain Hippothous, him Ajax smote below the waist. The weighty spear broke through the hollow breastplate, and the intestines tore. Prone in the dust he fell, and clutched the ground. At this the Trojan chiefs, 
and Hector's self gan to give way. The Greeks, with joyful shouts, seized both the dead, and stripped their armour off. To Ilium now, before the warlike Greeks, o'ercome by panic, had the Trojans fled, and now had Greeks, despite the will of Jove, by their own strength and courage, won the day. Had not Apollo's self Aeneas roused, in likeness of a herald, Paraphus, the son of Epitus, now aged, grown in service of Aeneas's aged sire, a man of kindliest soul. His form assumed, Apollo and Aeneas thus addressed. Aeneas, how, against the will of heaven, could ye defend your city, as others now, in their own strength and courage confident their numbers, and their troops undaunted hearts I see their cause maintaining. If, when Jove rather do us than them, the victory wills, with fear unspeakable ye shun the fight. He said, The presence of the archer-god Aeneas knew, and loud to Hector called, Hector, and all ye other chiefs of Troy, and brave allies, foul shame it were that we, o'ercome by panic, should to Ilium now in flight be driven before the warlike Greeks. And by my side but now some god there stood, and told me how Jove, the sovereign arbiter of battle, on our side bestowed his aid. On, then, nor undisturbed, allow the Greeks to bear Patroclus's body to their ships. He said, and far before the ranks advanced. They, rallying, turned, and faced again the Greeks. Then first Aeneas's spear, the comrade brave of Lycomedes, struck Leocritus, son of Arisbus. Lycomedes saw, with pitying eyes, his gallant comrades fall, and standing near, his glittering spear he threw, and through the midriff Apiseon struck, his people's guardian chief the valiant son of Hippasus, and slacked his limbs in death. He from Peonia's fertile fields had come, or all his comrades eminent in fight, all save Esteropius, who with eyes of pity saw his gallant comrades fall, and forward sprang to battle with the Greeks, yet could not force his way, for all around Patroclus rose a fence of serried shields and spears projecting. Such the orders given by Ajax, and with earnest care enforced, that from around the dead none should retire, nor any to the front advance alone before his fellows, but their steady guard maintain, and hand to hand the battle wage. So ordered Ajax. Then, with crimson blood, the earth was wet, and hand to hand they fell, Trojans alike and brave allies, and Greeks, for neither these a bloodless fight sustained, though fewer far their losses, for they stood of mutual succor, mindful, and support. Thus, furious as the rage of fire, they fought. Nor might ye deem the glorious sun himself, nor moon was safe, for darkest clouds of night o'erspread the warriors, who the battle waged around the body of Manetius's son. Elsewhere the Trojans and the well-grieved Greeks 
fought undisturbed in the clear light of day. The sun's bright beams were shed abroad. No cloud lay on the face of earth or mountain tops, but they, but by fits, at distant intervals and far apart, each seeking to avoid the hostile missiles, fought. But in the midst, the bravest all in darkness and in strife sore pressed, toiled on beneath their armor's weight. As yet no tidings of Patroclus's fall had reached two valiant chiefs, Antilochus and Thrasymedes, but they deemed him still alive, and fighting in the foremost ranks. They, witnessing their comrades' flight and death, fought on apart by Nestor so enjoined, when from the ships he bade them join the fray. Great was, meanwhile, their labor, who sustained throughout the live-long day that weary fight, reeked with continuous toil, and sweat the knees and legs and feet, the arms and eyes, of all who round Achilles's faithful comrade fought. As when a chief his people bids to stretch a huge bull's hide, all drenched and soaked with grease, they in a circle ranged, this way and that, pull the tough hide, till, entering in, the grease is all absorbed, and dragged by numerous hands the supple skin to the utmost length is stretched. So these in narrow space, this way and that, the body dragged, and high the hopes of each to bear it off in triumph, to their ships the Greeks, to Troy the Trojans. Fiercely raged the struggle, spirit-stirring Mars himself, or Pallas to her utmost fury roused, had not that struggle with contempt beheld. Such grievous labor o'er Patroclus's corpse had Jove, to horses and to men decreed. But of Patroclus's fall, no tidings yet had reached Achilles, for the war was waged far from the ships beneath the walls of Troy. Nor looked he of his death to hear, but deemed that when the Trojans to their gates were driven, he would return in safety. For no hope had he of taking, by assault, the town, with or without his aid. For oft apart his goddess mother had his doom foretold, revealing to her son the mind of Jove. Yet ne'er had warned him of such grief as this which now befell his dearest comrades' loss. Still round the dead they held their pointed spears, fought hand to hand, and mutual slaughter dealt. And thus, perchance, some brass-clad Greek would say, O oh, friends! T'were shameful should we to the ships ingloriously return. Ere that should be, let earth engulf us all. So better far than let these Trojans to their city bear our dead, and boast them of their triumph gained. On the other hand, some valiant Trojan thus would shout, O oh, friends! Though fate decreed that here we all should die, yet let not one give way. Thus cheering each his comrades would they speak, and thus they fought. The iron clangor pierced the empty air, and brazen vault of heaven. But from the fight withdrawn, Achilles' steeds, wept as they heard how in the dust was laid 
their charioteer by Hector's murderous hand. Automedon, Diores's valiant son, essayed in vain to rouse them with the lash, in vain with honeyed words, in vain with threats, nor to the ships would they return again by the broad Hellespont, nor join the fray. But as a column stands, which marks the tomb of man or woman, so immovable beneath the splendid car they stood, their heads down drooping to the ground, while scalding tears dropped earthward from their eyelids, as they mourned their charioteer, and o'er the yoke band shed, down streamed their ample manes with dust defiled. The son of Saturn, pitying, saw their grief, and sorrowing shook his head as thus he mused. Ah, hapless horses! Wherefore gave we you to royal Peleus, to a mortal man, you, that from age and death are both exempt? Was it that you the miseries might share of wretched mortals? For of all that breathe and walk upon the earth, or creep, is not more wretched than the unhappy race of man. Yet shall not ye, nor shall your well-wrought car, by Hector son of Priam, be controlled. I will not suffer it. Enough for him to hold, with vaunting boast, Achilles' arms, but to your limbs and spirits will I impart such strength, that from the battle to the ships ye shall in safety bear Automedon. For yet I will, the Trojans shall prevail, and slay, until they reach the well-manned ships, till sets the sun, and darkness shrouds the earth. He said, and in their breasts fresh spirit infused, they, shaking from their manes the dust, the car amid the Greeks and Trojans lightly bore. Then, as a vulture, mid a flock of geese, amid the battle rushed Automedon, his horses course directing, and their speed exciting, though he mourned his comrades slain. Swiftly he fled from out the Trojan host, swiftly again assailed them in pursuit. Yet, speedy to pursue, he could not slay, nor in the car alone had power at once to guide the flying steeds and hurl the spear. At length a comrade brave, Alcimedon, Laerces' son, beheld. Behind the car he stood, and thus Automedon addressed. Automedon, what god has filled thy mind with counsels vain, and thee of sense bereft, that with the Trojans, in the foremost ranks, thou fain wouldst fight alone, thy comrades slain, while Hector, Proudly on his breast displays the glorious arms of great Iacides. To whom Automedon, Diores' son. Alcimedon, since none of all the Greeks may vie with thee, the metal to control of these immortal horses, save indeed, while yet he lived, Patroclus, godlike chief, but him stern death and fate hath o'ertain. Take thou then the whip and shining reins, while I, descending from the car, engage in fight. He said, and mounting on the war-car straight, Alcimedon the whip and reins assumed. Down leaped Automedon. Great Hector saw and thus addressed Aeneas at his side. 
Aeneas, prince and counsellor of Troy, I see, committed to unskilful hands, Achilles' horses on the battlefield. These we may hope to take, if such thy will, for they, methinks, will scarcely stand opposed, or dare the encounter of our joint assault. He said, and Chyses' valiant son complied. Forward they went, their shoulders covered o'er with stout bull's hide, thick overlaid with brass. With them both Chromius and Aretus went, and high their hopes were raised, the warriors both, to slay and make the strong-necked steeds their prize. Blind fools! nor destined scathless to escape Automedon's encounter. He his prayer to Jove addressed, and straight with added strength his soul was filled. And to Alcimedon, his trusty friend and comrade, thus he spoke. Alcimedon, do thou the horses keep not far away, but breathing on my neck. For Hector's might will not, I deem, be stayed ere us he slay, and mount Achilles' car, and carry terror mid the Grecian host, or in the foremost ranks himself be slain. Thus spoke Automedon, and loudly called on Menelaus and the Ajaces both, Ye two Ajaces, leaders of the host, and Menelaus, with our bravest all, ye on the dead alone your care bestow to guard him and stave off the hostile ranks, but haste, and us, the living, save from death, for Hector and Aeneas hitherward, with weight o'erpowering through the bloody press, the bravest of the Trojans, force their way yet is the issue in the hands of heaven i hurl the spear but jove directs the blow he said and poising hurled the ponderous spear full on aretus's broad-orbed shield it struck nor stayed the shield its course the brazen point drove through the belt, and in his body lodged. As, with sharp axe in hand, a stalwart man, striking behind the horns, a sturdy bull severs the neck, he, forward plunging, falls. So, forward first he sprang, then backwards fell, and quivering in his vitals deep infixed, the sharp spear soon relaxed his limbs in death. Then at Automedon great Hector threw his glittering spear. He saw, and forward stooped, and shunned the brazen death. Behind him far, deep in the soil infixed, with quivering shaft the weapon stood. There Mars its impulse stayed. And now, with swords, and hand to hand, the fight had been renewed. But at their comrades' call, the two Aegises, pressing through the throng, between the warriors interposed in haste. Before them Hector and Aeneas both, and godlike Chromius, in alarm recoiled. Pierced through the heart, Aretus there they left, and, terrible as Mars, Automedon stripped off his arms, and thus exulting cried, Of some small portion of its load of grief for slain Patroclus is my heart relieved in slaying thee, all worthless as thou art, then, throwing on the car the bloody spoils, he mounted, 
hands and feet imbrued with blood, as twere a lion fresh from his repast upon the carcass of a slaughtered bull. Again around Patroclus's body raged the stubborn conflict, direful, sorrow fraught. From heaven descending, Pallas stirred the strife, sent by all-seeing Jove to stimulate the warlike Greeks. So changed was now his will. As o'er the face of heaven, when Jove extends his bright-hued bow, a sign to mortal men of war or wintry storms, which bid surcease the rural works of man and pinch the flocks, so Pallas, in a bright-hued cloud arrayed, passed through the ranks and roused each several man. To noble Menelaus, Atreus's son, who close beside her stood, the goddess first, the form of Phoenix, and his powerful voice assuming, thus her stirring words addressed. On thee, O Menelaus, foul reproach will fasten, if Achilles' faithful friend the dogs devour beneath the walls of Troy. Then hold thou firm, and all the hosts inspire. To whom thus Menelaus, good in fight. O Phoenix, aged warrior, honoured sire, if Pallas would the needful power impart, and o'er me spread her aegis, then would I, undaunted, for Patroclus' rescue fight, for deeply by his death my heart is touched. But valiant Hector, with the strength of fire, still rages, and destruction deals around, for Jove is with him and his triumph wills. He said, the blue-eyed goddess heard with joy that chief of all the gods, her aid he sought. She gave fresh vigor to his arms and knees, and to his breast the boldness of the fly, which, oft repelled by man, renews the assault, incessant, lured by taste of human blood. Such boldness in Atreides' manly breast Pallas inspired. Beside Patroclus's corpse again he stood and poised his glittering spear. There was one, Podes, in the Trojan ranks, son of Aetian, rich of blameless life, of all the people most to Hector dear, and at his table oft a welcome guest. Him, as he turned to fly, beneath the waist Atreides struck. Right through the spear was driven. Thundering he fell, and Atreus's son, the corpse dragged from the Trojans mid the ranks of Greece. Then, close at Hector's side, Apollo stood, clad in the form of Phenops, Asius's son, who in Abydos dwelt. Of all the allies, honoured of Hector most, and best beloved. Clad in his form, the far destroyer spoke. Hector, what other Greek will scare thee next? Who shrinks from Menelaus, heretofore a warrior deemed of no repute, but now, alone, he robs our Trojans of their dead, and in the foremost ranks e'en now hath slain Podes, thine own good friend, Aetian's son. He said, Dark grief o'erclouded Hector's brow. As to the front in dazzling arms he sprang. Then, 
Saturn's son his tasseled aegis waved, all glittering bright, and Ida's lofty head in clouds and darkness shrouded. Then he bade his lightning flash, his volleying thunder roar, that shook the mountain, and with victory crowned the Trojan arms, and panic struck the Greeks. The first who turned to fly was Peneleus, Boeotian chief. Him, facing still the foe, a spear had slightly on the shoulder struck, the bone just grazing. By Polydamus, who close before him stood, the spear was thrown. Then Hector, Leitus, Electrian's son, thrust through the wrist, and quelled his warlike might. Trembling, he looked around, nor hoped again the Trojans, spear in hand, to meet in fight. But onward, as he rushed on Leitus, Idomeneus at Hector threw his spear. Full on his breast it struck, but near the head the sturdy shaft was on the breastplate snapped. Loud was the Trojans' shout, and he, in turn, aimed at Idomeneus, Deucalion's son, upstanding on his car. His mark he missed, but Cyrenus he struck, the charioteer and faithful follower of Meriones, who with him came from Lyctus's thriving town. The chief had left on foot the well-trimmed ships, and, had not Cyrenus his car in haste driven to the rescue, by his fall had given a Trojan triumph. To his lord he brought safety and rescue from unsparing death, but fell himself by Hector's murderous hand. Him Hector struck between the cheek and ear, crashing the teeth and cutting through the tongue. Headlong he fell to earth, and dropped the reins. These, stooping from the car, Meriones caught up, and thus Idomeneus addressed. Ply now the lash, until thou reach the ships. Thyself must see how crushed the strength of Greece. He said, and toward the ships Idomeneus urged his fleet steeds, for fear was on his soul. Nor did not Ajax and Atreides see how, in the Trojans' favor, Saturn's son, the wavering scale of victory, turned. And thus great Ajax Telamon his grief expressed, O oh, heaven, the veriest child might plainly see that Jove the Trojans' triumph has decreed. Their weapons all, by whomsoever thrown, or weak or strong, attain their mark, for Jove directs their course, while ours upon the plain innocuous fall. But take we counsel now, how from the fray to bear away our dead, and by our own return rejoice those friends who look with sorrow on our plight, and deem that we, all powerless to resist the might of Hector's arm, beside the ships must fall. Would that some comrade were at hand to bear a message to Achilles? Him, I ween, as yet the mournful tidings have not reached that on the field his dearest friend lies dead. But such I see not, for a veil of cloud o'er men and horses all around is spread. Remove this cloudy darkness, clear the sky, that we may see our fate, and die at least, if such thy will in the open light of day he said and 
pitying, Jove beheld his tears. The clouds he scattered, and the mist dispersed. The sun shone forth, and all the field was clear. And Ajax thus to Menelaus spoke. Now, heaven-born Menelaus, look around, if haply mid the living thou mayst see Antilochus, the noble Nestor's son, and bid him to Achilles bear in haste the tidings that his dearest friend lies dead. He said, nor did Atrides not comply, but slow as moves a lion from the fold which dogs and youths with ceaseless toil hath worn who all night long have kept their watch to guard from his assault the choicest of the herd he hunger pinched hath oft the attempt renewed but not prevailed by spears on every side and javelins met wielded by stalwart hands and blazing torches which his courage daunt till with the morn he sullenly withdraws so from patroclus with reluctant step atrides moved for much he feared the greeks might to the trojans panic struck the dead abandon and departing he besought the two agesses and meriones Ye two Aegises, and thou, Meriones, remember now our lost Patroclus' gentle courtesy, how kind and genial was his soul to all, while yet he lived, now sunk, alas, in death. Thus saying, Menelaus took his way, Casting his glance around on every side, Like to an eagle, famed of sharpest sight Of all that fly beneath the vault of heaven, Whom, soaring in the clouds, the crouching hare Eludes not, though in leafiest covert hid, But swooping down he rends her life away. So Menelaus, through the ranks of war, Thy piercing glances every way were turned, If Nestor's son alive thou mightst descry. Him on the field's extremest left he found, Cheering his friends, and urging to the fight. He stood beside him, and addressed him thus, Antilochus, come hither, godlike friend, and woeful tidings here, which would to heaven I had not to impart. Thyself thou seest how Jove hath heaped disaster on the Greeks, and victory given to Troy. But one has fallen, our bravest, best, Patroclus, lies in death. And deeply must the Greeks his loss deplore. But haste thee to the ships to peleus's son the tidings bear if haply he may save the body of patroclus from the foe his naked body for his arms are now the prize of hector of the glancing helm he said and at his words antilochus astounded stood Long time his tongue in vain for utterance strove. His eyes were filled with tears. His cheerful voice was mute, yet not the less to Menelaus's bidding gave his care. Swiftly he sped, but to Laodicus his comrade brave, who waited with his car in close attendance, first consigned his arms. Then from the field with active limbs he flew, Weeping, with mournful news to Peleus' son. Nor, noble Menelaus, did thy heart incline thee To remain and aid thy friends, Where from their war-worn ranks 
the Pylian troops deplored the absence of Antilochus. But these, in godlike Thrasymedes' charge, he left, and to Patroclus hastening back beside the aegis he stood, as thus he spoke. Him to Achilles, to the ships in haste, I have dispatched. Yet fiercely as his wrath may burn toward Hector, I can scarce expect his presence here. For how could he unarmed with Trojans fight? But take we counsel now how from the field to bear away our dead, and scape ourselves from death by Trojan hands. Whom answered thus great Ajax Telamon? Illustrious Menelaus, all thy words are just and true. Then from amid the press thou and Meriones take up in haste and bear away the body, while behind we two, in heart united, as in name, who side by side have still been wont to fight, will Hector and his Trojans hold at bay. He said, they, lifting in their arms the corpse, upraised it high in air. Then from behind loud yelled the Trojans, as they saw the Greeks retiring with their dead. And on they rushed, as dogs that in advance of hunter youths pursue a wounded boar. A while they run, eager for blood, but when, in pride of strength, he turns upon them, backward they recoil, this way and that, in fear of death dispersed. So onward pressed a while the Trojan crowd, with thrust of swords and double-pointed spears. But ever, as the agencies turned to bay, their colour changed to pale. Not one so bold as dashing on to battle for the corpse. Thus they, with anxious care, from off the field bore toward the ships their dead. But on their track came sweeping on the storm of battle, fierce as on a sudden breaking forth the fire seizes some populous city and devours house after house amid the glare and blaze while roar the flames before the gusty wind so fiercely pressed upon the greeks retreat the clattering tramp of steeds and armed men but as the mules with stubborn strength endued that down the mountain through the trackless waste drag some huge log or timber for the ships and spent with toil and sweat still labour on unflinching so the greeks with patient toil bore on their dead the agencies in their rear stemming the war as stems the torrent's force some wooded cliff far stretching o'er the plain checking the mighty river's rushing stream and flinging it aside upon the plain itself unbroken by the strength of flood so firmly in the rear the agencies stemmed the trojan force yet these still onward pressed and mid their comrades proudly eminent two chiefs aeneas old anchises's son and glorious hector in the van were seen then as a cloud of starlings or of daws fly screaming as they see the hawk approach to lesser birds the messenger of death so before hector and aeneas fled screaming forgetful of their warlike fame the sons of greece and scattered here and there around the ditch lay store of goodly arms by greeks abandoned in their hasty flight. Yet still unintermitted raged the war. End of Book 17
Book eighteen of the Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. Argument The Grief of Achilles and New Armor Made by Him by Vulcan. The news of the death of Patroclus is brought to Achilles by Antilochus. Thetis, hearing his lamentations, comes with all her sea nymphs to comfort him. The speeches of the mother and son on this occasion. Iris appears to Achilles by command of Juno, and orders him to show himself at the head of the entrenchments. The sight of him turns the fortune of the day and the body of Patroclus is carried off by the Greeks. The Trojans call a council, where Hector and Polydamus disagree in their opinions, but the advice of the former prevails to remain encamped in the field. The Grief of Achilles over the Body of Patroclus Thetis goes to the palace of Vulcan to obtain new arms for her son. The description of the wonderful works of Vulcan, and lastly that noble one of the shield of Achilles. The latter part of the nine and twentieth day, and the night ensuing, take up this book. The scene is at Achilles's tent on the seashore, from whence it changes to the palace of Vulcan. Thus, furious as the rage of fire, they fought. Meantime, Antilochus, to Peleus's son, swift-footed messenger, his tidings bore. Him by the high-beaked ships he found, his mind the event presaging, filled with anxious thoughts. As thus he communed with his mighty heart. Alas, what means it that the long-haired Greeks, Chased from the plain, are thronging round the ships? Let me not now, ye gods, endure the grief My mother once foretold, that I should live To see the bravest of the Myrmidons cut off by Trojans from the light of day. Menetius's noble son has surely fallen. Foolhardy! Yet I warned him, and besought, soon as the ships from hostile fires were safe, back to return, nor Hector's onset meet. While in his mind and spirits thus he mused, beside him stood the noble Nestor's son, and, weeping, thus his mournful message gave. Alas, great son of Peleus, woeful news, which would to heaven I had not to impart, to thee I bring. Patroclus lies in death. And o'er his body now the war is waged. His naked body, for his arms, Are now the prize of Hector, of the glancing helm. He said, and darkest clouds of grief O'erspread Achilles' brow. With both his hands he seized and poured upon his face the grimy dust marring his graceful visage, and defiled with blackening ashes all his costly robes. Stretched in the dust his lofty stature lay, as with his hands his flowing locks he tore. Loud was the wailing of the female band, Achilles and Patroclus's prize of war, 
as round Achilles, rushing out of doors, beating their breasts with tottering limbs, they pressed. In tears beside him stood Antilochus, and in his own Achilles' hand he held, groaning in spirit, fearful lest for grief in his own bosom he should sheath his sword. Loud were his moans. His goddess mother heard beside her aged father where she sat in the deep ocean caves. She heard and wept. The Nereids all in ocean's depths who dwell encircled her around Cymodice, Nisie, Spio, and Simothy, the stag-eyed Halia, and Amphithy, Actia, Limnoria, Melite, Taurus, and Galatea, Panope. There too were Oreithia, Clymene, and Amathia, with the golden hair, and all the denizens of ocean's depths. Filled was the glassy cave. In unison they beat their breasts, as Thetis led the wail. Give ear, my sister Nereids, all, and learn how deep the grief that in my breast I bear. Me, miserable, me, of noblest son, unhappiest mother, me, a son who bore my brave, my beautiful, of heroes chief, like a young tree he throve. I tended him in a rich vineyard as the choicest plant, till in the beaked ships I sent him forth to war with Troy. Him ne'er shall I behold, returning home, in aged Peleus' house. E'en while he lives and sees the light of day, he lives in sorrow. Nor, to soothe his grief, my presence can avail. Yet will I go, that I may see my dearest child, and learn what grief hath reached him from the war, Withdrawn, she said, and left the cave. With her they went, weeping. Before them parted the ocean wave, but when they reached the fertile shore of Troy, in order due they landed on the beach, where, frequent, round Achilles swift of foot, were moored the vessels of the Myrmidons. There, as he groaned aloud, beside him stood his goddess mother. Weeping in her hands, she held his head. While pitying, thus she spoke. Why weeps my son? And what his cause of grief? Speak out, and not conceal. For all thy prayer, with which uplifted hands thou madest to Jove, he hath fulfilled, that, flying to their ships, the routed sons of Greece shall feel how much they need thine aid, and mourn their insults past. To whom Achilles, deeply groaning, thus, Mother, all this indeed hath Jove fulfilled. Yet what avails it, since my dearest friend is slain, Patroclus, whom I honoured most of all my comrades, loved him as my soul? Him have I lost, and Hector from his corpse hath stripped those arms, those weighty, beauteous arms, a marvel to behold, which from the gods Peleus received, a glorious gift, that day when they consigned thee 
to a mortal's bed. How better were it if thy lot had been still mid the ocean deities to dwell, and Peleus had espoused a mortal bride. For now is bitter grief for thee in store, mourning thy son, whom to his home returned thou never more shalt see. Nor would I wish to live and move amid my fellow men, unless that Hector, vanquished by my spear, may lose his forfeit life and pay the price of foul dishonour to Patroclus done. To whom her tears o'erflowing, Thetis thus. E'en as thou sayst, my son, thy term is short, nor long shall Hector's fate precede thine own. Achilles, answering, spoke in passionate grief. Would I might die this hour, who failed to save my comrade slain. Far from his native land he died, sore needing my protecting arm. And I, who ne'er again must see my home, nor to Patroclus, nor the many Greeks whom Hector's hand hath slain, have rendered aid. But idly here I sit, cumbering the ground, I who amid the Greeks no equal own in fight, to others in debate I yield. Accursed of gods and men be hateful strife and anger, which to violence provokes e'en temperate souls, though sweeter be its taste than dropping honey in the heart of man, swelling like smoke, such anger in my soul hath Agamemnon kindled, king of men. But pass we that, though still my heart be sore, yet will I school my angry spirit down. In search of Hector now, of him who slew my friend, I go. Prepared to meet my death when Jove shall will it, and the immortals all. From death, not e'en the might of Hercules, though best beloved of Saturn's son, could fly by fate and Juno's bitter wrath subdued. I too, since such my doom, must lie in death. Yet, ere I die, immortal fame will win, and from their delicate cheeks, deep-bosomed dames, Dardan and Trojan, bitter tears shall wipe, and groan in anguish. Then shall all men know how long I have been absent from the field. Then, though thou love me, Seek not from the war to stay my steps, for bootless were thy speech. Whom answered thus the silver-footed queen? True are thy words, my son, and good it is, and commendable, from the stroke of death to save a worsted comrade. But thine arms... Thy brazen flashing arms the Trojans hold. Them Hector of the glancing helm himself bears on his breast, exulting. Yet not long shall be his triumph, for his doom is nigh. But thou engage not in the toils of war, until thine eyes again behold me here. For with tomorrow's sun will I return, with arms of heavenly mould, by Vulcan wrought. Thus saying, from her son she turned away, 
and turning to her sister Nereids spoke. Back to the spacious bosom of the deep retire ye now, and to my father's house, the aged ocean god, your tidings bear, while I to high Olympus speed to crave at Vulcan's hand the skilled artificer a boon of dazzling armour for my son. She said, and they beneath the ocean wave descended, while to high Olympus sped the silver-footed goddess, thence in hope to bear the dazzling armour to her son. She to Olympus sped, the Greeks, meanwhile, before the warrior-slayer Hector, fled with wild, tumultuous uproar, till they reached their vessels and the shore of Hellespont. Nor had the well-grieved Greeks, Achilles' friend Patroclus, from amid the fray withdrawn. For close upon him followed horse and man, and Hector, son of Priam, fierce as flame. Thrice noble Hector, seizing from behind, sought by the feet to drag away the dead, cheering his friends. Thrice, clad in warlike might, the two Aegises drove him from his prey. Yet, fearless in his strength, now rushing on, he dashed amid the fray, now shouting loud, stood firm, but backward not a step retired. As from a carcass herdsmen strive in vain to scare a tawny lion, hunger pinched, e'en so the Aegises, mail-clad warriors, failed the son of Priam from the corpse to scare. And now the body had he borne away with endless fame. But from Olympus's height came storm-swift Iris down to Peleus's son, and bade him don his arms, by Juno sent, unknown to Jove and to the immortals all. She stood behind him and addressed him thus, up, son of Peleus, up, thou prince of men! Haste to Patroclus's rescue, whom around before the ships is waged a fearful war with mutual slaughter, these the dead defending, and those to Ilium's breezy heights intent to bear the body. Noble Hector, chief, who longs to sever from the tender neck, and fix upon the spikes thy comrade's head. Up, then! Delay no longer. Deem it shame Patroclus's corpse should glut the dogs of Troy, dishonouring thee, if aught dishonouring him. Whom answered thus Achilles, swift of foot, Say, heavenly Iris, of the immortal gods, Who bade thee seek me, and this message bring? To whom swift Iris thus? To thee I come, by Juno sent, The imperial wife of Jove, Unknown to Saturn's son, And all the gods who on Olympus's snowy summit dwell. To whom again Achilles swift of foot. How in the battle toil can I engage? My arms are with the Trojans, and to boot my mother warned me not to arm for fight, till I again should see her, for she hoped to bring me heavenly arms by Vulcan wrought. Nor know I well whose armour I could wear, save the broad shield of Ajax Telamon, and he, methinks, amidst the foremost ranks, even now, 
is fighting o'er Patroclus' corpse. Whom answered storm-swift Iris, Well we know thy glorious arms are by the Trojans held, but go thou forth, and from above the ditch appear before them. Daunted at the sight, haply the Trojans may forsake the field, and breathing time afford the sons of Greece, toil-worn, for little pause has yet been theirs. Swift Iris said, and vanished. Then uprose Achilles, dear to Jove, and Pallas threw her tasseled aegis o'er his shoulders broad, his head encircling with a coronet of golden cloud, whence fiery flashes gleamed. As from an island city up to heaven the smoke ascends, which hostile forces round beleaguer, and all that day with cruel war from its own state cut off. But when the sun hath set, blaze frequent forth the beacon fires, high rise the flames, and to the dwellers round their signal flash, if haply o'er the sea may come the needful aid, so brightly flashed that fiery light around Achilles' head. He left the wall, and stood above the ditch, but from the Greeks apart, remembering well his mother's prudent counsel. There he stood, and shouted loudly. Pallas joined her voice, and filled with terror, all the Trojan host. Clear as the trumpet's sound, which calls to arms some town, encompassed round with hostile bands, rang out the voice of great Aesides. But when Achilles' voice of brass they heard, they quailed in spirit. The sleek-skinned steeds themselves, conscious of coming ill, bore back the cars. Their charioteers, dismayed, beheld the flame, which, kindled by the blue-eyed goddess, blazed unquenched around the head of Peleus's son. Thrice shouted from the ditch the godlike chief, thrice terror struck both Trojans and allies, and there and then beside their chariots fell twelve of their bravest, while the Greeks well pleased Patroclus's body from the fray withdrew, and on a litter laid. Around him stood his comrades mourning. With them Peleus's son, shedding hot tears, as on his friend he gazed, laid on the bier, and pierced with deadly wounds. Him to the war, with horses and with cars, he sent, but ne'er to welcome his return. By stag-eyed Juno sent, reluctant sank the unwearied sun beneath the ocean wave. The sun had set, and breathed a while the Greeks from the fierce labourers of the balanced field. Nor less the Trojans, from the stubborn fight retiring, loosed their steeds. But ere they shared the evening meal, they met in council. All stood up, none dared to sit, for fear had fallen on all, when reappeared Achilles, from the battle long withdrawn. First Panthous' son, the sage Polydemus, addressed the assembly. His sagacious mind alone beheld the future and the past. The friend of Hector, born the self-same night, one in debate, the other best in arms. 
who thus with prudent speech began, and said, Be well advised, my friends, my counsel is, that we regain the city, nor the morn, here in the plain, beside the ships, await, so far removed from our protecting walls, while fiercely burned against Atreus's godlike son, that mighty warrior's wrath, twas easier far with the other Greeks to deal, and I rejoiced when by the ships we passed the night, in hopes we soon might call them ours. But now, I own, Achilles, swift of foot, excites my fear. His proud, impetuous spirit will spur the plain, where Greeks and Trojans oft in warlike strife their balanced strength exert. If he come forth, our fight will be to guard our homes and wives. Gain we the city, trust me, so twere best. Now, for a while, ambrosial night detains the son of Peleus. But at early morn, if issuing forth in arms he find us here, his prowess we shall know. And happy he who, flying, shall in safety reach the walls of sacred Troy, for many a Trojan slain shall feed the vultures. Heaven, avert such fate! But if, though loth, ye will by me be ruled, this night in council husband we our strength while towers and lofty gates, and folding doors close joined, well fitting, shall our city guard. Then, issuing forth in arms at early morn, man we the towers. So harder were his task, if, from the ships advancing, round the wall he offer battle, bootless to return his strong-necked horses, worn with labour vain in coursing, purposeless, around the town. To force an entrance, or the town destroy, is not his aim. And ere that end be gained, the dogs of Troy upon his flesh shall feed. To whom thus Hector of the glancing helm with stern regard. Polydamus, thy words are such as great unkindly on mine ear, who fain wouldst have us to the walls retire. What, have ye not already long enough been cooped within the towers? The wealth of Troy, its brass, its gold, where once the common theme of every tongue our hoarded treasures now are gone to Phrygian and Meonian shores, for sale exported, costly merchandise, since on our city fell the wrath of Jove. And now, when deep-designing Saturn's son, such glory gives me as to gain the ships, and, crowded by the sea, hem in the Greeks? <laughs> Fool! Put not thou these timid counsels forth, which none will follow, nor will I allow. But hear ye all, and do as I advise. Share now the meal, by ranks throughout the host. Then set your watch, and each keep careful guard, and whom his spoils o'erload, if such there be. Let him divide them with the general crowd, better that they should hold them than the Greeks. And with the morn, in arms beside the ships, will we again awake the furious war. But if indeed Achilles by the ships hath reappeared, himself, if so he choose, shall be the sufferer, from the perilous strife I will not shrink, but his encounter meet. So he, 
or I shall gain immortal fame. Impartial Mars hath oft the slayer slain. Thus Hector spoke. The Trojans cheered aloud. Fools! And by Pallas of their sense bereft, who all applauded Hector's ill advice, none the sage counsel of Polydamus. Then through the camp they shared the evening meal. Meantime the Greeks all night with tears and groans bewailed Patroclus. On his comrade's breast Achilles laid his murder-dealing hands, and led with bitter groans the loud lament. As when the hunters in the forest's depth have robbed a bearded lion of his cubs, to late arriving, he with anger chafes, then follows, if perchance he may o'ertake, through many a mountain glen, the hunter's steps, with grief and fury filled, so Peleus's son, with bitter groans, the Myrmidons addressed. Vain was, alas, the promise which I gave, seeking the brave Menetius to console, to bring to Opus back his gallant son, Rich with his share of spoil from Troy o'erthrown. But Jove fulfills not all that man designs. For us hath fate decreed that here in Troy we too one soil should redden with our blood. Nor me returning to my native land shall aged Peleus in his halls receive, nor Thetis. Here must earth retain my bones. But since, Patroclus, I am doomed on earth behind thee to remain, thy funeral rites I will not celebrate till Hector's arms and head Thy haughty slayers, here I bring, and on thy pyre twelve noble sons of Troy will sacrifice in vengeance of thy death. Thou by our beaked ships till then must lie, and weeping o'er thee shall deep-bosomed dames, Trojan and Dardan, Mourn both night and day, the prizes of our toil, when wealthy towns before our valour and our spears have fallen. He said, and bade his comrades on the fire an ample tripod place, without delay, to cleanse Patroclus from the bloody gore. They, on the burning fire, the tripod placed, with water filled, and kindled wood beneath. Around the bellying tripod rose the flames, heating the bath. Within the glittering brass, soon as the water boiled, they washed the corpse, with lysome oils anointing, and the wounds with fragrant ointments filled of nine years old. Then, in fine linen, they the body wrapped from head to feet, and laid it on a couch, and covered over with a fair white sheet. All night around Achilles, swift of foot, the Myrmidons, with tears, Patroclus mourned. To Juno, then, his sister and his wife, thus Saturn's son. At length thou hast thy will, imperial Juno, 
who hast stirred to war Achilles, swift of foot. Well might one deem these long-haired Greeks from thee derived their birth. To whom in answer thus the stag-eyed queen. What words, dread son of Saturn, dost thou speak? E'en man, though mortal, and inferior to us in wisdom, might so much effect against his fellow man? Then how should I, by double title chief of goddesses, first by my birth, and next because thy wife I boast thee, thine, or all the gods supreme, not work my vengeance on the Trojan race. Such converse, while they held, to Vulcan's house immortal, star-like bright, among the gods, unrivaled, all of brass, by Vulcan's self constructed, sped the silver-footed queen. Him, sweltering at his forge, she found, intent on forming twenty tripods, which should stand the walls surrounding of his well-built house. With golden wheels beneath he furnished each, and to the assembly of the gods endued with power to move spontaneous and return, a marvel to behold. Thus far his work he had completed, but not yet had fixed the rich-wrought handles. These his labor now engaged to fit them, and to rivet fast. While thus he exercised his practiced skill, the silver-footed queen approached the house. Charis, the skillful artist's wedded wife, beheld her coming and advanced to meet, and as her hand she clasped, addressed her thus. Say, Thetis of the flowing robe, beloved and honoured, whence this visit to our house, a nun accustomed guest? But come thou in, that I may welcome thee with honour due. Thus, as she spoke, the goddess led her in, and on a seat with silver studs adorned, fair, richly wrought, a footstool at her feet, she bade her sit. Then thus to Vulcan called, Haste hither, Vulcan, Thetis asks thine aid. Whom answered thus the skilled artificer, an honoured and a venerated guest our house contains, who saved me once from woe, when, by my mother's act, from heaven I fell, who, for that I was crippled in my feet, deemed it not shame to hide me. Hard had then my fortune been, had not Euronymy and Thetis in their bosoms sheltered me, Eurynome, from old Oceanus, who drew her birth the ever-circling flood. Nine years with them I dwelt, and many a work I fashioned there, of metal, clasps, and chains, of spiral coil, rich cups, and colors fair, hid in a cave profound, where the ocean stream with ceaseless murmur foamed and moaned around, unknown to god poor man but to those two who saved me thetis and eurynome now to my house hath fair-haired thetis come to her my life preserved its tribute owes then thou the hospitable rites perform while i my bellows and my tools lay by he said and from the anvil reared upright his massive strength, 
and as he limped along, his tottering knees were bowed beneath his weight. The bellows from the fire he next withdrew, and in a silver casket placed his tools. Then with a sponge his brows and lusty arms he wiped, and sturdy neck and hairy chest. He donned his robe, and took his weighty staff. There waited on their king the attendant maids, in form as living maids, but wrought in cold, instinct, with consciousness, with voice endued, and strength, and skill from heavenly teachers drawn. These waited, duteous, at the monarch's side, his steps supporting. He, with halting gait, passed to a gorgeous chair by Thetis's side, and, as her hand he clasped, addressed her thus. Say, Thetis, of the flowing robe, beloved and honoured, whence this visit to our house, an unaccustomed guest? Say what thy will, and if within my power, esteem it done. To whom in answer, that is, weeping thus. Vulcan, of all the goddesses who dwell on high Olympus, lives there one whose soul hath borne such weight of woe, so many griefs, as Saturn's son hath heaped on me alone? Me, whom he chose from all the sea-born nymphs, and gave to Peleus, son of Aeacus, his subject. I endured a mortal's bed, though sore against my will. He now, bent down by feeble age, lies helpless in his house. Now adds he a farther grief. He granted me to bear and rear a son of heroes chief. Like a young tree he throve. I tended him in a rich vineyard as the choicest plant, till in the beaked ships I sent him forth to war with Troy. Him ne'er shall I receive returning home in aged Peleus's house. E'en while he lives, and sees the light of day, he lives in sorrow. Nor to soothe his grief my presence can avail. A girl, his prize selected for him by the sons of Greece, great Agamemnon, rested from his arms, in grief and rage he pined his soul away. Then by the Trojans were the Greeks hemmed in beside their ships, and from within their camp no outlet found. The Grecian elders then implored his aid, and promised costly gifts. With his own hand to save them he refused, but in his armor clad to battle sent his friend, Patroclus, with a numerous band. All day they fought before the sea and gates, and in that day had Ilium be destroyed. But in the van, Menetius's noble son, after great deeds achieved, Apollo slew, and crowned with glory Hector, Priam's son. Therefore a supplicant to thy knees I come, if to my son, to early death condemned, thou wilt accord the boon of shield and helm, and well-wrought greaves, with silver clasps secured, and breastplate. For his own, his faithful friend, by Trojan hands subdued, hath lost, and he, o'erwhelmed with grief, lies prostrate on the earth. Whom answered thus the skilled artificer? Take comfort, nor let this disturb thy mind. 
would that as surely when his hour shall come i could defend him from the stroke of death as i can undertake that his shall be such arms as they shall marvel who behold he left her thus and to his forge returned the fellows then directing to the fire he bade them work through twenty pipes at once forthwith they poured their diverse tempered blasts now briskly seconding his eager haste now at his will and as the work required the stubborn brass and tin and precious gold and silver first he melted in the fire then on its stand his weighty anvil placed and with one hand the hammer's ponderous weight he wielded while the other grasped the tongs and first a shield he fashioned vast and strong with rich adornment circled with a rim threefold bright gleaming whence a silver belt depended of five folds the shield was formed and on its surface many a rare design of curious art his practised skill had wrought thereon were figured earth and sky and sea the ever-circling sun and full-orbed moon and all the signs that crown the vault of heaven pleiads and hyads and orion's might and arctos called the wain who wheels on high his circling course and on orion waits sole star that never bathes in the ocean waves and two fair populous towns were sculptured there in one where marriage pomp and revelry and brides in gay procession through the streets with blazing torches from their chambers borne while frequent rose the hymeneal song youths whirled around in joyous dance with sound of flute and harp and standing at their doors admiring women on the pageant gazed meanwhile a busy throng the forum filled there between two a fierce contention rose about a death fine to the public one appealed asserting to have paid the whole while one denied that he had aught received both were desirous that before the judge the issue should be tried with noisy shouts their several partisans encouraged each the heralds stilled the tumult of the crowd on polished chairs in solemn circle sat the reverend elders in their hands they held the loud-voiced herald's sceptres waving these they heard the alternate pleadings in the midst two talents lay of gold which he should take who should before him prove his righteous cause before the second town two armies lay in arms refulgent to destroy the town the assailants threatened or among themselves of all the wealth within the city stored an equal half as ransom to divide the terms rejecting the defenders manned a secret ambush on the walls they placed women and children mustered for defence and men by age enfeebled forth they went by mars and pallas led these wrought in gold in golden arms arrayed above the crowd for beauty and stature as befitting gods conspicuous shone of lesser height the rest but when the destined ambuscade was reached beside the river where the shepherds drove their flocks and herds to water down they lay in glittering arms accoutred and apart 
they placed two spies to notify betimes the approach of flocks and sheep and lowing herds. These in two shepherds' charge ere long appeared, who, unsuspecting as they moved along, enjoyed the music of their pastoral pipes. They, on the booty from afar discerned, sprang from their ambuscade, and cutting off the herds and fleecy flocks, their guardians slew. Their comrades heard the tumult, where they sat before their sacred altars, and forthwith sprang on their cars, with fast-stepping steeds, pursued the plunderers, and o'ertook them soon. There, on the river's bank, they met in arms, and at each other hurled their brazen spears. And there were figured strife, and tumult wild, and deadly fate, who in her iron grasp one newly wounded, one unwounded bore, while by the feet from out the press she dragged another slain. About her shoulders hung a garment crimsoned with the blood of men. Like living men they seemed to move, to fight, to drag away the bodies of the slain. And there was graven a wide extended plain of fallow land, rich, fertile, mellow soil, thrice ploughed, where many ploughmen up and down their teams were driving, and as each attained the limit of the field, would one advance and tender him a cup of generous wine. Then would he turn, and to the end again along the furrow cheerly drive his plough, and still behind them darker showed the soil, the true presentment of a new ploughed field, though wrought in gold, a miracle of art. There too was graven a cornfield, rich in grain, where with sharp sickles reapers plied their task, and thick in even swathe the trusses fell, the binders following close the bundles tied. Three were the binders, and behind them boys, in close attendance waiting, in their arms gathered the bundles, and in order piled amid them, staff in hand, in silence stood. The king, rejoicing in the plenteous swathe, a little way removed, the heralds slew a sturdy ox, and now beneath an oak prepared the feast, while women mixed hard by, while barley porridge for the laborers meal, and with rich clusters laden there was graven a vineyard fair of gold, of glossy black the bunches were, on silver poles sustained. Around a darksome trench, beyond a fence was wrought of shining tin, and through it led one only path by which the bearers passed, who gathered in the vineyard's bounteous store. There maids and youths in joyous spirits bright, in woven baskets, bore the luscious fruit. A boy, amid them, with a clear-toned harp, drew lovely music, while his liquid voice the strings accompanied. They all with dance and song harmonies joined, and joyous shouts, as the gay bevy lightly tripped along. Of straight-horned cattle, too, a herd was graven, of gold and tin the heifers all were wrought. They, to the pasture, from the cattle-yard, with gentle lowings, by a babbling stream where quivering reed-beds rustled, slowly moved. Four golden shepherds walked beside the herd, by nine swift dogs attended. Then amid the foremost heifers sprang two lions fierce upon the lordly bull. He, bellowing loud, was dragged along by dogs and youths pursued. 
the tough bull's hide they tore, and gorging lapped the intestines and dark blood. With vain attempt the herdsmen, following closely, to the attack cheered their swift dogs. These shunned the lion's jaws, and close around them baying held aloof. And there the skilful artist's hands had traced a pastaro broad, with fleecy flocks o'erspread, in a fair glade, with fold and tents and pens. There, too, the skilful artist's hand had wrought, with curious workmanship, a mazy dance, like that which Daedalus in Gnosis, erst at fair-haired Ariadne's bidding framed. There, laying each on other's wrists their hand, bright youths and many suitored maidens danced, in fair white linen these, in tunics those, well woven, shining soft with fragrant oils. These with fair coronets were crowned, while those with golden swords from silver belts were girt. Now whirled they round with nimble practised feet, easy, as when a potter seated turns a wheel, new fashioned by his skilful hand, and spins it round to prove if true it run. Now featly moved in well-beseeming ranks, a numerous crowd around the lovely dance surveyed, delighted, while an honoured bard sang as he struck the lyre, and to the strain two tumblers in the midst were whirling round. About the margin of the massive shield was wrought the mighty strength of the ocean stream. The shield completed, vast and strong, he forged a breastplate, dazzling bright as a flame of fire, and next a weighty helmet for his head, fair, richly wrought, with crest of gold above, then last, well-fitting greaves of pliant tin. The skilled artificer, his works complete, before Achilles' goddess mother laid. She, like a falcon from the snow-clad heights of huge Olympus, darted swiftly down, charged with the glittering arms by Vulcan wrought. End of Book 18Book 19 of The Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The reader, Michael Armenta. Argument. The Reconciliation of Achilles and Agamemnon. Thetis brings to her son the armor made by Vulcan. She preserves the body of his friend from corruption, and commands him to assemble the army, to declare his resentment at an end. Agamemnon and Achilles are solemnly reconciled. The speeches, presents, and ceremonies on that occasion. Achilles is with great difficulty persuaded to refrain from the battle till the troops have refreshed themselves, by the advice of Ulysses. The presents are conveyed to the tent of Achilles, where Briseis laments over the body of Patroclus. The hero obstinately refuses all repast, and gives himself up to lamentations for his friend. Minerva descends to strengthen him by the order of Jupiter. He arms for the fight, his appearance described. He addresses himself to his horses, and reproaches them with the death of Patroclus. One of them is miraculously endued with voice, and inspired to prophesy his fate. But the hero, not astonished by that prodigy, rushes with fury 
to the combat. The thirtieth day. The scene is on the seashore. Now morn in saffron robe from the ocean stream ascending, light diffused o'er gods and men, as Thetis to the ships returning bore the gift of Vulcan. There her son she found, who o'er Patroclus hung in bitter grief. Around him mourned his comrades. In the midst she stood, and clasped his hand, as thus she spoke. Leave we, my son, though deep our grief, the dead, here let him lie, since heaven hath doomed his fall. But thou, these arms receive, by Vulcan sent, fairer than e'er on mortal breast were born. The arms before Achilles, as she spoke, the goddess laid. Loud rang the wondrous work. With awe the Myrmidons beheld, nor dared affront the sight. But as Achilles gazed, more fiery burned his wrath. Beneath his brows his eyes like lightning flashed. With fierce delight he seized the glorious gift, and when his soul had feasted on the miracle of art, to Thetis thus his winged words addressed. Mother, the god hath given me arms indeed, worthy a god, and such as mortal man could never forge. I go to arm me straight, yet fear I for Menetius' noble son, lest in his spear inflicted wounds the flies may gender worms, and desecrate the dead, and, life extinct, corruption reach his flesh. Whom answered thus the silver-footed queen? Let not such fears, my son, disturb thy mind. I will myself the swarms of flies disperse, that on the flesh of slaughtered warriors prey. And should he here remain a year complete, still should his flesh be firm and fresh as now. But thou to counsel call the chiefs of Greece, against the monarch Agamemnon there, the leader of the host, Abjure thy wrath. Then arm thee quickly, and put on thy might. Her words with dauntless courage filled his breast. She, in Patroclus' nostrils, to preserve his flesh, red nectar and ambrosia poured. Along the ocean beach Achilles passed, and loudly shouting, called on all the chiefs. Then all who heretofore remained on board, the steersmen, who the vessel's rudders hold, the very stewards that served the daily bread, all to the assembly thronged, when reappeared Achilles, from the fight so long withdrawn. Two noble chiefs, Two ministers of Mars, Ulysses sage, and valiant Diomed, appeared, yet crippled by their grievous wounds, their halting steps supporting with their spears, and on the foremost seats their places took. Next followed Agamemnon, king of men, he also wounded, for Antenor's son, Coan had stabbed him in the stubborn fight. When all the Greeks were closely thronged around, up rose Achilles, swift of foot, and said, Great son of Atreus, what hath been the gain to thee or me, since heart-consuming strife hath fiercely raged between us for a girl? 
who would to heaven had died by Diane's shafts that day when from Lyrnissus captured town I bore her off, so had not many a Greek bitten the bloody dust by hostile hands subdued, while I in anger stood aloof. Great was the gain to Troy, but Greeks, methinks, will long retain the memory of our feud. Yet pass we that, and though our hearts be sore, still let us school our angry spirits down. My wrath I here abjure. It is not meet it burn for ever unappeased. Do thou muster to battle straight the long-haired Greeks, that to the Trojans once again opposed I may make trial. If beside the ships they dare this night remain, but he, I ween, will gladly rest his limbs who safe shall fly, my spear escaping from the battlefield. He said, the well-grieved Greeks rejoiced to hear his wrath abjured by Peleus's godlike son and from his seat, not standing in the midst, thus to the assembly Agamemnon spoke. Friends, Grecian heroes, ministers of Mars, when one stands up to speak, tis meet for all to lend a patient ear, nor interrupt, for in to practice the speaker's hard the task. But in this vast assembly, who can speak that all may hear? The clearest voice must fail. To Peleus's son Achilles, I my mind will frankly open. Ye among yourselves, impart the words I speak, that all may know. Oft hath this matter been by Greeks discussed and I their frequent censure have incurred. Yet was not I the cause, but Jove, and fate, and gloomy Erinys, who combined to throw a strong delusion o'er my mind, that day I robbed Achilles of his lawful prize. What could I do? A goddess all o'erruled, daughter of Jove, Dread Ate, baleful power, misleading all. With lightest step she moves, not on the earth, but o'er the heads of men, with blighting touch, and many hath caused to err. E'en Jove, the wisest deemed of gods and men, in error she involved, when Juno's art by female stratagem, the god deceived when in well-girdled Thebes Alcmena lay in travail of the might of Hercules. In boastful tone amid the gods he spoke, Hear all ye gods and all ye goddesses, the words I speak, the promptings of my soul. This day, Lucina, shall to light bring forth a child the future lord of all around of mortal men who trace to me their blood whom answered juno thus with deep deceit thou dost but feign nor wilt fulfil thy word come now olympian Swear a solemn oath that he shall be the lord of all around, who on this day shall be of woman born of mortal men, who trace to thee their blood. She said, and Jove, the snare unseeing, swore a solemn oath, but found his error soon, down from Olympus's height she sped in haste to Argos of Achaea, for the wife of Sthenelus, the son of Perseus. There she knew was seven months pregnant of a son, 
whom, though untimely born, she brought to light, staying, meanwhile, Alcmena's labor pangs. To Saturn's son herself the tidings brought, and thus addressed him. Jove, the lightning's lord, I bring thee news, this day, a mighty man, by thee ordained to be the Argive's king, is born. Eurystheus, son of Sthenelus, the son of Perseus, issue of thy blood. Well worthy he to be the Argives' king. She said, keen sorrow deeply pierced his soul. Then Ate, by the glossy locks he seized in mighty wrath, and swore a solemn oath that to Olympus and the starry heaven she never should return, who all misleads. His arm then, whirling from the starry heaven, he flung her down to vex the affairs of men. Yet oft her fraud remembered he with groans, when by Eurystheus's hard commands he saw to servile tasks his noble son. So oft as Hector of the glancing helm beside the ships the Greeks to slaughter gave, back to my mind my former error came. I erred, for Jove my judgment took away. But friendly reconcilement now I seek, and tender costly presents. Then thyself uprouse thee, and excite the rest to arms, while I prepare the gifts, whate'er of late the sage Ulysses promised in thy tent, or if thou wilt, though eager for the fray. Remain thou here a while, till from my ship my followers bring the gifts, that thou mayst see I make my offerings with no niggard hand. Whom answered thus Achilles, swift of foot. Most mighty Agamemnon, king of men, the gifts thou deemst befitting, tis for thee to give or to withhold. But now at once prepare we for the battle, Tis not meet on trivial pretexts here to waste our time, or idly loiter. Much remains to do. Again be seen Achilles in the van, scattering with brazen spear the Trojan ranks. And ye forget not man with man to fight. To whom in answer sage ulysses thus brave as thou art achilles godlike chief yet fasting lead not forth the sons of greece to fight the trojans for no little time will last the struggle when the serried ranks are once engaged in conflict and the gods with equal courage either side inspire but bid them by the ships of food and wine, wherein our strength and courage, first partake, for none throughout the day till set of sun, fasting from food, may bear the toils of war. His spirit may still be eager for the fray, yet are his limbs by slow degrees weighed down, himself by thirst and hunger worn, his knees unable as he moves, to bear his weight. But he, who first with food and wine refreshed, all day maintains the combat with the foe, his spirit retains unbroken, and his limbs unwearied, till both armies quit the field. Disperse then now the crowd, and bid prepare the morning meal. Meantime, 
to public view let agamemnon king of men display his costly gifts that all the greeks may see and that thy heart within thee melts with joy and there in full assembly let him swear a solemn oath that he hath ne'er approached the fair briseis's bed nor held with her such intercourse as man with woman holds be thou propitious and accept his oath then at a sumptuous banquet in his tent let him receive thee that thine honour due may nothing lack and so atrides thou shalt stand in sight of all men clear of blame for none can wonder that insulting speech should rouse the anger of a sceptred king to whom thus agamemnon king of men son of laertes i accept thy speech with cordial welcome all that thou hast said is well and wisely spoken for the oath i am prepared with willing mind to swear nor in the sight of heaven will be forsworn let then achilles here a while remain though eager for the fray ye too remain until the presence from my tent be brought and we our solemn compact ratify then this command upon thyself i lay that thou the noblest youths of all the greeks select and bid them from my vessel bear the gifts which to achilles yesternight we promised and withal the women bring and let talthybius through the host seek out a boar with sacrifice to jove and saul whom answered thus achilles swift of foot most mighty agamemnon king of men these matters to some future time were best deferred some hour of respite from the fight of rage less fiercely burning in my breast but slaughtered now they lie whom priam's son hector hath slain by jove to victory led ye bid us take our food if i might rule i would to battle lead the sons of greece unfed and fasting and at the set of sun our shame avenged an ample feast prepare till then nor food nor drink shall pass my lips my comrade slain who pierced with mortal wounds turned toward the doorway lies within my tent his mourning friends around while there he lies no thought have i for these or aught beside save carnage blood and groans of dying men to whom ulysses sage in counsel thus o son of peleus noblest of the greeks how far achilles thou surpassest me in deeds of arms i know but thou must yield to me in counsel for my years are more and my experience greater far than thine then to my words incline a patient ear men soonest weary of battle for the sword the bloodiest harvest reaps the lightest crop of slaughter is where jove inclines the scale dispenser at his will of human wars the greeks by fasting cannot mourn their dead for day by day successive numbers fall where were the respite then from ceaseless fast behooves us bury out of sight our dead stealing our hearts and weeping but a day and we the rest whom cruel war has spared should first with food and wine recruit our strength then girding on our arms the live-long day maintain the war 
unwearied. Then let none require a farther summons to the field, and woe to him who loitering by the ships that summons hears. But with united force against the Trojans wake the furious war. He said, and called on noble Nestor's sons, on Meges, Phileus' son, Meriones, Tossus, and Lycomedes, Creon's son, and Melanippus. They together sought the mighty monarch Agamemnon's tent. Soon as the word was given, the work was done. Seven tripods brought they out, the promised gifts, twelve horses, twenty cauldrons glittering bright, seven women too, well skilled in household cares, with whom the eighth, the fair Briseis, came. Ulysses led the way, and with him brought ten talents full of gold. The attendant youths the other presents bore, and in the midst displayed before the assembly. Then uprose the monarch Agamemnon, by his side, with voice of godlike power, Talthybius stood holding the victim. Then Atrides drew the dagger, ever hanging at his side, close by the scabbard of his mighty sword, and from the victim's head the bristles shore. With hands uplifted then to Jove, he prayed, while all around the Greeks in silent stood, listening, decorous, to the monarch's words, as looking up to heaven he made his prayer. Be witness, Jove, thou highest, first of gods, and sun and earth, and ye, who vengeance wreak beneath the earth on souls of men forsworn, furies, that never, or to love unchaste, soliciting or otherwise, my hand hath fair Briseis touched, but in my tent, still pure and undefiled, hath she remained, and if in this I be forsworn, May heaven with all the plagues afflict me, due to those who sin by perjured oaths against the gods. Thus, as he spoke, across the victim's throat he drew the pitiless blade. Talthybius then to hoary ocean's depths the carcass threw, food for the fishes. Then Achilles rose, and thus before the assembled Greeks he spoke. O father Jove, how dost thou lead astray our human judgments? Ne'er had Atreus' son my bosom filled with wrath, nor from my arms to his own loss against my will had torn the girl I loved, but that the will of Jove to death predestined many a valiant Greek. Now to the meal, anon renew the war. This said, the assembly he dismissed in haste, the crowd dispersing to their several ships. Upon the gifts the warlike Myrmidons bestowed their care, and bore them to the ships. Of Peleus's godlike son, within the tent, they laid him down, and there the women placed, while to the drove the followers led the steeds. Briseis, fair as golden Venus, saw Patroclus lying, pierced with mortal wounds, within the tent. And with a bitter cry she flung her down upon the corpse, and tore her breast, 
her delicate neck and beauteous cheeks. And, weeping, thus the lovely woman wailed, Patroclus, dearly loved of this sad heart, when last I left this tent, I left thee full of healthy life. Returning now, I find only thy lifeless corpse, thou prince of men. So sorrow, still on sorrow heaped I bear. The husband of my youth, to whom my sire and honoured mother gave me, I beheld slain with the sword before the city walls. Three brothers, whom with me one mother bore, my dearly loved ones, all were doomed to death. Nor wouldst thou, when Achilles, swift of foot, my husband slew, and royal Mynes' town in ruin laid, allow my tears to flow, but thou wouldst make me, such was still thy speech, the wedded wife of Peleus's godlike son. Thou wouldst to Thia bear me in thy ship, and there thyself, amid the Myrmidons, would give my marriage feast. Then, unconsoled, I weep thy death, my ever-gentle friend. Weeping, she spoke. The women joined her wail. Patroclus's death, the pretext for their tears. But each, in secret, wept her private griefs. Around Achilles thronged the elder men, urging to eat. But he, with groans, refused. I pray you, would you show your love, dear friends? Ask me not now, with food and drink, to appease hunger or thirst. A load of bitter grief weighs heavy on my soul. Till set of sun, fasting, I will remain, and still endure. At his word withdrew. The two Atridae and Ulysses, sage, and Nestor, and Idomeneus remained, and aged Phoenix, to divert his grief. But comfort none, save in the bloody jaws of battle would he take. By memory stirred, he heaved a deep-drawn sigh, as thus he spoke. How oft hast thou, ill-fated dearest friend, here in this tent, with eager zeal, prepared the tempting meal, whene'er the sons of Greece, in haste, would arm them for the bloody fray. Now liest thou there, while I, for love of thee, from food and drink before me placed refrain, for ne'er shall I again such sorrow know, not though I heard of aged Peleus's death, who now in Thia mourns with tender tears his absent son. He on a foreign shore is warring in that hateful Helen's cause. No, nor of his who now in Skyros's isle is growing up, if yet indeed he live. Young Neoptolemus, my godlike son, my hope had been, indeed, that here in Troy, far from the plains of Argos, I alone was doomed to die, and that to Thia thou returned in safety. Mightst my son convey from Skyros home, and show him all my wealth, my spoils, my slaves, my lofty spacious house. For Peleus, or to death, methinks, 
e'en now hath yielded, or not far from death removed, lives on in sorrow, bowed by gloomy age, expecting day by day the messenger who bears the mournful tidings of my death. Weeping, Achilles spoke, and with him wept the elders, each to fond remembrance moved of all that in his home himself had left. The son of Saturn, pitying, saw their grief, and Pallas thus with winged words addressed, my child, dost thou a hero's cause forsake? Or does Achilles claim no more thy care, Who sits in sorrow by the high-proud ships, Mourning his comrade slain? The others all partake the meal, While he from food abstains. Then haste thee, and, with hunger lest he faint, Drop nectar and ambrosia on his breast. His words fresh impulse gave to Pallas's zeal. Down like the long-winged falcon, shrill of voice, Through the clear sky she swooped, And while the Greeks armed for the fight, Achilles she approached and nectar and ambrosia on his breast distilled, lest hunger should his strength subdue. Back to her mighty father's ample house returning, as from out the ships they poured, thick as the snowflakes that from heaven descend before the sky-born Boreas' chilling blast, so thick, outpouring from the ships the stream of helmets polished bright, and bossy shields, and breastplates firmly braced, and ashen spears. Their brightness flashed to heaven, and laughed the earth beneath the brazen glare. Loud rang the tramp of armed men, Achilles in the midst, the godlike chief, in dazzling arms arrayed. His teeth were gnashing audibly, his eye blazed with the light of fire. But in his heart was grief unbearable. With furious wrath he burned against the Trojans, as he donned the heavenly gifts, the work of Vulcan's hand. First on his legs the well-wrought greaves he fixed, fastened with silver clasps, his breastplate next around his chest, and o'er his shoulders flung his silver-studded sword with blade of brass. Then took his vast and weighty shield, whence gleamed a light, refulgent as the full-orbed moon, or, as to seamen, o'er the wave is borne the watchfire's light, which high among the hills some shepherd kindles in his lonely fold. As they, reluctant, by the stormy winds, far from their friends, are o'er the waters driven, so from Achilles' shield, bright, richly wrought, the light was thrown. The weighty helm he raised, and placed it on his head. The plumed helm shone like a star, and waved the hairs of gold, thick set by Vulcan in the gleaming crest. Then all the arms Achilles proved to know if well they fitted to his graceful limbs. Like wings they seemed to lift him from the ground. Last from its case he drew his father's spear, Long, ponderous, tough. Not one of all the Greeks, none 
save Achilles' self, could poise that spear. The far-famed Pelian ash, which to his sire on Pelion's summit felled to be the bane of mighty chiefs, the centaur Chiron gave. With care, Automedon and Alcimus, the horses yoked with collars fair attached, placed in their mouths the bits and passed the reins back to the well-built car. Automedon sprang on the car with shining lash in hand. Behind Achilles came, arrayed for war, in arms all glittering as the gorgeous sun. And loudly to his father's steeds he called, Xanthus and Balius, noble progeny of swift Badarge, now in other sort back to the Grecian ranks in safety bear when he shall quit the field your charioteer nor leave him as ye left patroclus slain to whom in answer from beneath the yoke xanthus the noble horse with glancing feet bowing his head the while till all his mane down from the yoke band streaming reached the ground by juno white-armed queen with speech endued yes great achilles we this day again will bear thee safely but thy day of doom is nigh at hand nor we shall cause thy death but heaven's high will and fate's imperious power by no default of ours nor lack of speed the trojans stripped patroclus of his arms the mighty god fair-haired latona's son achieved his death and hector's victory gained our speed of foot may vie with zephyr's breeze deemed swiftest of the winds but thou art doomed to die by force combined of god and man he said his farther speech the furies stayed to whom in wrath achilles swift of foot xanthus why thus predict my coming fate it ill beseems thee well i know myself that i am fated here in troy to die far from my home and parents yet withal i cease not till these trojans from the fields before me fly he said and to the front his war cry shouting urged his fiery steeds end of book 19book 20 of the iliad of homer rendered into english blank verse by edward earl of derby this librivox recording is in the public domain your reader michael armenta argument the battle of the gods and the acts of achilles jupiter upon achilles return to the battle calls a council of the gods and permits them to assist either party the terrors of the combat described when the deities are engaged apollo encourages aeneas to meet achilles after a long conversation these two heroes encounter but aeneas is preserved by the assistance of neptune 
Achilles falls upon the rest of the Trojans, and is upon the point of killing Hector, but Apollo conveys him away in a cloud. Achilles pursues the Trojans with a great slaughter. The same day continues. The scene is in the field before Troy. Round thee, Achilles, eager for the fray, stood thus accoutred by their beaked ships the sons of Greece. The Trojan host, opposed, stood on the sloping margin of the plain. Then Jove to Themis gave command to call the gods to counsel from the lofty height of many ridged Olympus. To the house of Jove she summoned them from every side. Thence of the rivers, save Oceanus, not one was absent, nor of nymphs who haunt clear fount or shady grove or grassy mead. They at the cloud compeller's house arrived, within the polished corridor reclined, which Vulcan's cunning hand for Jove had built. There were they gathered in the abode of Jove, nor did the earth-shaking Neptune slight the call, but came from ocean's depths, and in the midst he sat, and thus the will of Jove inquired. Why, Lord of Lightning, hast thou summoned here the gods to counsel? Dost thou aught devise, touching the Greeks and Trojans? who e'en now kindle anew, it seems, the blaze of war. To whom the cloud-compeller answering thus, The purpose, Neptune, well thou knowest thyself for which I called ye. True, they needs must die, but still they claim my care. Yet here will I upon Olympus's lofty ridge remain, and view, serene, the combat. You, the rest, go as you list, to Trojans or to Greeks, and at your pleasure either party aid. For if we leave Achilles thus alone to fight against the Trojans, not an hour will they before the son of Peleus stand. They dreaded him before, but now, I fear, since roused to fury by his comrade's death, he e'en in fate's despite may storm the wall. Thus Saturn's son and quenchless battle roused. The gods, divided, hastened to the war. Juno and Pallas to the ships of Greece, with them the earth-shaker, and the helpful god Hermes, for cunning subtleties unmatched, and Vulcan too, exulting in his strength, yet halting, and on feeble limbs sustained. Mars of the glancing helm took part with Troy, and golden Phoebus, with his locks unshorn, Latona too, and Dian, archer queen, Xanthus, and Venus, laughter loving dame. While from the fight of men the gods abstained, high rose the Grecian vaunts, as long withdrawn Achilles on the field again appeared and every Trojan's limbs with terror quaked, trembling, as Peleus's godlike son they saw, in arms all glittering, fierce as blood-stained Mars. But when the immortals mingled in the throng, then furious waxed the spirit-stirring strife. Then Pallas raised her war-cry, 
standing now beside the deep dug trench without the wall, now shouting loud along the sounding beach. On the other side, as with the tempest's roar, Mars to the Trojans shouted loud, one while from Ilium's topmost height, anon again from the fair hill or changing Simois's stream. Thus either side, exciting to the fray, the immortal gods unchained the angry war. Thundered on high the sire of gods and men with awful din, while Neptune shook beneath the boundless earth and lofty mountain tops. The spring abounding Ida quaked and rocked from her firm basis to her loftiest peak, and Troy's proud city, and the ships of Greece. Pluto, the infernal monarch, heard, alarmed, and springing from his throne, cried out in fear, lest Neptune, breaking through the solid earth, to mortals and immortals should lay bare his dark and drear abode of gods abhorred. Such was the shock when gods in battle met, for there to royal Neptune stood opposed Phoebus Apollo with his arrows keen, the blue-eyed Pallas to the god of war, to Juno, Diane, heavenly archeress, sister of Phoebus, golden-shafted queen. Stout Hermes, helpful god, Latona faced, while Vulcan met the mighty rolling stream, Xanthus, by gods, by men, Scamander called. Thus gods encountered gods, Achilles' soul, meantime, was burning mid the throng to meet Hector, the son of Priam, with whose blood he longed to glut the insatiate lord of war. Apollo then, the spirit-stirring god, Aeneas moved Achilles to confront, and filled with courage high, and thus the voice assuming of Lycian, Priam's son, Apollo, son of Jove, the chief addressed. Aeneas, prince and counsellor of Troy, where are the vaunts which o'er the wine-cup late thou madest amid the assembled chiefs of Troy, that hand to hand thou wouldst Achilles meet? To whom Aeneas thus in answer spoke, why, son of Priam, urge me to contend against my will with Peleus's mighty son? Not for the first time should I now engage Achilles, swift of foot. I met him once, and fled before his spear, on Ida's hill, when on our herds he fell, their Nessus then he raised, and... Pedasus, me Jove preserved with strength endowing, and with speed of foot, else had I fallen beneath Achilles's hand, by Pallas aided, who before him moves, light of his life, and guides his brazen spear, Trojans and Lelegies alike to slay. Tis not in mortal man with him to fight, whom still some god attends, and guards from harm, and e'en, unaided, to the mark his spear unerring flies, unchecked until it pierce a warrior's breast. Yet, if the gods, the scale impartial, held, all brass-clad as he is, o'er me no easy triumph should he gain, to whom the king Apollo, son of Jove. 
brave chief, do thou too to the immortal gods address thy prayer. Men say that thou art sprung from Venus, child of Jove. His mother owns a humbler origin, one born to Jove, the other to the aged ocean god. On, then, with dauntless spear, nor be dismayed by his high tone and vaunting menaces. His words with courage filled the hero's breast, and on he sprang in dazzling arms arrayed. But not unmarked of white-armed Juno passed to meet Achilles through the press of men, who thus addressed the gods to counsel called. Neptune and Pallas, Aeneas comes in dazzling arms arrayed to meet in fight the son of Peleus. Phoebus sends him forth. Say then, shall we, encountering, to retreat perforce constrain him? Or shall one of us beside Achilles stand, and give him strength, that he may nothing lack, and know himself by all the mightiest of the immortal gods beloved, and those how powerless by whose aid the Trojans yet maintain defensive war. Therefore to join the battle came we all from high Olympus, that in this day's fight no ill befall him, though the time shall come for him to meet the doom by fate decreed when at his birth his thread of life was spun. But if Achilles from a voice divine receive not this assurance, he may well be struck with fear if, haply, to some god he find himself opposed. Tis hard for man to meet, in presence visible, a god to whom earth-shaking Neptune thus replied, Juno, thine anger carry not too far, it ill beseems thee. Not with my consent shall we, the stronger far, provoke to arms the other gods, but rather from the field retiring let us from on high survey, to mortals left, the turmoil of the war. Should Mars or Phoebus then begin the fight, or stay Achilles and his arm restrain, then in the contest we too may engage, and soon, methinks, will they be fain to join, driven from the field, the synod of the gods, subdued, perforce, by our victorious hands. The dark-haired monarch spoke, and led the way to the high wall. By Trojans, built of old, with Pallas's aid, for godlike Hercules, within whose circle he might safety seek when from the beach the monster of the deep might chase him toward the plain. There Neptune sat, and with him the other gods, a veil of cloud impenetrable around their shoulders spread. On the other side, upon the fair hill's brow, Phoebus with Mars the fort destroyer, sat on either side they sat each facing each with hostile counsels yet reluctant both to take the initiative of ruthless war till jove enthroned on high the signal gave then all the plain with men and horses thronged the brazen gleam illumed, 
rang the earth beneath their feet, as to the battle shock they rushed. But in the midst, both hosts between, eager for fight, stood forth two warriors bold, proudly pre-eminent, Anchises' son Aeneas, and Achilles' godlike might. Aeneas, first with threatening mien, advanced, nodding his ponderous helm. Before his breast his shield he bore, and poised his brazen spear. Him met Achilles from the opposing ranks. Fierce as a ravening lion, whom to slay pour forth the stalwart youths, the united strength of the roused village, he, unheeding, moves at first, but wounded by a javelin thrown by some bold youth, he turns with gaping jaws and frothing fangs, collecting for the spring his breast too narrow for his mighty heart, and with his tail he lashes both his flanks and sides as though to rouse his utmost rage then on in pride of strength with glaring eyes he dashes if some hunter he may slay or in the foremost rank himself be slain so moved his dauntless spirit peleus's son aeneas to confront when near they came thus first achilles swift of foot began aeneas why so far before the ranks advanced dost thou presume with me to fight perchance expecting that the throne of troy and priam's royal honours may be thine E'en if thou slay me, deem not to obtain such boon from Priam. Valiant sons are his, and he not weak, but bears a constant mind. Or have the Trojans set apart for thee some favoured spot, hmm? the fairest of the land, orchard or cornland, shouldst thou work my death? which thou shalt find i trust too hard a task already hast thou fled before my spear hast thou forgotten how amid thy herds alone i found thee and with flying foot pursued thee down the steep of ida's hill nor didst thou dare to turn or pause in flight thou to lernesis fledst (laughs) <laughs> Lernesis, I, with Pallas's aid, and Jove's, assailed and took, their women thence, their days of freedom lost, I bore away, <laughs> my captives, thee from death Jove and the other gods defended then, but will not now bestow, though such thy hope their succour then i warn thee while tis time ere ill betide thee to the general throng that thou withdraw nor stand to me opposed after the event may e'en a fool be wise to whom in answer thus aeneas spoke Achilles, think not me as though a fool to daunt with lofty speech. I too could well, with cutting words and insults, answer thee. Each other's race and parents well we know from tales of ancient days, although by sight nor mine to thee nor thine to me are known. To noble Peleus, thou, tis said, wast born of Thetis, fair-haired daughter of the sea. Of great Anchises, heaven-descended chief, I boast me sprung, to him 
by Venus born. Of these shall one or other have this day to mourn their son, since not with empty words shall thou and I from mortal combat part. But if thou farther wouldst inquire and learn the race I spring from, not unknown to men, by Dardanus of cloud-compelling Jove begotten, was Dardania peopled first, ere sacred Ilium, populous city of men, was founded on the plain? As yet they dwelt on spring abounding Ida's lowest spurs. To Dardanus was Erichthonius born, great king, the wealthiest of the sons of men, for him were pastured in the marshy mead, rejoicing with their foals, three thousand mares them boreas in the pasture where they fed beheld enamoured and amid the herd in likeness of a coal-black steed appeared twelve foals by him conceiving they produced these o'er the teeming cornfields as they flew skimmed o'er the topmost spray of the hoary sea again to erichthonius tros was born the king of troy three noble sons were his illus asarchus and ganymede the fairest he of all the sons of men him for his beauty bore the gods away to minister as cup-bearer to jove and dwell amid the immortals illus next begot a noble son laomedon tithonus he and priam clytius lampus and isetion plant of mars capis begotten of asarchus begot Anchises, and Anchises me. To Priam, godlike Hector owes his birth. Such is my race, and such the blood I boast. But Jove, at will, to mortals valour gives, or minishes, or he is lord of all. Then cease we now, like babbling fools, to prate here in the centre of the coming fight. Terms of reproach we both might find, whose weight would sink a galley of a hundred oars, for glibly runs the tongue, and can at will give utterance to discourse in every vein. Wide is the range of language and such words as one may speak another may return what need that we should insults interchange like women who some paltry quarrel wage scolding and brawling in the public street and in opprobrious terms their anger vent some true some false for so their rage suggests with words thou shalt not turn me from the field till we have met in arms then try we now each other's prowess with our brazen spears he said and hurled against the mighty shield his brazen spear loud rang the weapon's point and at arm's length achilles held the shield with his broad hand in fear that through its folds aeneas's spear would easy passage find blind fool forgetful that the glorious gifts bestowed by gods are not with ease o'ercome nor yield before the assaults of mortal men so broke not through aeneas's sturdy spear stayed by the golden plate the gift of heaven yet through two plates it passed but three remained for five were in the shield i vulcan wrought 
two were of brass, the inner two of tin, and one of gold, which stayed the brazen spear. Achilles threw in turn his ponderous spear, and struck the circle of Aeneas's shield near the first rim, where thinnest lay the brass, and thinnest too the o'erlying hide. Right through the Pelian shaft was driven, wide gaped the shield. Aeneas crouched in fear, as o'er his head he held his shield. The eager weapon passed through both the circles of his ample shield, and in the ground behind him, quivering, stood. Escaped the ponderous weapon, sharpest pain flashing across his eyes. In fear he stood, so close the spear had passed him. Onward then, drawing his trenchant blade, Achilles rushed with fearful shout. A rocky fragment then Aeneas lifted up, a mighty mass, which scarce two men, as men are now, could bear. But he, unaided, lifted it with ease. Then had Aeneas, with the massive stone, or on the helmet, or the shield, his death averting, struck Achilles, and himself had by the sword of Peleus's son been slain. Had not the earth-shaking god his peril seen, and to the immortals thus addressed his speech. O oh, woe is me for great Aeneas's sake, who by Achilles slain must visit soon the viewless shades, insensate who relied on Phoebus's words, Yet not shall he avail from death to save him. Yet, oh, why should he, blameless himself, the guilt of others rue, who still his grateful sacrifice hath paid to all the gods in widespread heaven who dwell? Let us then interpose to guard his life, lest, if Achilles slay him, Saturn's son, be moved to anger, for his destiny would have him live, lest airless from the earth should perish quite the race of Dardanus, by Saturn's son, the best beloved of all his sons, to him by mortal women born. For Jove, the race of Priam, hath abhorred, but o'er the Trojans shall Aeneas reign, and his sons' sons through ages yet unborn. Whom answered thus the stag-eyed queen of heaven? Neptune, do thou determine for thyself Aeneas to withdraw, or leave to fall, good as he is, beneath Achilles' sword? But we before the immortal gods are bound, both I and Pallas, by repeated oaths, ne'er from his doom one Trojan life to save, though two devouring flames a prey all Troy were blazing, kindled by the valiant Greeks. The earth shaker heard, and through the fight he passed, and through the throng of spears until he came where great Achilles and Aeneas stood. Around the eyes of Peleus' son he spread a veil of mist. Then from Aeneas's shield the brass-tipped spear withdrawing laid it down before Achilles' feet. Lifting up Aeneas bore him high above the ground, o'er many a rank of warriors and of cars aeneas flew supported by the god till to the field's extremest verge he came where stood the cockens arming for war there to aeneas standing by his side the earth shaker thus his winged words addressed 
Aeneas, say what god has moved thee thus against Achilles, reckless to contend, thy stronger far and dearer to the gods. If e'er he cross thy path, do thou retire, lest e'en despite of fate thou find thy death. But when Achilles hath to fate succumbed, then fearless with the foremost join the fray. No other Greek shall bear away thy spoils. Thus plainly warned, Aeneas there he left. Then from Achilles' eyes he purged the film. Astonished, he with his eyes wide open gazed, as thus he communed with his mighty heart. O oh, heaven! What marvel do mine eyes behold? My spear before me laid, and vanished he at whom I hurled it with intent to slay. Then is Aeneas of the immortal gods in truth beloved, though vain I deemed his boast. A curse go with him. Yet methinks not soon will he again presume to prove my might, who gladly now in flight escapes from death. Then to the valiant Greeks my orders given. Let me some other Trojan's metal prove. Then toward the ranks he sprang, each several man exhorting, From the Trojans, valiant Greeks, no longer stand aloof, but man to man confront the foe, and nobly dare the fight. T'were hard for me, brave warrior though I be, to face such numbers, and to fight with all. Not Mars, nor Pallas, though immortal gods, could face and vanquish such a mighty mass. But what my single arm and feet and strength may profit, not a jot will I relax. Right through the ranks I mean to force my way, and small shall be that Trojan's cause for joy who comes within the compass of my spear. Thus he, exhorting, Hector, cheering on, meanwhile, the Trojans, with assurance given that he himself Achilles would confront. Ye valiant Trojans, fear not Peleus' son. I too in words could with the gods contend, though not in arms, so much the stronger they. Not all his words Achilles shall make good, Fulfilling some, in others he shall fail, His course midway arrested. Him will I encounter, though his hands were hands of fire, Of fire his hands, his strength as burnished steel. Thus he, exhorting, with uplifted spears advanced the Trojans, from the mingling host loud rose the clamour. Then at Hector's side Apollo stood, and thus addressed the chief. Hector, forbear Achilles to defy, and mid the crowd withdraw thee from the fray, lest with the spear he slay thee, thrown from far, or with the sword in combat hand to hand. He said, troubled by the heavenly voice, Hector, amid the throng of men, withdrew. Then, girt with might, amid the Trojans, sprang with fearful shouts Achilles. First he slew Otrynte's son, Ephitian valiant chief of numerous warriors him a naiad nymph in hides
fertile vale, beneath the feet of snow-clad Tmolus, to Otrintes bore. At him, as on he rushed, Achilles hurled, and through his forehead drove his glittering spear. The head was cleft in twain. Thundering he fell, and o'er him thus Achilles made his boast. Son of Otrintes, lie thou there, of men the most vainglorious. Here thou find'st thy death, far from thy place of birth, beside the lake Jigean. There hadst thou thine heritage of old, beside the fish abounding stream of Hellas, and by Hermes's eddying flood. Thus he exulting, o'er Aphidian's eyes were spread the shades of death. His mangled corpse was crushed beneath the Grecian chariot wheels in the first shock. Demolion next he smote, and helpful aid in war, and Tenor's son, pierced through the temples, through the brass-bound helm, nor checked the brazen helm the spear, whose point went crashing through the bone, that all the brain was shattered. Onward as he rushed he fell. Then through the neck Hippodamus he smote, flying before him, mounted on his car. Deep groaned he, breathing out his soul. As groans a bull by sturdy youths to the altar dragged of Neptune, king divine of Helicaean, the earth-shaking god, well pleased the gift receives, e'en with such groans his noble spirit fled. The godlike Polydor he next assailed, the son of Priam, him his aged sire would fain have kept at home of all his sons, at once the youngest and the best beloved, among them all for speed of foot unmatched, whose youthful folly in the foremost ranks his speed displaying cost him now his life. Him, as he darted by, Achilles's spear struck through the center of the back, where met the golden clasps that held the glittering belt, and where the breastplate formed a double guard. Right through his body passed the weapon's point. Groaning he fell upon his knees. Dark clouds o'erspread his eyes, supporting with his hand his wounded bowels. On the ground he writhed. When Hector saw his brother, Polydor, writhing in death, a mist o'erspread his eyes. No longer could he bear to stand aloof, but sprang to meet Achilles, flashing fire, his keen spear brandishing. At sight of him, up leaped Achilles, and exulting cried, Lo! Here the man who most hath wrung my soul, who slew my loved companion. Now, methinks, upon the pass of war, not long shall we stand separate, nor each the other shun. Then, with stern glance, to godlike Hector thus, Draw near and quickly meet thy doom of death. To whom thus Hector of the glancing helm, unterrified. Achilles, think not me, as though a fool and ignorant of war, to daunt with lofty speech. I too could well, with cutting words and insult, answer thee. I know thee strong and valiant, 
and I know myself to thee inferior, but the event is with the gods, and I, if such their will, the weaker, with my spear may reach thy life. My point, too, hath ere now its sharpness proved. He said, and poising, hurled his ponderous spear, which from Achilles Pallas turned aside, with lightest breath, back to Hector sent, and laid before his feet. Intent to slay, onward Achilles rushed with fearful shout. But Phoebus Hector from the field conveyed, as gods can only, veiled in thickest cloud. Thrice Peleus' godlike son, with brazen spear, his onset made. Thrice struck the misty cloud. But when, with power as of a god, he made his fourth essay, in fury thus he cried, Yet once again, vile hound, hast thou escaped. Thy doom was nigh, but thee, thy god, hath saved. Phoebus, to whom, amid the clash of spears, well mayst thou pray. We yet shall meet again, when I shall end thee, if a guardian god I too may claim. Meanwhile, from thee I turn, and others seek, on whom my hap may light. He said, and drove through Dryops's neck his spear, and stretched him at his feet, and passed him by. Next with his spear he struck below the knee Philetor's son, Demuchus, stout and tall and checked his forward course, then, rushing on, dealt with his mighty sword a mortal blow. The sons of Bias, next, Leogonus and Dardanus, he hurled from off their car, one with a spear, and one by sword-stroke slain. Tros, too, he slew, Alastor's son, who came to meet him and embrace his knees, and pray to spare his life in pity of his youth. Little he knew how vain would be his prayer, for not of temper soft nor mild of mood was he, but sternly fierce, and as he knelt and clasped his knees, and would his prayer prefer, Achilles clove him with his mighty sword, gashed through the liver, as from out the wound his liver dropped, the dark blood gushing forth his bosom filled, and darkness closed his eyes as ebbed his life away. Then through the ear Mulius he thrust, at the other ear came forth the brazen point. Echeclus next he met, son of Agenor, and his hilted sword full on the centre of his head let fall. The hot blood dyed the blade, the darkling shades of death, and rigorous fate his eyes o'erspread. Next, where the tendons bind the elbow joint, the brazen spear transfixed Deucalion's arm, with death in prospect and disabled arm he stood, till on his neck Achilles's sword descending shard, and flung afar both head and helmet. From the spine's dissevered joints the marrow flowed, as stretched in dust he lay. The noble son of Peleus next he slew, Rigmus, who came from Thracia's fertile plains. 
Him through the waist he struck. The brazen spear plunged in his bowels. From the car he fell, and as Arithuus, his charioteer, his horses turned, Achilles through the neck his sharp spear thrusting, hurled him to the ground. The startled steeds in wild confusion thrown. As rage the fires amid the wooded glen of some parched mountain's side, and fiercely burns the copsewood dry, while eddying here and there the flames are whirled before the gusty wind, so fierce Achilles raged, on every side pursuing, slaughtering, reeked the earth with blood. As when upon a well-rolled threshing-floor Two sturdy-fronted steers, together yoked, Tread the white barley out, Beneath their feet vast flies the grain, Outtrodden from the husk. So by Achilles driven, His flying steeds, his chariot bore, O'er bodies of the slain, And broken bucklers trampling. All beneath was splashed with blood the axle, and the rails around the car, as from the horse's feet, and from the fellows of the wheels were thrown the bloody gouts. And onward still he pressed, panting for added triumphs, deeply dyed with gore and carnage his unconquered hands. End of Book 20Book 21 of The Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michael Armenta. Argument. The Battle in the River Scamander. The Trojans fly before Achilles, some towards the town, others to the river Scamander. He falls upon the latter with great slaughter, takes twelve captives alive to sacrifice to the shade of Patroclus, and kills Lycaon and Asteropius. Scamander attacks him with all his waves. Neptune and Pallas assist the hero. Simois joins Scamander, at length, Vulcan, by the instigation of Juno, almost dries up the river. This combat ended, the other gods engage each other. Meanwhile, Achilles continues the slaughter, and drives the rest into Troy. Agenor only makes a stand, and is conveyed away in a cloud by Apollo, who, to delude Achilles, takes upon him Agenor's shape, and while he pursues him in that disguise, gives the Trojans an opportunity of retiring into their city. The same day continues. The scene is on the banks and in the stream of Scamander. But when they came to eddying Xanthus's ford, fair flowing stream, born of immortal Jove, Achilles cut in twain the flying host, part driving toward the city, or the plain, where on the former day the routed Greeks, when Hector raged victorious, fled amain. On terror-struck they rushed, but Juno spread to baffle their retreat, before their path clouds and thick darkness. Half the fugitives in the deep river's silvery eddies plunged. With clamor loud they fell. The torrent roared. The banks around re-echoed. Here and there they 
with the eddies wildly struggling, swam, as when, pursued by fire, a hovering swarm of locusts riverward direct their flight, and as the insatiate flames advance, they cower amid the waters. So a mingled mass of men and horses, by Achilles driven, the deeply whirling stream of Xanthus choked. His spear amid the tamarisks on the bank, the hero left, on savage deeds intent, armed with his sword alone, a god in power, he sprang amid the torrent, right and left he smote, then fearful rose the groans of men slain with the sword, the stream ran red with blood. As fishes, flying from a dolphin, Crowd the shore recesses of some open bay, In fear, for whom he catches he devours. So crouched the Trojans in the mighty stream beneath the banks. And when at length his land, wearied of slaughter, From the stream alive, he dragged twelve youths, Whose forfeit lives should be the bloody fine, for slain Patroclus, paid helpless from fear, as fawns, he brought them forth, their hands secured behind them with the belts, which o'er their shirts of twisted mail they wore, and bade his comrades lead them to the ships. Then on again he dashed, a thirst for blood, and first encountered, flying from the stream, Lycan, Priam's son. Him once before, he, by a nightly onslaught, had surprised, and from his father's vineyard captive-born, where, as he cut, to form his chariot-rail, a fig-tree's tender shoots, unlooked for ill, or took him in the form of Peleus's son. Thence in his ship to Lemnos's thriving isle he bore him, ransomed there by Jason's son. His Imbrian host, Yetian, set him free with liberal gifts, and to Arisba sent. Escaping thence, he reached his native home. Twelve days, save one, rejoicing with his friends, he spent returned from Lemnos. Fate, the twelfth, again consigned him to Achilles's hands, from him reluctant to receive his death. Him, when Achilles, swift of foot, beheld no spear in hand, of helm and shield bereft, all flung in haste away, as from the stream, Reeking with sweat and faint with toil, he fled. He communed, wrathful, with his mighty heart. Ye gods, what marvel do mine eyes behold? Methinks the valiant Trojans, slain by me, Ere long will from the realms of darkness rise, Since death escaping. But to slavery sold, in Lemnos' isle, this fellow hath returned, Despite the hoary sea's impediment, which many a man against his will hath stayed. Now shall he taste my spear, that I may see if thence too he return, Or if the earth may keep him safe, which e'en the strongest holds, Thus, as he stood, he mused, but all aghast approached Lycian, and would have fain have clasped the hero's knees, for longingly he sought escape from bitter death and evil fate. Achilles raised his spear, in act to strike. He, stooping, ran beneath, and clasped his knees, 
above his back the murderous weapon passed, and in the earth was fixed. One suppliant hand Achilles' knees embraced, the other held with unrelaxing grasp the pointed spear, as he, with winged words imploring, spoke. I clasp thy knees, Achilles. Look then down with pity on my woes, and recognize, illustrious chief, a suppliant's sacred claim. For in thy tent I first broke bread that day, when in my father's fruitful vineyard seized, thy captive I became, to slavery sold, far from my sire and friends, in Lemnos' isle. A hundred oxen were my ransom then, at thrice so much I now would buy my life. This day is but the twelfth, since, sorely tried, by lengthened suffering, back to Troy I came. Now to thy hands once more my cruel fate consigns me, surely by the wrath of Jove pursued, who gives me to thy power again. Me, doomed to early death, my mother bore, old Altes's daughter, fair Laothi. Altes, who ruled the warlike Lelegis in soft Epidesis, by Satnois's stream. Two sons she bore, and both by thee must die. Already one, the godlike Polydor, amid the foremost ranks thy spear hath slain, and now my doom hath found me, for from thee, since evil fate hath placed me in thy hands, I may not hope to fly, yet hear but this, and weigh it in thy mind, to spare my life. I come not of that womb which Hector bore, who slew thy comrade, gentle, kind, and brave. Thus Priam's noble son, imploring, spoke. But stern the answer fell upon his ear. Thou fool, no more to me of ransom prate. Before Patroclus met the doom of death, To spare the Trojans still my soul inclined, And many captives, taken alive, I sold. But from henceforth, before the walls of Troy, not one of all the Trojans, whom the gods may to my hands deliver, least of all a son of Priam, shall escape the death. Thou too, my friend, must die. Why vainly wail? Dead is Patroclus too, thy better far. Me too, thou seest how stalwart, tall and fair, of noble sire, and of goddess mother born. Yet must I yield to death and stubborn fate, whene'er at morn, or noon, or eve, the spear or arrow from the bow may reach my life. He said, and sank like in limbs and heart. He loosed the spear, and sat, with both his hands upraised, imploring. But Achilles drew, and on his neck, beside the collar-bone, let fall his trenchant sword. The two-edged blade was buried deep. Prone on the earth he lay, forth gushed the crimson blood, and dyed the ground. Him, dragging by the feet, Achilles threw in the mid-stream, and thus with vaunting speech. Lie there amidst the fishes who shall cleanse, but not with kindly thought, thy gory wounds. O'er thee, extended on thy bier, 
shall rise no mother's wail. Scamander's eddying stream shall to the sea's broad bosom roll thee down, and springing through the darkly rippling wave, fishes shall rise, and banquet on thy flesh. On now the work of death, till flying ye, and slaughtering, I, we reach the city wall, nor this fair flowing silver eddying stream shall aught avail ye, though to him ye pay in sacrifice the blood of countless bulls, and living horses in his waters sink. Ye all shall perish, till Patroclus' death be fully avenged, and slaughter of the Greeks, whom, in my absence, by the ships ye slew. He said, the mighty river at his words indignant chafed, and pondered in his mind how best to check Achilles' warlike toil, and from destruction guard the Trojan host. Meantime, Achilles, with his ponderous spear, Esteropius, son of Pelagon, assailed with deadly purpose. Pelagon, to broadly flowing Axius, owed his birth, the river god, commingling with the blood of Perbia, daughter eldest born of Achisenemus. On him he sprang, he from the river rising, stood opposed, two lances in his hand, his courage roused by Xanthus, who, indignant, saw his stream polluted by the blood of slaughtered youths, by fierce Achilles' hand, unpitying, slain. When near the warriors each to other came, Achilles, swift of foot, took up the word. What man, and whence art thou, who darest to stand opposed to me? Of most unhappy sires, the children, they, who my encounter meet. To whom the illustrious son of Pelagon, Great son of Peleus, why inquire my race? From far Peonius fertile fields I come, the leader of the long-speared Peon host. Ten days have passed since I to Ilum came, from widely flowing Axius my descent. Axius, the purest stream on earth that flows, he Pelagon begot, the spear renowned. Of Pelagon I boast me sprung, and now address thee, brave Achilles, to the fight. Threatening he spoke. Achilles raised on high the Pelian spear, but ambidexter he from either hand at once a javelin launched. One struck but pierced not through, the mighty shield, stayed by the golden plate, the gift of heaven. Achilles' right forearm the other grazed. Forth gushed the crimson blood, but glancing by, and vainly longing for the taste of flesh, the point behind him in the earth was fixed. Then, at Esteropius, in his turn, with deadly intent, the son of Peleus threw his straight-directed spear. His mark he missed, but struck the lofty bank, where deep infixed, to half its length, the Pelian ash remained. Then from beside his thigh Achilles drew his trenchant blade, and furious Onward rushed, while from the cliff Esteropius strove in vain 
with stalwart hand, to wrench the spear. Three times he shook it with impetuous force, three times relaxed his grasp. A fourth attempt he made to bend and break the sturdy shaft, but him preventing, Peleus's godlike son with deadly stroke across the belly smote and gushed his bowels forth. Upon the ground, gasping, he lay, and darkness sealed his eyes. Then on his breast Achilles sprang, and stripped his armor off, and thus, with vaunting speech, So lie thou there, tis hard for thee to fight, though river-born, against the progeny of mighty Jove, a widely flowing stream thou claimest as author of thy parentage. My high descent from Jove himself I boast. My father, Peleus, son of Aeacus, reigns o'er the numerous race of Myrmidons. The son of Jove himself was Aeacus, High o'er all rivers that to the ocean flow is Jove exalted, and in like degree superior is his race in power to theirs. A mighty river hast thou here at hand, if that might aught avail thee, but his power is impotent to strive with Saturn's son, with him not Achelous, king of streams, presumes to vie, nor in the mighty strength of deeply flowing wide Oceanus, from whom all rivers, all the boundless sea, all fountains, all deep wells derive their source. Yet him appalls the lightning bolt of Jove and thunder, pealing from the vaults of heaven. He said, and from the cliff withdrew his spear. Him left he lifeless there upon the sand, extended. O'er him the dark waters washed, and eels and fishes thronging gnawed his flesh. Then mid the Paeans' plumed host he rushed, who fled along the eddying stream, when him, their bravest in the stubborn fight, they saw, slain by the sword and arm of Peleus's son. Thersilochus and Mydon then he slew, Nisus and Thrasius and Astipolus, Aeneas and Ophelestes, and yet more had been the slaughter by Achilles wrought. But from his eddying depths, in human form, with wrathful tone, the mighty river spoke. In strength, Achilles, and in deeds of arms, all mortals thou surpassest, for the gods themselves attend thee, and protect from harm. If Saturn's son have given thee utterly the Trojans to destroy, yet Ere thou slay, far from my waters drive them o'er the plain. For now my lovely stream is filled with dead, nor can I pour my current to the sea with floating corpses choked, while thou pursuest the work of death insatiate. Stay thy hand, with horror I behold thee, mighty chief. Whom answered thus Achilles, swift of foot. Be it as thou wilt, Scamander, heaven-born stream. Yet cease I not to slay, Until I drive these vaunting Trojans to their walls, And prove the force of Hector, If in single fight I be by him, or he by me subdued. 
he said, and fiercely on the Trojans rushed, a god in might. To Phoebus then his speech the deeply eddying river thus addressed. God of the silver bow, great son of Jove, obeyest thou thus the will of Saturn's son, who charged thee by the Trojans still to stand and aid their cause, till evening's late approach should cast its shadows o'er the fertile earth? Thus, as he spoke, from off the lofty bank Achilles, springing in mid-current, plunged. Then high the swelling stream, tumultuous, rose in all its angry flood, and with a roar as of a bellowing bull, cast forth to land the numerous corpses by Achilles slain, and many living in his caverned bed Concealed behind the whirling waters, saved. Fierce round Achilles rose the boiling wave, And on his shield descending drove him down. Nor might he keep his foothold, But he grasped a lofty elm well grown, Which from the cliff uprooted all the bank had torn away, And with its tangled branches checked the flow of the fair river which with all its length it bridged across. Then, springing from the deep, swiftly he fled in terror o'er the plain, nor ceased the mighty river, but pursued with darkly ruffling crest, intent to stay Achilles' course and save the Trojan host. Far as a javelin's flight he rushed, in speed like the dark hunter eagle strongest deemed and swift weaned of all the feathered race so on he sped loud rattled on his breast his brazen armour as before the god cowering he fled the god behind him still with thundering sound pursued as when a man from some dark-watered spring through trenches leads, mid plants and gardens, the irrigating stream, and, spade in hand, the appointed channel clears, down flows the stream anon, its pebbly bed disturbing, fast it flows with bubbling sound down the steep slope, o'ertaking him who leads. Achilles, so the advancing wave o'ertook, though great his speed. But man must yield to gods. Oft as Achilles, swift of foot, essayed to turn and stand, and know if all the gods who dwell in heaven were leagued to daunt his soul, so oft the heaven-born river's mighty wave above his shoulders dashed in deep distress he sprang on high then rushed the flood below and bore him off his legs and wore away the soil beneath his feet then groaning thus as up to heaven he looked achilles cried o father jove will none of all the gods in pity save me from this angry flood content thereafter would i meet my fate of all the powers of heaven my mother most hath wronged me who hath buoyed me up with hope delusive that before the walls of troy i should by phoebus's swift-winged arrows fall would that by Hector's hand twere mine to die, the bravest of their brave. A warrior so were by a warrior slain. Now I am doomed ignobly here to sink, the mighty flood o'erwhelming me, like some poor shepherd lad 
borne down in crossing by a wintry brook. He said, and quickly clothed in mortal form, Neptune and Pallas at his side appeared. With cheering words they took him by the hand, and thus the earth-shaking god his speech began. Achilles, fear not thou, nor be dismayed. Such powerful aid by Jove's consent we bring. Pallas and I from heaven. Tis not decreed that thou shouldst by the river be o'erwhelmed. He shall retire ere long, and thou shalt see. And more, if thou wilt hear, we undertake that from the war thine arm shall not be stayed, till thou shalt drive beneath the walls of Troy the crowd of flying Trojans. Thou, thyself, shalt Hector slay, and safe regain the ships. Such high renown we give thee to achieve. They, to the other gods, this said, returned. He, greatly strengthened by the voice divine, pressed onward to the plain. The plain he found all flooded o'er, and floating armor fair, and many a corpse of men in battle slain. Yet onward, lifting high his feet, he pressed right toward the stream. Nor could the mighty stream check his advance. Such vigor Pallas gave. Nor did Scamander yet his fury stay, but fiercer rose his rage and rearing high his crested wave, to Simois thus he cried, Dear brother, aid me with united force this mortal's course to check. He, unrestrained, will royal Priam's city soon destroy, nor will the Trojans his assault endure. Haste to the rescue, then and from their source fill all thy stream, and all thy channels swell. Rouse thy big waves, and roll a torrent down of logs and stones, to whelm this man of might, who triumphs now, and bears him as a god. Not shall his strength or beauty then avail, or gallant arms, Beneath the waters sunk, deep buried in the mud. Himself will I in sand embed, And o'er his corpse a pile of shingly gravel heap. Nor shall the Greeks be able to collect his bones, Encased by me so deep in slime. His monument they here may raise, but when they celebrate his funeral rites, no mound will he require. He said, and on Achilles from on high came boiling, rushing down with thunderous roar, with foam and blood, and corpses intermixed. High rose the heaven-born river's darkling wave, and bore Achilles downward. Then, in fear, lest the broad waters of the eddying stream should quite o'erwhelm him, Juno cried out, and Vulcan thus her son in haste addressed. Up, Vulcan, up, my son! For we had deemed that eddying Xanthus stood to thee opposed. Haste thee to aid, thy fiery strength display. 
while from the sea I call the stormy blast of Zephyr and brisk Notus, who shall drive the raging flames ahead, and burn alike the Trojans and their arms. Do thou, the while, burn down the trees on Xanthus' banks, himself assail with fire, nor by his honeyed words, nor by his menaces be turned aside, nor, till thou hear my voice, restrain thy power. Then stay the raging flame's unwearied course. Thus Juno spoke, and Vulcan straight prepared the heavenly fire and first upon the plain the flames he kindled and the dead consumed who lay promiscuous by achilles slain the plain was dried and stayed the watery flood as when the breath of boreas quickly dries in autumn time a newly watered field the tiller's heart rejoicing so was dried the spacious plain. Then he, the dead consumed, against the river turned the fiery glare. Burnt were the willows, elms, and tamarisk shrubs, the lotus, and the reeds, and gallingal, which by the lovely river grew profuse. The eels and fishes, mid the eddying whirl, mid the clear wave, were hurrying here and there, in dire distress, from Vulcan's fiery breath. Scorched by the flames, the mighty river spoke. Vulcan, no god against thy power can stand, nor with thy fiery flames will I contend. Restrain thy wrath, though Peleus's godlike son should from their city drive the Trojans straight with rival parties. What concern have I? All scorched, he spoke, his fair stream bubbling up, as when a cauldron on a blazing fire filled with the melting fat of well-fed swine boils up within, and bubbles all around, with well-dried wood beneath, so, bubbling up, the waters of the lovely river boiled. Nor onward would he flow, but checked his course, by the blast o'erborne, and fiery strength of skilful Vulcan, and to Juno thus imploring, he his winged words addressed. Juno, what cause impels thy son, my stream, or all the rest, to visit with his wrath? E'en less than others, who the Trojans aid, have I offended. Yet at thy command will I withdraw, but bid that he too cease, and this I swear, no Trojan more to save, though to devouring flames a prey, all Troy were blazing, kindled by the valiant Greeks. This, when the white-armed goddess Juno heard, to Vulcan straight she thus addressed her speech. Vulcan, my glorious son, restrain thy hand in mortal men's behalf, it is not meet to press thus hardly an immortal god. She said, and Vulcan stayed his fiery strength, and back returning in his wonted bed flowed the fair river. Xanthus thus subdued, these two their warfare ceased, by Juno checked despite her wrath. But mid the other gods arose contention fierce, and discord dire, 
their warring passions roused on either side. With fearful crash they met, the broad earth groaned, loud rang the heaven as with a trumpet's sound. Jove, on Olympus's height, the tumult heard, and in his heart he laughed, a joyous laugh, to see the gods in angry battle met. Not long they stood aloof, led on by Mars, the buckler-breaker, who, to Pallas first, poising his spear, his bitter speech addressed. What dost thou hear, thou saucy jade? To war, the gods exciting, overbold of mood, led by thy haughty spirit? Dost thou forget how thou, the son of Tydeus, Diomed, didst urge against me, and with visible spear direct his aim, and aid to wound my flesh? For all I suffered then, thou now shalt pay. Thus, as he stroke, he struck the tasseled shield, awful to view, which not the lightning bolt of Jove himself could pierce. The blood-stained Mars against it thrust in vain his ponderous spear. The goddess stooped, and in her ample hand took up a stone that lay upon the plain, dark, rugged, vast, which men of elder days had set to mark the limits of their land. Full on the neck of Mars she hurled the mass, his limbs relaxing, or seven hundred feet prostrate he lay, his hair defiled with dust. Loud rang his armor, and with scornful smile Pallas addressed him thus with vaunting speech. Fool, hast thou yet to learn how mightier far my strength than thine, that me thou darest to meet? Bear thus the burthen of thy mother's curse, who works thee harm in wrath, that thou, the Greeks deserting, aidst the haughty Trojan's cause. She said, and turned away her piercing glance. Him, deeply groaning, scarce to life restored, Jove's daughter, Venus, taking by the hand, led from the field, which, when the white-armed queen beheld, in haste to Pallas thus she cried, O oh, heaven, brave child of aegis-bearing Jove, undaunted! Lo, again this saucy jade, amid the press, the bane of mortals, Mars, leads from the field. But haste thee in pursuit. Thus Juno, Pallas hastened in pursuit, well pleased, and Venus, with her powerful hand assailing, struck upon the breast. At once the goddess's courage and her limbs gave way. There, on the ground, the two together lay, while Pallas o'er them thus with vaunting speech. Would all were such who aid the Trojan cause, Whene'er they meet in fight the warlike Greeks, As valiant and as stout as Venus proves, Who brings her aid to Mars, confronting me. 
Then had our warlike labours long been o'er, And Ilium's strong-built citadel overthrown. Thus Pallas spoke. The white-armed goddess smiled, And to Apollo thus the earth-shaker spoke. Phoebus, why stand we idly thus aloof? The war begun by others, tis not meet, And shame it were, that to Olympus' heights, And to the brazen-floored abode of Jove, We too, without a contest, should return. Thou then begin, as younger, T'were not well for me, in age, and practised more advanced, <laughs> feeble of soul, how senseless is thy heart! Hast thou forgotten all the cruel wrongs we too, alone of all the immortals, bore when here in Ilium for a year we served by Jove's command the proud Laomedon for promised hire, and he our tasks assigned his fortress and a wall both broad and fair i built the town's impregnable defence while thou didst on his plodding herds attend in many crested ida's woody glens but when the joyous seasons in their course had brought our labour's term the haughty king denied our guerdon and with threats dismissed Bound hand and foot, he threatened thee to send, And sell to slavery in the distant isles, And, with the sword, cut off the ears of both. So, in indignant sorrow, we returned, Robbed of the hire he promised, but denied. For this thy favour dost thou show to Troy, And, Dost not rather join thy force to ours, That down upon their knees the Trojans all should perish, With their babes and matrons chaste? Whom answered thus the far-destroying king? Earth-shaking god, I should not gain with thee the esteem of wise, if I with thee should fight for mortal men, poor wretches, who, like leaves, flourish a while, and eat the fruits of earth, but sapless soon decay, from combat then refrain we, and to others leave the strife. He turned, thus saying, for he deemed it shame his father's brother to assail in arms. But him, his sister, goddess of the chase, rebuked, and thus with scornful speech addressed, Fliest thou, Apollo, and to Neptune leavest the easy victory and baseless fame? Why o'er thy shoulder hangs thine idle bow? Ne'er in our father's halls again, as erst among the immortals, let me hear thee boast how thou with Neptune wouldst in arms contend. Thus she, Apollo, Answered not a word, but Jove's imperial consort, filled with wrath, assailed with bitter words the archer queen. How canst thou dare, thou saucy minx, to stand opposed to me, too great for thine assault, despite thy bow? Though Jove hath given thee power, or feeble women, whom thou wilt to slay, e'en as a lion, 
better wert for thee to chase the mountain beasts and flying hinds than thy superiors thus to meet in arms but since thou darest confront me thou shalt know and feel how far my might surpasses thine she said and with the left hand both the wrists of Dian grasping with her ample right the bow and quiver from her shoulders tore and with them as she turned away her head with scornful laughter buffeted her ears the arrows keen were scattered on the ground weeping the goddess fled as flies a dove the hawk's pursuit and in a hollow rock finds refuge doomed not yet to fall a prey so weeping dian fled and left her bow then hermes to latona thus with thee i strive not a shame it were to meet in fight a consort of the cloud-compelling jove freely amid the immortals make thy boast that by thy prowess thou hast vanquished me thus he latona gathered up the bow and fallen arrows scattered here and there amid the whirling dust then these regained following her daughter from the field withdrew meanwhile to high olympus fled the maid and to the brazen floored abode of jove there weeping on her father's knees she sat while quivered round her form the ambrosial robe the son of saturn towards him drew his child and thus with gracious smile inquiry made which of the heavenly powers hath wronged thee thus my child <laughs> as guilty of some open shame to whom the bright crowned goddess of the chase thy wife my father white-armed juno she hath dealt thus rudely with me she from whom all jars and strife among the gods proceed such converse while they held the gates of troy apollo entered for the well-built wall alarmed lest e'en against the will of fate that greeks that day should raise it to the ground the other gods were to olympus gone triumphant these and those in angry mood and took their seats before the cloud-girt sire but on the trojans pressing peleus's son horses and men alike promiscuous slew as in a city which the gods in wrath have fired whose volleying smoke ascends to heaven on all her people grievous toil is cast on many harm and loss such toil such loss achilles wrought amid the trojan host upon a lofty tower the work of gods the aged priam stood and thence beheld by fierce achilles driven in flight confused their courage quite subdued the trojan host then groaning from the tower he hastened down and to the warders cried along the wall stand to the gates and hold them opened wide that in the crowd of fugitives may pour and refuge find for close upon their flight Achilles hangs. Disaster now is near. 
But while our friends, received within the walls, Find time to breathe again, Replace in haste the closely fitting portals, For I fear that man of blood may e'en the city storm. He said, the gates they opened, and drew back the solid bars, the portals opening wide let in the light, but in the vacant space Apollo stood, the Trojan host to save. The flyers, parched with thirst and dust begrimed, straight for the city and the lofty wall made from the plain. Achilles, spear in hand, pressed hotly on the rearmost, for his soul with rage was filled, and maddening lust of fame. And now the lofty gated city of Troy, the son of Greeks, had won, but Phoebus roused Agenor's spirit, a valiant youth and strong, son of Antenor, he his bosom filled with dauntless courage, and beside him stood to turn aside the heavy hand of death, as, veiled in cloud, against the oak he leaned. He, when Achilles's awful form he knew, yet firmly stood, though much perplexed in mind, as thus he communed with his mighty heart, Oh, woe is me, should I attempt to fly before Achilles' might, where fly the rest across the plain, disordered. He would soon o'ertake me, and in flight ignoble slay. Or should I leave the others to their fate, scattered by Peleus' son, and from the wall, and o'er the plain of Troy direct my flight, far as the foot of Ida's hill, and there lie hid in thickest covert, and at eve, refreshed by bathing in the cooling stream, and purged the sweat, retrace my steps to Troy. Yet why, my soul, admit such thoughts as these? For should he mark me flying from the town, and overtake me by his speed of foot, no hope were left of me to escape from death, so far his strength exceeds the strength of man. But how, if boldly, I await him here before the wall? His flesh is not to wounds impervious, but a single life is his. Nor is he more, they say, than mortal man, though Jove assists him, and his triumph wills. He said, and stood collected to await Achilles' onset, and his manly heart with courage filled, was eager for the fray. As when a panther from the thicket's depth comes forth to meet the hunter undismayed, nor turned to flight by baying of the hounds, nor wounded, or by javelin, or by sword, or by the spear transfixed, remits her rage, but fights until she reach her foe, or die. Agenor, so, and Tenor's godlike son, disdained to fly, ere prove Achilles' might. Before his breast his shield's broad orb he bore, And poised his spear, and thus he called aloud, Thy hope, renowned Achilles, Was this day the valiant Trojans' city to destroy? Unconscious of the toils, the woes, That ye around her walls await ye? For within are warriors brave and numerous, Who will fight in her defence, For parents, children, wives. Thou too, Achilles, 
here shall meet thy doom as powerful as thou art and warrior bold he said and threw with stalwart hand the spear achilles's leg he struck below the knee nor missed his aim and loudly rang the greaves of new-wrought tin but back the brazen point rebounded nor the heavenly armor pierced in turn achilles on agenor sprang but phoebus robbed him of his hoped-for prize who veiled in thickest cloud conveyed away antenor's son and from the battle bore to rest in peace while he by guile withdrew the son of peleus from the flying crowd for in agenor's very likeness clad before him stood the far destroying king then fled achilles hastening in pursuit o'er the fertile plain with flying foot pursued beside scamander's eddying stream apollo turned but little space before him flying subtly lured him on each moment hoping to attain his prize meantime the general crowd in panic flight with eager haste the city's refuge sought and all the town with fugitives was filled nor did they dare without the walls to stand for mutual aid nor halt to know what friends were safe who left upon the battlefield but through the gates poured in the hurrying mass who to their active limbs their safety owed End of Book Twenty One Book Twenty Two of The Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. Argument The Death of Hector. The Trojans, being safe within the walls, Hector only stays to oppose Achilles. Priam is struck at his approach, and tries to persuade his son to re enter the town. Hecuba joins his entreaties, but in vain. Hector consults within himself what measures to take, but at the advance of Achilles his resolution fails him, and he flies. Achilles pursues him thrice round the walls of Troy. The gods debate concerning the fate of Hector. At length Minerva descends to the aid of Achilles. She deludes Hector in the shape of Deiphobus, he stands the combat and is slain achilles drags the dead body at his chariot in the sight of priam and hecuba their lamentations tears and despair their cries reach the ears of andromache who ignorant of this was retired into the inner part of the palace she mounts up to the walls and beholds her dead husband she swoons at the spectacle her excess of grief and lamentation the thirtieth day still continues the scene lies under the walls and on the battlements of troy thus they from panic flight like timorous fawns within the walls escaping dried their sweat and drank and quenched their thirst reclining safe on the fair battlements but nearer drew with slanted shields the greeks yet hector 
still in front of Ilium and the Sean Gate, stayed by his evil doom, remained without. Then Phoebus, thus to Peleus's godlike son, Achilles, why with active feet pursue? Thou mortal, me immortal, knowest thou not my godhead? That so hot thy fury burns? Or heedst thou not that all the Trojan host, whom thou hast scared, while thou art here withdrawn, within the walls a refuge safe have found? On me thy sword is vain, I know not death. Enraged Achilles, swift of foot, replied, Deep is the injury, far-darting king, Most hostile of the gods, That at thy hand I bear, Who here hast lured me from the walls, which many a Trojan else had failed to reach, ere by my hand they bit the bloody dust. Me of immortal honour thou hast robbed, and them, thyself from vengeance safe, hast saved. Had I the power, that vengeance thou shouldst feel. Thus saying, and on mightiest deeds intent, he turned him cityward with fiery speed, as when a horse, contending for the prize, whirls the swift car and stretches o'er the plain, e'en so, with active limbs, Achilles raced. Him first the aged Priam's eyes discerned, scouring the plain, in arms all dazzling bright, like to the autumnal star, whose brilliant ray shines eminent amid the depth of night, whom men the dark star of Orion call. The brightest he, but sign to mortal man of evil augury and fiery heat. So shone the brass upon the warrior's breast. The old man groaned aloud, and lifting high his hands, he beat his head, and with loud voice called on his son, imploring. He, unmoved, held post before the gates, awaiting there Achilles' fierce encounter. Him, his sire, with hands outstretched and piteous tone addressed, Hector, my son, await not here alone that warrior's charge, lest thou to fate succumb beneath Pelides' arm, thy better far. Accursed be he, would that the immortal gods so favoured him as I, then should his corpse soon to the vultures and the dogs be given, so should my heart a load of anguish lose, by whom I am of many sons bereaved, many and brave, whom he has slain or sold to distant isles in slavery. And e'en now within the city walls I look in vain, for two, like e'en brave, and Polydor, my gallant sons, by fair Laothi, if haply yet they live, with brass and gold their ransom shall be paid. Good store of these we can command, for with his daughter fair, a wealthy dowry aged Altes gave. But to the viewless shades should they have gone, deep where their mother's sorrow and my own but of the general public well i know far lighter were the grief than if they heard that thou hadst fallen beneath achilles's hand then enter now my son the city gates and of the women and the men of troy be still the guardian nor to peleus's son 
with thine own life immortal glory give look too on me with pity me on whom e'en on the threshold of mine age hath jove a bitter burthen cast condemned to see my son struck down my daughters dragged away in servile bonds our chamber's sanctity invaded and our babes by hostile hands dashed to the ground and by ferocious greeks enslaved the widows of my slaughtered sons on me at last the ravening dogs shall feed when by some foeman's hand by sword or lance my soul shall from my body be divorced those very dogs which i myself have bred fed at my table guardians of my gate shall lap my blood and overgorged shall lie e'en on my threshold that a youth should fall victim to mars beneath a foeman's spear may well be seen his years and if he fall with honour though he die yet glorious he but when the hoary head and hoary beard and naked corpse to ravening dogs are given no sadder sight can wretched mortals see the old man spoke and from his head he tore the hoary hair yet hector firm remained then to the front his mother rushed in tears her bosom bare with either hand her breast sustaining and with tears addressed him thus hector my child thy mother's breast revere and on this bosom if thine infant woes have e'er been hushed bear now in mind dear child the debt thou owest and from within the walls ward off this fearful man nor in the field encounter cursed be he should he prevail and slay thee not upon the funeral bed my child my own the offspring of my womb shall i deplore thee nor thy widowed wife but far away beside the grecian ships thy corpse shall to the ravening dogs be given thus they with tears and earnest prayers imploring addressed their son yet hector firm remained waiting the approach of peleus's godlike son as when a snake upon the mountain side with deadly venom charged beside his hole awaits the traveller and filled with rage coiled round his hole his baleful glances darts so filled with dauntless courage hector stood scorning retreat his gleaming buckler propped against the jutting tower then deeply moved thus with his warlike soul communion held o woe is me if i should enter now the city gates i should the just reproach encounter of polydamus who first his counsel gave within the walls to lead the trojan forces on that fatal night when great achilles in the field appeared i heeded not his counsel would i had now since my folly hath the people slain i well might blush to meet the trojan men and long-robed dames of troy lest some might say to me inferior far this woeful loss to hector's blind self-confidence we owe thus shall they say 
twere better far or from achilles slain in open fight back to return in triumph or myself to perish nobly in my country's cause what if my bossy shield i lay aside and stubborn helmet and my ponderous spear propping against the wall go forth to meet the unmatched achilles what if i engage that helen's self and with her all the spoil and all that paris in his hollow ships brought here to troy whence first this war arose should be restored and to the greeks be paid an ample tribute from the city's store her secret treasures and hereafter bind the trojans by their elders solemn oaths not to withhold but fairly to divide what heir of wealth our much-loved city holds but wherefore entertain such thoughts my soul should i so meet him what if he should show nor pity nor remorse but slay me there defenceless as a woman and unarmed not this the time nor he the man with whom by forest oak or rock like youth and maid to hold light talk as youth and maid might hold better to dare the fight and know at once to whom the victory is decreed by heaven thus as he stood he mused but near approached achilles terrible as plumed mars from his right shoulder brandishing aloft the ashen spear of peleus while around flashed his bright armour dazzling as the glare of burning fire or of the rising sun hector beheld and trembled at the sight nor dared he there await the attack but left the gates behind and terror-stricken fled forward with flying foot pelides rushed as when a falcon bird of swiftest flight from some high mountain top on timorous dove swoops fiercely down she from beneath in fear evades the stroke he dashing through the brake shrill shrieking pounces on his destined prey so hector flying from his keen pursuit beneath the walls his active sinews plied they by the watch-tower and beneath the wall where stood the wind-beat fig-tree raced amain along the public road until they reached the fairly flowing fount whence issued forth from double source scamander's eddying streams one with hot current flows and from beneath as from a furnace clouds of steam arise mid summer's heat the other rises cold as hail or snow or water crystallized beside the fountains stood the washing troughs of well-wrought stone where erst the wives of troy and daughters fair their choicest garments washed in peaceful times ere came the sons of greece there raced they one in flight and one pursuing good he who fled but better who pursued with fiery speed for on that race was staked no common victim no ignoble ox the prize at stake was mighty hector's life as when the solid-footed horses fly around the course contending for the prize tripod or woman of her lord bereft so raced they thrice around the walls of troy with active feet and all the gods beheld 
Then thus began the sire of gods and men, A woeful sight mine eyes behold, A man I love in flight around the walls. My heart for Hector grieves, Who, now upon the crown of deeply furrowed Ida, Now again on Ilium's heights, With fat of choicest bowls hath piled mine altar, Whom around the walls with flying speed Achilles now pursues. Give me your counsel, gods, and say, From death if we shall rescue him, Or must he die, brave as he is, Beneath Pelides' hand? To whom the blue-eyed goddess Pallas thus O father, lightning flashing, cloud-girt king, What words are these? Wouldst thou, a mortal man, Long doomed by fate, again from death preserve? Do as thou wilt, but not with our consent. To whom the cloud-compeller thus replied, be of good cheer, my child. Unwillingly I speak, yet both thy wishes to oppose. Have then thy will, and draw not back thy hand. His words fresh impulse gave to Pallas's zeal, and from Olympus's heights in haste she sped. Meanwhile, on Hector, with untiring hate, the swift Achilles pressed, as when a hound through glen and tangled brake pursues a fawn, roused from its lair upon the mountain side, and if a while it should evade pursuit, low crouching in the copse, yet quests he back, searching unwearied till he finds the trace. So Hector sought to baffle, but in vain, the keen pursuit of Peleus' active son. Oft as he sought the shelter of the gates beneath the well-built towers, if haply thence his comrades' weapons might some aid afford, so oft his foemen with superior speed would cut him off and turn him to the plain, he toward the city still essayed his flight, and, as in dreams, when one pursues in vain, one seeks in vain to fly, the other seeks as vainly to pursue, so could not now Achilles reach, nor Hector quit his foe. Yet how should Hector now the doom of death have scaped, had not Apollo once again, and for the last time, to his rescue come, and given him strength and suppleness of limb. Then to the crowd Achilles, with his head, made sign that none at Hector should presume to cast a spear, lest one might wound, and so the greater glory obtain, while he himself must be contented with the second place. But when, the fourth time, in their rapid course, the founts were reached, the Eternal Father hung his golden scales aloft, and placed in each the lots of doom, for great Achilles won, for Hector one, and held them by the midst. Down sank the scale, weighted with Hector's death, down to the shades, and Phoebus left his side. Then to Pelides came the blue-eyed maid, and stood beside him, and bespoke him thus. Achilles, loved of heaven, I trust that now, to thee and me, 
great glory shall accrue in Hector's fall, insatiate of the fight. Escape he cannot now, though at the feet of Aegis bearing Jove, on his behalf, with earnest prayer, Apollo prostrate fall. But stay thou here and take thy breath, while I persuade him to return and dare the fight. So Pallas spoke, and he, with joy obeying, stood leaning on his brass-barbed ashen spear. The goddess left him there, and went, the form and voice assuming of Deiphobus, in search of godlike Hector. Him she found, and standing near, with winged words addressed, Sorely, good brother, hast thou been bested by fierce Achilles, who around the walls hath chased thee with swift foot? Now stand we both for mutual succour, and his onset wait. To whom great Hector of the glancing helm, Deiphobus, of all my brothers, sons of Hecuba and Priam, thou hast been still dearest to my heart, and now the more I honour thee, who darest on my behalf, seeing my peril, from within the walls to sally forth, while others skulk behind. To whom the blue-eyed goddess thus replied, with many prayers, good brother, both our sire and honoured mother, and our comrades all, successively implored me to remain. Such fear is fallen on all. But in my soul, on thine account, too deep a grief I felt. Now forward, boldly, spare we not our spears. Make trial if Achilles to the ships from both of us our bloody spoils can bear, or by thine arm himself may be subdued. Thus Pallas leered him on with treacherous wile. But when the two were met, and close at hand, first spoke great Hector of the glancing helm, no more before thee, Peleus' son, I fly. Thrice have I fled around the walls, nor dared await thine onset. Now my spirit is roused to stand before thee, to be slain or slay. But let us first the immortal gods invoke, the surest witnesses and guardians they of compacts. At my hand no foul disgrace shalt thou sustain, if Jove with victory shall crown my firm endurance, and thy life to me be forfeit. Of thine armour stripped, I promise thee, Achilles, to the Greeks thy body to restore. Do thou the like, with fierce regard, Achilles answered thus, Hector, thou object of my deadly hate, talk not to me of compacts. As tween men and lions no firm concord can exist, nor wolves and lambs in harmony unite, but ceaseless enmity between them dwells, so not in friendly terms, nor compact firm, can thou and I unite, till one of us glut with his blood the mail-clad warrior Mars. Mind thee of all thy fence, behooves thee now to prove a spearman skilled and warrior brave. For thee escape is none, 
Now by my spear hath Pallas doomed thy death, my comrade's blood, which thou hast shed, shall all be now avenged. He said, and poising hurled his weighty spear, but Hector saw and shunned the blow. He stooped, and o'er his shoulder flew the brass-tipped spear, and in the ground was fixed. But Pallas drew the weapon forth, and to Achilles' hand, all unobserved of Hector, gave it back. Then Hector thus to Peleus' matchless son, Thine aim has failed, nor truly has my fate, thou godlike son of Peleus, been to thee from heaven revealed. Such was indeed thy boast, but flippant was thy speech, and subtly framed to scare me with big words, and make me prove false to my wanted prowess and renown. Not in my back will I receive thy spear, but through my breast confronting thee, if Jove have to thine arm indeed such triumph given. Now, if thou canst, my spear in turn elude, may it be deeply buried in thy flesh. For lighter were to Troy the load of war, if thou, the greatest of her foes, wert slain. He said, and poising hurled his ponderous spear, nor missed his aim. Full in the midst he struck Pelides' shield, but glancing from the shield the weapon bounded off. Hector was grieved that thus his spear had bootless left his hand. He stood aghast, no second spear was nigh, and loudly on Deiphobus called a spear to bring. But he was far away. Then Hector knew that he was duped, and cried, O oh, heaven, the gods above have doomed my death. I deemed indeed that brave Deiphobus was near at hand, but he within the walls is safe, and I by Pallas am betrayed. Now is my death at hand, nor far away. Escape is none, since so hath Jove decreed, and Jove's far-darting son who heretofore have been my guards, my fate hath found me now. Yet not without a struggle let me die, nor all inglorious, but let some great act, which future days may hear of, mark my fall. Thus, as he spoke, his sharp-edged sword he drew, Ponderous and vast, suspended at his side, collected for the spring, and forward dashed. As when an eagle, bird of loftiest flight, through the dark clouds swoops downward on the plain to seize some tender lamb or cowering hare, so Hector rushed and waved his sharp-edged sword. Achilles' his wrath was roused, with fury wild his soul was filled. Before his breast he bore his well-wrought shield, and fiercely on his brow nodded the four-plumed helm, as on the breeze floated the golden hairs, with which the crest by Vulcan's hand was thickly interlaced. And as amid the star's unnumbered host, when twilight yields to night, one star appears, Hesper, the brightest star that shines in heaven, gleamed the sharp-pointed lance, which in his right Achilles poised 
on godlike Hector's doom intent, and scanning eagerly to see where from attack his body least was fenced all else the glittering armour guarded well which hector from patroclus's corpse had stripped one chink appeared just where the collar-bone the neck and shoulder parts besides the throat where lies exposed the swiftest road of death there levelled he as hector onward rushed right through the yielding neck the lance was driven but severed not the windpipe nor destroyed his power of speech prone in the dust he fell and o'er him vaunting thus achilles spoke <laughs> hector patroclus stripping of his arms thy hope was that thyself wast safe and i not present brought no terror to thy soul fool in the hollow ships i yet remained i his avenger mightier far than he i who am now thy conqueror by the dogs and vultures shall thy corpse be foully torn while him the greeks with funeral rites shall grace whom answered hector of the glancing helm prostrate and helpless by thy soul thy knees thy parents heads achilles i beseech let not my corpse from grecian dogs be torn except the ample stores of brass and gold which as my ransom by my honoured sire and mother shall be paid thee but my corpse restore that so the men and wives of troy may deck with honours due my funeral buyer to whom with fierce aspect achilles thus knee me no knees vile hound nor prate to me of parents such my hatred that almost i could persuade myself to tear and eat thy mangled flesh such wrongs i have to avenge he lives not who can save thee from the dogs not though with ransom ten and twenty-fold he here should stand and yet should promise more no not though priam's royal self should sue to be allowed for gold to ransom thee no not e'en so thy mother shall obtain to lay thee out upon the couch and mourn o'er thee her offspring but on all thy limbs shall dogs and carrion vultures make their feast to whom thus hector of the glancing helm dying i know thee well nor did i hope to change thy purpose iron is thy soul but see that on thy head i bring not down the wrath of heaven <laughs> when by the seen gate the hand of paris with apollo's aid a brave warrior as thou art shall strike thee down e'en as he spoke his eyes were closed in death and to the viewless shades his spirit fled mourning his fate his youth and vigour lost to him though dead achilles thus replied die thou my fate i then shall meet when e'er jove and the immortal gods 
shall so decree. He said, and from the corpse his spear withdrew, and laid aside, then stripped the armor off, with blood besmeared. The Greeks around him thronged, gazing on Hector's noble form and face, and none approached that did not add a wound. And one to other looked and said, Good faith, Hector is easier far to handle now than when erewhile he wrapped our ships in fire. Thus would they say, then stab the dead anew. But when the son of Peleus, swift of foot, had stripped the armor from the corpse, he rose, and standing thus the assembled Greeks addressed, O friend, the chiefs and counsellors of Greece, since heaven hath granted us this man to slay, whose single arm hath wrought us more of ill than all the rest combined, advance we now before the city in arms, and trial make what is the mind of Troy, if Hector slain, they from the citadel intend retreat, or still, despite their loss, their ground maintain. But wherefore entertain such thoughts, my soul, beside the ships, unwept, unburied, lies Patroclus, whom I never can forget, while numbered with the living, and my limbs have power to move. In Hades, though the dead may be forgotten, yet e'en there will I the memory of my loved companion keep. Now to the ships return, we, sons of Greece, glad paeans singing. With us he shall go, great glorious ours, the godlike Hector slain, the pride of Troy, and as a god revered. And foully Hector's corpse misused. Of either foot he pierced the tendon through, that from the ankle passes to the heel, and to his chariot bound with leathern thongs, leaving the head to trail along the ground. Then mounted, with the captured arms, his car, and urged his horses. Nothing loth, they flew. A cloud of dust the trailing body raised. Loose hung his glossy hair, and in the dust was laid that noble head, so graceful once, now to foul insult, doomed by Jove's decree, in his own country, by a foeman's hand. So lay the head of Hector. At the sight his aged mother tore her hair, and far from off her head the glittering veil she threw, and with loud cries her slaughtered son bewailed. Piteous his father groaned, and all around was heard the voice of wailing and of woe. Such was the cry, as if the beetling height of Ilium all were smouldering in the fire. Scarce in his anguish could the crowd restrain. The old man, from issuing through the Dardan gates, low in the dust he rolled, Imploring all, entreating by his name each several man. Forbear, my friends, though sorrowing, stay me not. Leave me to reach alone the Grecian ships, And there implore this man of violence, 
this haughty chief, if haply he my years may reference, and have pity on my age, for he too has a father, like to me, Peleus, by whom he was begot and read the bane of Troy, and most of all to me, the cause of endless grief, who by his hand have been of many stalwart sons bereft. Yet all, though grieved for all, I less lament than one whose loss will sink me to the grave. Hector, who would to heaven that in mine arms he could have died, with mourning then, and tears, we might have satisfied our grief, both she who bore him, hapless mother, and myself. Weeping he spoke, and with him wept the crowd. Then mid the women Hecuba poured forth her vehement grief. My child, O oh, whither now, heart-stricken, shall I go, of thee bereft, of thee, who wast to me by night and day, and a boast, the strength of all the men of Troy, and women, as a god they worship thee, for in thy life thou wast the glory of all, but fate hath found thee now. Weeping she spoke, but not as yet was known to Hector's wife. To her no messenger had brought the tidings that without the walls remained her husband. In her house, withdrawn, a web she wove, all purple, double wool, with varied flowers in rich embroidery, and to her neat-haired maidens gave command to place the largest cauldrons on the fire, that with warm baths, returning from the fight, Hector might be refreshed. Unconscious she, that by Achilles' hand, with Pallas' aid, far from the path, was godlike Hector slain. The sounds of wailing reached her from the tower, tottered her limbs, the distaff left her hand, and to her neat-haired maidens thus she spoke. Haste, follow me, some, too, that I may know what mean these sounds. My honoured mother's voice I hear, and in my breast my beating heart leaps to my mouth, my limbs refuse to move. Some evil, sure, on Priam's house impends. Be unfulfilled, my words. Yet much I fear, lest my brave Hector be cut off alone by great Achilles from the walls of Troy, chased to the plain, the desperate courage quenched, which ever led him from the general ranks far in advance, and bade him yield to none. Then from the house she rushed, like one distract with beating heart, and with her went her maids. But when she reached the tower, where stood the crowd, and mounted on the wall, she looked around, and saw the body, which with insult foul the flying steeds were dragging toward the ships. Then sudden darkness overspread her eyes. Backward she fell, and gasped her spirit away. Far off were flung the adornments of her head, the net, the fillet, and the woven bands, the nuptial veil by golden Venus given. That day, when Hector of the glancing helm led from Eetion's house, his wealthy pride. The sisters of her husband round her breast, 
and held, as in the deadly swoon she lay. But when her breath and spirit returned again, with sudden burst of anguish, thus she cried, Hector, oh, woe is me! To misery we both were born alike, thou here in Troy, in Priam's royal palace, I in Thebes, by wooded Placos, in Aetian's house, who nursed my infancy. Unhappy he, unhappier I, would I had ne'er been born. Now thou beneath the depths of earth art gone, gone to the viewless shades, and me hast left a widow in thy house, in deepest woe, our child, an infant still, thy child, and mine, ill-fated parents both, nor thou to him, Hector, shalt be a guard, nor he to thee, for though he scape this tearful war with Greece, yet not for him remains, but ceaseless woe, and strangers on his heritage shall seize. No young companions own the orphan boy. With downcast eyes and cheeks bedewed with tears, his father's friends approaching, pinched with want, he hangs upon the skirt of one, of one he plucks the cloak. Perchance, in pity, some may at their tables let him sip the cup, moisten his lips, but scarce his palate touch, while youths with both surviving parents blessed may drive him from their feast with blows and taunts. Be gone, thy father sits not at our board. Then, weeping, to his widowed mother's arms he flies, that orphan boy, a Styanax, who on his father's knees erewhile was fed on choicest marrow and the fat of lambs, and when in sleep his childish play was hushed, was lulled to slumber in his nurse's arms on softest couch, by all delights surrounded. But grief awaits him now, a Styanax of Trojans so surnamed, since thou alone wast Troy's defence and guard. But now, on thee, beside the beaked ships, far from thy parents, when the ravening dogs have had their fill, the wriggling worms shall feed, on thee all naked, while within thy house lies store of raiment, rich and rare, the work of women's hands. These will I burn with fire, not for thy need, thou ne'er shalt wear them more, but for thine honour in the sight of Troy. Weeping, she spoke. The women joined her wail. End of Book 22。Book 23, Part 1 of The Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward, Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. Argument. Funeral Games in Honor of Patroclus. Achilles and the Myrmidons do honor to the body of Patroclus. After the funeral feast, he retires to the seashore, where, falling asleep, the ghost of his friend appears to him, 
and demands the rites of burial. The next morning the soldiers are sent with mules and wagons to fetch wood for the pyre. The funeral procession and the offering their hair to the dead. Achilles sacrifices several animals, and lastly twelve Trojan captives at the pile, then sets fire to it. He pays libations to the winds, which, at the instance of Iris, rise and raise the flame. When the pile has burned all night, they gather the bones, place them in an urn of gold, and raise the tomb. Achilles institutes the funeral games, the chariot race, the fights of the cestus, the wrestling, the foot race, the single combat, the discus, the shooting with arrows, the darting the javelin, the various descriptions of which, and the various success of the several antagonists, make the greatest part of the book. In this book ends the thirtieth day. The night following, the ghost of Patroclus appears to Achilles. The one and thirtieth day is employed in felling the timber for the pile, the two and thirtieth in burning it, and the three and thirtieth in the games. The scene is generally on the seashore. Thus they, throughout the city, made their moan. But when the Greeks had come, where lay their ships, by the broad Hellespont, their several ways they each pursued, dispersing. Yet not so Achilles let his Myrmidons disperse, but thus his warlike comrades he addressed. My faithful comrades, valiant Myrmidons, Loose we not yet our horses from the cars, But for Patroclus mourn, Approaching near with horse and car, Such tribute claim the dead, Then free indulgence to our sorrows given, Loose we the steeds, and share the evening meal. He said, and they, with mingled voices raised the solemn dirge. Achilles led the strain. Thrice round the dead they drove their sleek-skinned steeds. Morning, with hearts by Thetis grief inspired, with tears the sands, with tears the warriors' arms were wet, so mighty was the chief they mourned. Then on his comrade's breast Achilles laid his blood-stained hands, and thus began the wail. All hail, Patroclus, though in Pluto's realm, all that I promised, lo, I now perform, that on the corpse of Hector, hither dragged, our dogs should feed, and that twelve noble youths, the sons of Troy, before thy funeral pyre, my hand, in vengeance for thy death, should slay. He said, and foully Hector's corpse misused, flung prostrate in the dust, Beside the couch where lay Menetius's son. His comrades then their glittering armor doffed of polished brass, And loosed their neighing steeds. Then round the ship of Peleus's son in countless numbers sat, While he the abundant funeral feast dispensed. There Many a steer lay stretched beneath the knife, and many a sheep, and many a bleating goat, and many a white-tusked porker, rich in fat, there lay extended, singeing o'er the fire, and blood in torrents 
flowed round the corpse. To Agamemnon, then, the kings of Greece, the royal son of Peleus, swift of foot, conducted. Yet with him they scarce prevailed, so fierce his anger for his comrade's death. But when to Agamemnon's tent they came, he to the clear-voiced heralds gave command an ample tripod on the fire to place, if haply Peleus's son he might persuade to wash away the bloody stains of war. But sternly he, and with an oath, refused. No, by great Jove, I swear, of all the gods, highest and mightiest, water shall not touch this head of mine, till on the funeral pyre I see the body of Patroclus laid, and build his tomb, and cut my votive hair. For while I live and move mid mortal men, no second grief like this can pierce my soul. Observe we now the mournful funeral feast. But thou, great Agamemnon, king of men, send forth at early dawn, and to the camp bring store of fuel, and all else prepare that with provision meet the dead may pass down to the realms of night. So shall the fire from out our sight consume our mighty dead, and to their wanted tasks the troops return. He said, they listened, and his words obeyed. Then busily the evening meal prepared, and shared the social feast, nor lacked thereat. The rage of thirst and hunger satisfied, each to their several tents the rest repaired. But on the many dashing ocean's shore, Pelides lay amid his myrmidons with bitter groans. In a clear space he lay, where broke the waves, continuous on the beach. There, circumfused around him, gentle sleep, lulling the sorrows of his heart to rest, o'ercame his senses, for the hot pursuit of Hector round the breezy heights of Troy, his active limbs had wearied. As he slept, sudden, appeared Patroclus's mournful shade, his very self, his height, and beauteous eyes, and voice, the very garb he wont to wear. Above his head it stood, and thus it spoke. Sleep'st thou, Achilles, mindless of thy friend, neglecting, not the living, but the dead? Hasten my funeral rites, that I may pass through Hades' gloomy gates. Ere those be done, the spirits and spectres of departed men drive me far from them, nor allow to cross the abhorred river. But forlorn and sad, I wander through the wide-spread realms of night. And give me now thy hand, whereon to weep, for never more, when laid upon the pyre, shall I return from Hades. Never more, apart from all our comrades, shall we too, as friends, sweet counsel take. For me, Stern death, the common lot of man, has oped his mouth. Thou too, Achilles, rival of the gods, art destined here beneath the walls of Troy to meet thy doom. 
Yet one thing must I add, and make, if thou wilt grant it, one request. Let not my bones be laid apart from thine, Achilles. But together, as our youth was spent together in thy father's house, since first my sire, Anetius, me, a boy, from Opus brought, a luckless homicide, who of Amphidamus, by evil chance, had slain the son, disputing o'er the dice. Me, noble Peleus, in his house received, and kindly nursed, and thine attendant named. So, in one urn be now our bones enclosed, the golden vase, thy goddess mother's gift. Whom answered thus Achilles, swift of foot? Why art thou here, loved being? Why on me these several charges lay? Whate'er thou bidst, will I perform, And all thy mind fulfil. But draw thou near, and in one short embrace, Let us, while yet we may, our grief indulge. Thus, as he spoke, he spread his longing arms, But not he clasped, and with a wailing cry Vanished, like smoke, the spirit beneath the earth. Up sprang Achilles, all amazed, And smote his hands together, and lamenting cried, O oh, heaven, there are, then, in the realms below, Spirits and spectres, unsubstantial all, For through the night Patroclus's shade hath stood, Weeping and wailing at my side, And told his bidding, the image of himself it seemed, he said, his words the general grief aroused. To them, as round the piteous dead they mourned, appeared the rosy-fingered morn, and straight from all the camp, by Agamemnon sent, went forth in search of fuel, men and mules, led by a valiant chief, Meriones, the follower of renowned Idomeneus. Their felling axes in their hands they bore, and twisted ropes, their mules before them driven. Now up, now down, now sideways, now a slope, they journeyed on. But when they reached the foot of spring abounding Ida, they began, with axes keen, to hew the lofty oaks. They, loudly crashing, fell. The wood they clove, and bound it to the mules. These took their way through the thick brushwood, hurrying to the plain. The axemen, too, so bade Meriones, the follower of renowned Idomeneus, were laden all with logs which on the beach they laid in order, where a lofty mound, in memory of Patroclus and himself, Achilles had designed. When all the store of wood was duly laid, the rest remained in masses seated. But Achilles bade the warlike Myrmidons their armor don, and harness each his horses to his car. They rose and donned their arms, and on the cars, warriors and charioteers, their places took. First came the horse, and then a cloud of foot unnumbered. In the midst Patroclus came, borne by his comrades, all the corpse with hair they covered o'er, 
which from their heads they shore. Behind, Achilles held his head, and mourned the noble friend whom to the tomb he bore. Then, on the spot by Peleus' son assigned, they laid him down, and piled the wood on high. Then, a fresh thought Achilles' mind conceived. Standing apart, the yellow locks he shore, which, as an offering to Spurcius's stream, he nursed in rich profusion. Sorrowing, then, looked o'er the dark blue sea, as thus he spoke. Spurcius, all in vain to thee his prayer, my father Peleus made, and vowed that I, returned in safety to my native land, to thee should dedicate my hair, and pay a solemn hecatomb, with sacrifice of fifty rams, unblemished, to the springs whereon thy consecrated soil is placed, thine incense-honoured altar. So he vowed, but thou, the boon, withholdst, since I no more my native land may see, the hair he vowed to brave Patroclus thus I dedicate. He said, and on his comrade's hand he laid the locks, his act the general grief aroused. And now the setting sun had found them still indulging, and now the setting sun had found them still indulging o'er the dead. But Peleus' son, approaching, thus to Agamemnon spoke. Atreides, for to thee the people pay readiest obedience, Mourning too prolonged may weary. Thou then from the pyre the rest disperse, And bid prepare the morning meal. Ours be the farther charge, To whom the dead was chiefly dear. Yet let the chiefs remain. The monarch Agamemnon heard and straight dispersed the crowd amid their several ships. The appointed band remained, and piled the wood. A hundred feet each way they built the pyre, and on the summit, sorrowing, laid the dead. Then many a sheep and many a slow-paced ox they flayed and dressed around the funeral pyre. Of all the beasts Achilles took the fat, and covered o'er the corpse from head to foot, then heaped the slaughtered carcasses around, then jars of honey placed, and fragrant oils resting upon the couch, next groaning loud four powerful horses on the pyre he threw, then of nine dogs that at their master's board had fled, he slaughtered two upon his pyre. Last, with the sword, by evil counsel swayed, twelve noble youths he slew, the sons of Troy. The fire's devouring might he then applied, and, groaning, on his loved companion called. All hail, Patroclus, though in Pluto's realm, all that I promised, lo, I now perform. On twelve brave sons of Trojan sires, with thee the flames shall feed. But Hector, Priam's son, not to the fire, but to the dogs I give. Such was Achilles' threat, but him the dogs molested not, for Venus, 
night and day, daughter of Jove, the ravening dogs restrained, and all the corpse o'erlaid with roseate oil, ambrosial, that, though dragged along the earth, the noble dead might not receive a wound. Apollo, too, a cloudy veil from heaven spread o'er the plain, and covered all the space where lay the dead. Nor let the blazing sun the flesh upon his limbs and muscles parch. Yet burnt not up Patroclus's funeral pyre. Then a fresh thought Achilles' mind conceived. Standing apart, on both the winds he called, Boreas and Zephyrus, and added vows of costly sacrifice, and, pouring forth libations from a golden goblet, prayed their presence, that the wood might haste to burn, and with the fire consume the dead. His prayer swift Iris heard and bore it to the winds. They, in the hall of gusty Zephyrus, were gathered round the feast. In haste appearing, swift Iris on the stony threshold stood. They saw, and rising all, besought her each to sit beside him. She, with their requests, refused compliance, and addressed them thus. No seat for me, for I, o'er the ocean stream, from hence am bound to Ethiopia's shore, to share the sacred feast, and hecatombs, which there they offer to the immortal gods. But Boreas, thee, and loud-voiced Zephyrus, with vows of sacrifice, Achilles calls to fan the funeral pyre, whereon is laid Patroclus, mourned by all the host of Greece. She said, and vanished. They with rushing sound rose, and before them drove the hurrying clouds. Soon o'er the sea, they swept. The stirring breeze ruffled the waves. The fertile shores of Troy they reached, and falling on the funeral pyre, loud roared the crackling flames. They, all night long, with current brisk, together fanned the fire. All night Achilles, from a golden bowl, drew forth and in his hand a double cup, the wine outpouring, moistened all the earth, still calling on his lost Patroclus's shade. As mourns a father o'er a youthful son, whose early death hath wrung his parents' hearts, so mourned Achilles over his friend's remains, prostrate beside the pyre, and groaned aloud. But when the star of Lucifer appeared, the harbinger of light, from whom following close spreads o'er the sea the saffron-robed morn, then paled the smouldering fire, and sank the flame, and o'er the Thracian sea that groaned and heaved beneath their passage, Home the winds returned, and, weary, from the fire a space withdrawn, Achilles lay, o'ercome by gentle sleep. Anon, awakened by the tramp and din of crowds that followed Atreus's royal son, he sat upright, and thus addressed his speech. Thou son of Atreus, and ye chiefs of Greece, far as the flames extended, quench we first with ruddy wine the embers of the pyre. And of Menetius' son, Patroclus, next, with care distinguishing, collect the bones, 
nor are they hard to know, for in the midst he lay, while round the edges of the pyre horses and men commixed. The rest were burnt. Let these, between a double layer of fat enclosed, and in a golden urn remain, till I myself shall in the tomb be laid, and o'er them build a mound, not over large, but of proportions meet. In days to come, ye Greeks, who after me shall here remain, complete the work, and build it broad and high. Thus spoke Achilles. They his words obeyed. Far as the flames had reached, and thickly strown the embers lay, they quenched with ruddy wine. Then tearfully their gentle comrades' bones collected, and with double layers of fat enclosed, and in a golden urn encased. Then in the tent they laid them, overspread with veil of linen fair, then, meeting out the allotted space, the deep foundations laid around the pyre, and o'er them heaped the earth. Their task accomplished, all had now withdrawn. But Peleus' son, the vast assembly, stayed, and bade them sit. Then, prizes of the games, tripods and cauldrons, from the tents he brought, and noble steeds, and mules, and sturdy steers, and women, fair of form, and iron whore. First, for the contest of the flying cars, the prizes he displayed, a woman fair, where, well skilled in household cares, a tripod vast, Two handled, two and twenty measures round, these both were for the victor. For the next, a mare, unbroken, six years old, in fall of a mule colt. The third, a cauldron bright, capacious of four measures, white and pure, by fire as yet untarnished. For the fourth, of gold two talents. For the fifth, a face with double cup, untouched by fire, he gave. Then, standing up, he thus addressed the Greeks. Thou son of Atreus, and ye well-grieved Greeks, before ye are the prizes which await the contest of the cars. But if, ye Greeks, for any other cause these games were held, I to my tent should bear the foremost prize. For well ye know how far my steeds excel, steeds of immortal race, which Neptune gave to Peleus, he to me his son transferred. But from the present strife we stand aloof, my horses and myself, they now have lost the daring courage, and the gentle hand of him who drove them, and with water pure washed oft their manes, and bathed with fragrant oil. For him they stand and mourn, with drooping heads, down to the ground, their hearts with sorrow filled. But ye, in order, range yourselves, who boast your well-built chariots and your horses' speed. He said. Up sprang the eager charioteers, the first of all, Eumelus, king of men, son of Admetus, matchless charioteer. Next, Tydeus' son, the valiant Diomed, with Trojan horses from Aeneas won when, by Apollo's aid, himself escaped. Then 
heaven-born Menelaus, Atreus's son, two flying coursers harnessed to his car. His own, Podargus, had for yoke-fellow Ethe, a mare by Agamemnon lent. Her Echepolis to Atrides gave, and Chyses's son, that to the wars of Troy he might not be compelled, but safe at home, enjoy his ease. For Jove had blessed his store with ample wealth in Sicyon's wide domain. Her now he yoked, impatient for the course. The fourth Antilochus, the gallant son of Nestor, son of Neleus, mighty chief, harnessed his sleek skinned steeds. Of Pylian race were they who bore his car. To him his sire sage counsel poured in understanding ears. Antilochus, though young in years thou art, yet Jove and Neptune love thee, and have well instructed thee in horsemanship. Of me thou needst no counsel. Skilled around the goal to whirl the chariot, but thou hast, of all, the slowest horses, whence I augur ill. But though their horses have the speed of thine, in skill not one of them surpasses thee. Then thou, dear boy, exert thine every art, that so thou mayest not to fail to gain a prize. By skill, far more than strength, the woodman fells the sturdy oak. By skill, the steersman guides his flying ship across the dark blue sea, though shattered by the blast. Twixt charioteer and charioteer, tis skill that draws the line. One, vainly trusting to his courser's speed, drives reckless here and there, o'er all the course his horses, unrestrained, at random run. Another, with inferior horses far, but better skilled, still fixing on the goal, his eye turns closely round, nor overlooks the moment when to draw the rein, but holds his steady course, and on the leader waits. A mark I give thee now, thou canst not miss. There stands a withered trunk, some six feet high, of oak or pine, unrotted by the rain. On either side have two white stones been placed, where meet two roads, and all around there lies a smooth and level course. Here stood, perchance, the tomb of one who died long years ago, or former generations here have placed, as now Achilles hath decreed, a goal. There drive, as only not to graze the post, and leaning o'er the wicker body, leave close on the left the stones. Thine off-side horse then urge with voice and whip, and slack his rein, and let the near-side horse so closely graze, as that thy knave may seem to touch the goal. But yet beware, lest striking on the stone thy steeds thou injure, and thy chariot break, a source of triumph to thy rivals all, of shame to thee. But thou sage caution use, for following, if thou make the turn the first, not one of all shall pass thee, or o'ertake. Not though Arian's self were in the car, Adrastus's flying steed of heavenly race, nor those which here Laomedon possessed. This said, and to his son his counsels given, 
the aged Nestor to his seat withdrew. Fifth in the lists, Meriones appeared. They mounted on their cars and cast their lots. Achilles shook the helmet. First leaped forth the lot of Nestor's son, Antilochus. Next came the king Eumelus, after whom the valiant Menelaus, Atreus's son. The fourth, Meriones, and last of all, but ablest far, Tydides drew his place. They stood in line. Achilles pointed out, here on the level plain, the distant goal, and there, in charge, the godlike phoenix placed, his father's ancient follower, to observe the course assigned, and true report to make. Then all at once their whips they raised, and urged by rein and hand and voice their eager steeds. They from the ships pursued their rapid course athwart the distant plain. Beneath their chests rose, like a cloud or hurricane, the dust. Loose floated on the breeze their ample manes. The cars, now skimmed along the fertile ground, now bounded high in air. The charioteers stood up aloft, and every bosom beat with hope of victory, each with eager shout cheering his steeds that scoured the dusty plain. But when the farthest limits of the course attained, they, turned beside the hoary sea, strained to their utmost speed, were plainly seen the qualities of each. Then in the front appeared Eumelus's flying mares, and next the Trojan horses of Tydides came. Nor these were far behind, but following close, they seemed in act to leap upon the car. Eumelus, on his neck and shoulders broad, felt their warm breath. For o'er him, as they flew, their heads were downward bent. And now, perchance, had he, or passed, or made an even race, but that, incensed with valiant Diomed, Apollo wrested from his hands the whip. Then tears of anger from his eyelids fell, as gaining more and more the mares he saw, while, urged no more, his horses slacked their speed. But Pallas marked Apollo's treacherous wile, and, hasting to the chief, restored his whip, and to his horses strength and courage gave. The goddess then, Admetus' son, pursued, and snapped his chariot yoke. The mares, released, swerved from the track. The pole upon the ground lay loosened from the car, and he himself, beside the wheel, was from the chariot hurled. From elbows, mouth, and nose, the skin was torn, his forehead crushed and battered in. His eyes were filled with tears, and mute his cheerful voice. Tydides turned aside, and far ahead of all the rest passed on, for Pallas gave his horses courage, and his triumph willed. Next him the fair-haired Menelaus came, the son of Atreus. But Antilochus thus to his father's horses called aloud, Forward, and stretch ye to your utmost speed. I ask you not with those of Diomed, in vain to strive, whom Pallas hath endued with added swiftness, and his triumph willed. But haste ye, and o'ertake Atreides' car, nor be by Ethe, by a mare, disgraced. 
why my brave horses why be left behind this too i warn ye and will make it good no more at nestor's hand shall ye receive your provender but with the sword be slain if by your faults a lower prize be ours then rouse ye now and put forth all your speed and i will so contrive as not to fail of slipping past them in the narrow way he said the horses of his voice in awe put forth their powers a while before them soon antilochus the narrow pass espied it was a gully where the winter's rain had lain collected and had broken through a length of road and hollowed out the ground there menelaus held his cautious course fearing collision but antilochus drawing his steeds a little from the track bore down upon him sideways then in fear the son of atreus to antilochus shouted aloud antilochus thou drivest like one insane hold in a while thy steeds here is no space where wider grows the road there thou mayst pass but here thou wilt but cause our cars to clash and bring us both to harm he said but madlier drove antilochus plying the goad as though he heard him not far as a discus flight by some stout youth that tests his vigour from the shoulder hurled so far they ran together side by side then dropped atrides horses to the rear for he himself forbore to urge their speed lest meeting in the narrow pass the cars should be o'erthrown and they themselves in haste to gain the victory in the dust be rolled then thus reproachful to antilochus antilochus thou most perverse of men beshrew thy heart we greeks are much deceived who gave thee fame for wisdom yet e'en now thou shalt not gain but on thine oath the prize he said and to his horses called aloud slack not your speed nor as defeated mourn their legs and feet will sooner tire than yours for both are past the vigour of their youth thus he the horses of his voice in awe put forth their powers and soon the leaders neared end of book twenty three part one